பையனை தயார் பண்ணிட்டு இருக்காரா இன்னும் வரல இல்ல சார் அவர் என் கூட தான் சார் இருக்காரு இஸ் நோ மோர் ராஜேந்திரன் சன் நோ இஸ் பூமா ஸ்டூடெண்ட் அப்படிதான் எங்களோட பையன் ஓகே ஓகே வில் கிவ் யூ தட் டீச்சர் இஸ் வெரி இம்பார்ட்டன்ட் பாய் ராதர் தென் நோ வாட் இஸ் குரு தெய்வம்ங்கற மாதிரி ஆல் தி 3 ஆர் வெரி இம்பார்ட்டன்ட் பட் நவ ஆஃப் கோர்ஸ் யுவர் ரெஸ்பான்சிபிலிட்டி ஹி இஸ் அண்டர் आवर He 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 be doing extremely well, not because 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 is but because he happens to be a student. Both both ways, sir. Both both ways. ways. Sir, sir. ready? Yeah. Ready, sir, ready, sir. Sorry, sir. Smithy, ready, sir. Hmm. Let's show them. Hmm. from you. Good. நடுல வந்து கலந்துருப்பாங்க ஒரு <laughs> 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 கொஞ்சம் <laughs> <laughs> Usually four weeks plus we have a UG teaching for pediatrics. So they could attend only three weeks. So everything was like rushed in. And the time was not enough cases. It was not enough for COVID. You were pre-finally or they didn't learn? Pre-finally or they didn't learn? Pre-finally or they didn't learn? Directly to final year. Double from the first year. Directly to final year. That's it. No doctor. No madam. No doctor. நல்லா பண்ணிரலாம் அப்படிங்க ஐ திங்க ஒரு மீட்டிங் சடனா நாங்க டிசைட் பண்ணோம் ஓகே ஓகே இல்லவா ஒரு போஸ்ட் கிராஜுவேட்டுக்கு வேற ஆவீங்க 2 ICT புரோகிராம் இருக்குங்க இன்டென்சிவ் கிளினிக்கல் ட்ரெயினிங் புரோகிராம் எஸ் சார் இந்த மாதிரி யூஜி காம் பண்ணலாம் அப்படிட்டு திங்க் பண்ணிட்டு தான் மேட வந்து நம்ம we can carry forward this every year sir yeah yeah we will do it madam we will do it definitely and i the online platform na than we can cover all the 27 medical colleges in tamil nadu and pondicherry nu nenikiren sir ஆமா மேடம் ஆமா மேடம் நான் நிறைய இதுல ஜூம்ல நிறைய இதுல லைவ்ல யூடியூப் லைவ்ல நிறைய ஜாயின் பண்ணாங்க நேத்து நம்ம 1000 வியூவர்ஸ் மேடம் 1000 வியூவர்ஸ் சோ குட் மார்னிங் சார் குட் மார்னிங் டு ஆல் ஆஃப் யூ குட் மார்னிங் டாக் ஃபேன் குட் மார்னிங் மேடம் குட் மார்னிங் சார் குட் மார்னிங் சார் டாக் சீனிவாஸ் சார் குட் மார்னிங் குட் மார்னிங் குட் மார்னிங் குட் மார்னிங் டாக் ராஜேந்திரன் சார் சார் அண்ணாமலை சார் குட் மார்னிங் Excuse my absence after some time. Where are you from, madam? Lunch? 
Sharpai will start at uh, 9 o'clock. Yes, sir. Uh, Rama, madam. Tell me, madam. Uh, we'll start at uh, Sharpai at 9 o'clock. Eh? Okay. Three minutes. Three minutes. Uh, two more minutes. Today... எடுத்துக்கிட்டீங்க <laughs> 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 Yeah, uh, good morning to everybody. On behalf of IAPT and SC, I uh, welcome the second day of um, uh, intensive clinical training program for uh, undergraduate students. And uh, um, on behalf of IAPT and SC, I thank uh, uh, today's uh, 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 beginner, Dr. Uh, Boma and team, and uh, Dr. Kumaravel also. And I welcome Dr. Ramachandra Mogan, Dr. Sini Vasansa, Dr. Annamalai Vijayaraghavan, Dr. Dashaini, and uh, uh, all other uh, Sivak Gurunathan and all other teams of IAPT and as well as um, delegates and uh, professors. And uh, once again, I welcome one and all. Now it's over to Dr. Rama Chandra Mogan, madam. Madam Rama, madam. Yes, good morning to all of you. Uh, unmute, the... madam, unmute. Unmute, let's go. Dr. Rama Chandra Mogan. Can you hear me? Dr. Rama, madam. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes. Yes, yes ma madam. We can hear yeah, you. Good morning to all of you. Uh, welcome to all the faculty and the students and IAPT and SE office bearers. 
for another session. Uh, extremely happy to know that. Yeah, please uh, take over, madam. Please. Yesterday's sessions were well uh, received, and uh, today's sessions also we are looking forward to it with a lot of excitement. And uh, the first session is going to be by Dr. Bhuma, uh, who is the professor and HOD of uh, Department of Pediatrics of Coimbatore Medical College, and Dr. Kumaravel, who is a professor of Pediatrics of uh, Salem Medical College. It's over to you, Dr. Bhuma and Kumaravel. And uh, needless to say, your time slot is 45 minutes. And if you can uh, stop about three minutes before the end, you can just summarize and uh, highlight certain important points. Uh, it's over to you. Good luck to the presenters. Um, thank you, IAP TNSC, for giving an opportunity to present on this digital platform, which will help the undergraduates. So uh, at the outset, I'd like to thank Dr. Rajendran, our dynamic secretary, and Dr. Ramesh, our president, and all the faculties who are uh, shown keen interest, especially Dr. Ramachandra Mohan, ma who is uh, doing her job at the fullest. Uh, and i like to invite uh, Dr. Kumaravel also to be my co-faculty. And today we'll be presenting congenital heart disease, which is one of the most important clinical cases which are given to the undergraduates, either as a long case or as a short case. So if you take a heart disease, mainly congenital heart disease is going to be a synotic or a asynotic. So one presenter, Dr. Siddharth Skanda, will be presenting a case on um, synotic heart disease. And Smriti Aravind, both of them are final year students, will be presenting a case of uh, asynotic heart disease. And uh, ask, and I like all of you to pay close attention because it will be going at par. One will be presenting uh, the present illness and the other will be presenting and in it will be in the question time. So with that, uh, without any uh, delay, we'll go on with the presentation over to the students. Uh, the first case is Asim, a 60-day-old male infant, firstborn of non-consanguinous marriage, was brought to the hospital by his mother. Ma'am, please start sharing the screen, ma'am. Yes, uh, screen, 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 screen is visible, ma'am. Screen is visible. Screen is visible and uh, they are audible also very well. Go ahead. A hmm. uh, 60-day-old male infant, firstborn of non-consanguinous marriage, was brought to the hospital by his mother, whose information is reliable. The chief complaints are cough, fast breathing, and feeding difficulty for the past two weeks. Um, my, my, my patient is uh, Divya, a five-year-old female child from Coimbatore, uh, who is a first-born child of third-degree consanguinous marriage, was brought by her mother uh, to the OPD with chief complaints of bluish discoloration of the lips and tongue, and later the nails of both hands and feet since six months of age. Okay, now uh, before we go further, I just want to know what is the relationship between consanguinous marriage and uh, congenital heart disease occurrence. To see that, um, uh, consanguinous marriage can uh, cause uh, increased risk of uh, heart diseases and uh, congenital heart diseases. Okay, proceed. History of presenting illness. The baby was apparently normal for the first six weeks of life. After which he developed cough. It was dry and not associated with post-trusive vomiting or choking. Fast breathing associated with intercostal and subcostal retractions. History of effort intolerance is present. Whenever the infant breastfeeds, the breathlessness increases and the mother also notices forehead sweating. The baby feeds for a few minutes, becomes unduly breathless and stops and resumes the cycle. There's no history of fever. So you told that is... How will you define, uh, how will you define recurrent said. respiratory infection? Uh, how will you define recurrent respiratory infection? Uh, a recurrent respiratory tract infection uh, is defined as more than six episodes in one year mm. or more than four episodes in six months. Or more than two episodes in uh, one year requiring um, hospital administration uh, admission or uh, parental antibiotic administration. Okay. And you told there is an increased respiratory rate. Can you say what is the relationship according to the age of the child? Uh, up to two months, one. If there's more than 60 breaths per minute, it's uh, known as uh, increased respiratory rate. Uh, from two months to one year, more than 50 breaths per minute. From one year to five years, more than uh, 40. And above five years, more than 30 breaths per minute. And you also told there is a suppress cycle. So can you uh, be more on define on that? Uh, when the baby breastfeeds, um, it breastfeeds for a few minutes, becomes tired and has forehead and occipital sweating and uh, it rests for some time. And again, it, due to hunger, it starts uh, sucking again and uh, the cycle keeps continuing. So normally the uh, baby breastfeeds about 7 to 10 times a day. In this case, because of uh, less amount of feeds, it breastfeeds even 15 to 20 times a day. 
So ultimately, we have a underfed child who is always hungry and is not able to uh, take feed. So it is called as an abnormal suck rest cycle because normally also uh, normal neonate also takes some rest and then sucks. Here it is abnormal suck rest cycle. Yes, continue. Uh, increased precordial activity is noticed by the mother. There's uh, no history of bluish discoloration of skin or mucosa. No history of reduced urine output, facial puffiness, or abdominal distension. No history of bad child tearing practices. And no history of abnormalities in the History of presenting illness. History of bluish discoloration of the lips and tongue, and later the nails of both hands and feet since six months of age. History of intermittent incessant cry from six months of age with increased bluish discoloration. Uh, during those cries, alleviated by carrying the baby over the shoulder till two years of age. From three years of age onwards, the mother noticed that the child had episodes of fast breathing, triggered by squatting. History of frequent hospitalization since six months of age for the above complaints. There is no history of regular respiratory tract infection. Um, history of poor weight gain. No history of dyspnea, orthopnea, or paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea or chest pain. Urine output is normal and there is no puffiness of face and limb swelling. No history of joint pain or rashes, no history of vomiting and abdominal pain, no history of uh, headache, altered sensorium or seizures, no history of syncope and involuntary movements, no history of painful swelling in the pulp of fingers. This so child developed the cyanosis only after the age of six months. Yes, so, sir. what is the cyanotic heart disease that can present at birth? Um, sir, uh, most cyanotic heart diseases uh, can present at birth, like uh, transposition of great arteries, uh, TAPVD. Yes and uh, univentricular heart, um, but uh, TOF and uh, Epstein's anomaly and all cannot present it though. So you told Why that TOF not... presents later? Why TOF uh, sir, presents the... later? Infantibular uh, stenosis takes about uh, six months to set in, sir. So only after that it can present. Six months to develop. Six months to develop. Okay. Okay, madam. So you told there is history of cyanotic spell. Can you explain what is a cyanotic spell? Um, when the baby uh, uh, has increased activities such as uh, uh, mixturation, defecation, feeding or even awakening from sleep, there is a sinus tachycardia um, due to which there is increased uh, venous return and uh, an increase in the right eruption. This increase in the right eruption uh, right um, can cause uh, you increased, uh, uh, decreased oxygen saturation due to which there is a metabolic acidosis and uh, a tachycardia. In response. Can you say some of the squatting equivalents? Because squatting is not a socially acceptable posture as a child grows. So, what are the squatting equivalents? Uh, knee chest position, uh, sitting cross leg, uh, and uh, carrying the baby in the mother's hips, uh, and standing cross leg. These are uh, some squatting equivalents. Excellent. So, because the cyanotic spells are frequently asked, examiner's favorite question, we just want to detail it or uh, nail it again. So it's otherwise called as hypoxic spells or paroxysmal spells uh, or TED spells. A typical spell begins with a progressive increase in the rate and depth of breathing, which culminates in a hypopnea. There is deepening of cyanosis, limpness, syncope, and occasionally leads on to convulsions and cerebrovascular accidents and death if not attended. The very important point here is the vulnerable respiratory control mechanism. And in the presence of provocative factors, like when the child is awakened, after a prolonged deep sleep, child is feeding or crying or straining during maturation. At the setting of a fixed right, uh, fixed obstruction in the right ventricular outflow tract, there is an increased heart rate and increased uh, 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 cardiac with an increased venous return. That in turn will reduce the oxygen saturation, increase the uh, carbon dioxide levels and reduce the pH producing uh, um, uh, acidosis. So all these things again will as a compensatory mechanism, there will be hypopnea and there is uh, increased uh, systemic uh, venous return. Again, so this is a vicious cycle. Unless it is broken, the child will, uh, it will be endangerous to the child next. So the squatting equals, so how does squatting help? So when uh, there is squatting, both the uh, large uh, vessels, namely the artery as well as the vein are compressed against the bones. So there is a reduction in the systemic venous return. So that by trapping the venous blood in the lower extremities, it reduces from right to left shunt at the ventricular level. 
and there is a systemic arterial reduce blood flow also is reduced so the main point where many examiners favorite word is reduces the venous wash out from the leg muscles and also it increases the systemic vascular resistance right so you also told there is a history of chest pain so smriti uh, can you tell what are the cardiac causes of chest pain in pediatrics in because it's not like adults so usually like what are cardiac causes of chest pain uh, cardiac causes of chest pain include uh, mitral valve prolapse no? mm -hmm. uh, dissecting aortic aneurysm uh, pericarditis mm -hmm. so it is a for abnormal... the for two anginal true anginal and... chest pain in children for the causes for true anginal chest pain in children uh, abnormal origin of the right coronary artery sir Left um, coronary Kawasaki's disease. Okay, and also missy also sometimes can cause. Missy also. Okay. So when will you suspect infective endocarditis mm -hmm. by history? Uh, okay. In case the child has a fever with the chills and rashes, um, we can suspect infective endocarditis. Any other swellings? Um, swelling in the pulp of the fingers, which is uh, a pin pin head size to piece size and a painful swelling. And then going in for congestive cardiac failure. Yes. Next. Uh, past history. No history of any similar illness in the past. No history of Jewish discoloration, and no history of irritable cry or drowsiness. So you told there is an history of irritable cry. So you, uh, child is an young infant. So what will you think when the child comes to you with an irritable cry? Uh, the child might be very hungry. Um, in case of interception, might be uh, having cry. Uh, yeah, G E R D, gastroesophageal reflux disease. Uh, acute otitis media and sometimes the first sign of acute CNS infection like meningitis and of course the uh, very commonly common cause will be the uh, abdominal colic yes past history from birth to six months of age there was no history of recurrent respiratory tract infections and no history of hepatic intolerance or feeding why did you ask for uh, recurrent respiratory tract infection initially because Um, um, uh, recurrent respiratory tract infections can occur when there is a uh, pulmonary congestion, and in uh, cases in heart diseases where there is uh, increased pulmonary blood flow, it uh, may be indicated. Other other mm -hmm. thing is it could have been a uh, asymptomatic heart disease at in the previous, and then due to development of uh, pulmonary hypertension later become cyanosis. Whereas if it's the true cyanotic heart disease, which you, which is the commonest case given to you at an UG level, is tetralogy of fellow. The history of recurrent respiratory tract infection is not there. Yes. Antenatal history. The age of marriage was twenty-four years. It was a non-consanguineous marriage. Uh, the mother was twenty-six years at conception. It was a spontaneous conception. Pregnancy was confirmed by urinary pregnancy test at forty days of conception. Uh, primary mother registered for antenatal care in Munar. First trimester. There was no history of fever with rashes. Dating scan was done at forty-five days of gestation and said to be normal. Uh, the mother took folate tablets since first trimester. No history of drug intake other than anti-thyroid medications, and no history of exposure to radiation. No history of bleeding per vagina. History of hypothyroidism complicating pregnancy. So you told there is no history of fever. What are the two important intrauterine infections you will think in terms of congenital heart disease? From um, uh, intrauterine infections, uh, the most important is rubella infection, also mumps. Uh, rubella may might cause pulmonary artery stenosis, uh, patent ductus arteriosus, ASD, and BSD. But most commonly, it is patent ductus arteriosus. Also, think of mm. um, cytomegalovirus infection also can cause to some extent congenital heart disease. Yes, and uh, you told there is uh, no history of irradiation. Can you say what is the dosage of the? How significant is the radiation? Significant is irradiation. Um, From uh, around two to eight weeks of uh, gestation, about twenty uh, rads of uh, radiation can predispose the uh, fetus to uh, congenital heart disease. Okay, okay, next. Previous, so you also told there is no history of drug intake. What are the drugs you are interested in? Um, uh, sodium valproate and uh, iodine points, uh, uh, and uh, lithium uh, alcohol. And these uh, drugs can cause uh, so so again this is one of the most repeatedly asked questions as in uh, UG so the drugs more important will be anti-epileptic drugs like sodium valproate and hydantoin 
where uh, you can see you can just take it in any one of the textbooks. So um, the septal defects and alcohol producing fetal alcohol syndrome, thalidomide, even though it is not used nowadays, because again, um, the previous examiners used to ask, it's one of the most important uh, uh, and lithium will produce Epstein anomaly. In particular, it is one of the drugs, single drug producing a single um, problem. Nice. And amphetamines and indomethacines, because indomethacine can cause intrauterine closure of PDA and thereby hinder the blood circulation. Vitamin A, when it is given in high doses, can produce uh, cyanotic heart disease. Vitamin D, excess, can also produce supraventricular, uh, supravalvular aortic stenosis. Next. Uh, second and third trimester. Quickening is felt at six months of gestation. Anomaly in growth scan are done and found to be normal. Two doses of tetanus vaccine was taken. Iron, folate, and calcium supplements are taken. No history of drug intake other than anti medications and no exposure to radiation. Uh, no history of tetan abortions. No history of premature rupture of membranes, jaundice, or peripartum febrile illnesses. No history of anemia, gestation diabetes, or gestation hypertension. No history of any other significant systemic illnesses. So you told like uh, there is uh, no history of uh, folic acid. So folic acid, you say anti uh, peripartum itself uh, when it is given prevent uh, prevents the neural tubular defects. And here folic acid uh, can produce anemia. Anemia, maternal anemia uh, is one of the causes of uh, can lead on to uh, problems of prematurity and prematurity producing um, uh, congenital heart disease. And again, folic acid deficiency by itself can lead on to congenital heart disease. Yes. So the maternal illnesses, uh, diabetes will uh, lead on to TGA and SLE will produce uh, congenital heart block and uh, phenylcutaneuria, uh, maternal phenylcutaneuria attributes to the expected heart disease in the newborn, namely tetralogy of fallow and all the septal defects, yes. Uh, birth and neonatal history. The baby was born by C-section at term. The indication was cephalopelvic disproportion. Birth rate was 2.4 kgs. Had a smooth neonatal transition, breastfed immediately after birth. There's no history of fever or cold clammy skin, fast breathing or feeding problems. No history of convulsions, jaundice, umbilical sepsis, or bluish discoloration. Mm, Adrenal history. Uh, the parents were married at 18 years of age and uh, the child was conceived naturally after eight months. Uh, Adrenal history and birth history are not significant. No history of uh, drug intake other than iron folic acid. No history suggestive of anemia, heart diseases, uh, PIH, GDM or connective tissue disorders during pregnancy. Um, birth in neonatal history. Full term normal vaginal delivery with smooth transition. Birth weight is 3.25 kgs. No history of cyanosis, respiratory distress or feeding difficulty during the neonatal period. No history of jaundice or umbilical sepsis. So you told antenatal scans were done and it was normal. What are the abnormalities you can detect in the antenatal scan uh, pertaining to congenital heart disease? Um, uh, any uh, endocardial cushion defects yes. or uh, uh, septal uh, infantibular uh, uh, displacement can, yes. can be detected during the scans. So usually it is called as the midline defects. You can say conotrunkal abnormalities, single ventricle, transposition of great vessels. And when you detect a congenital heart disease, at in the neonatal in the perinatal scans itself, probably they are going to be a critical congenital heart disease, and intervention has to be done as soon as the child is born. Or if it is a major congenital anomaly, you can go in for uh, uh, medical termination of pregnancies also. And other, of course, you always know you can see the nuchal translucency and the nasal bones to see whether it is child has a Down syndrome. Again, because Down syndrome is most common uh, chromosomal abnormality, which is uh, associated with congenital heart disease. Uh, developmental history. The baby has a social smile and is alert to sound. Developmental history. There is a gross motor delay as evidenced by delay in walking and running. Fine motor language, personal and social development is not. What the cause for uh, gross motor delay in this case? Um, Sir, in, when the, in, cyan, in cyanotic heart diseases, when the child realizes that 
she gets tired on uh, walking or uh, performing activities uh, she usually limits herself and uh, and uh, regresses the development it can also the development delays can also be due to uh, syndrome such, such as downs yes and uh, yes. congenital yes. problems it can be also due to chronic hypoxia okay and you told like uh, child was uh, born uh, child was normal there is no bluish discoloration so what will what are the conditions that can produce cyanosis at birth and how will you differentiate between a uh, cyanosis due to a cardiac origin and non cardiac origin uh, conditions that uh, produce cyanosis at birth are uh, birth asphyxia Uh, non-cardiac causes such as birth asphyxia and uh, bilateral coronary asphyxia, and acrocyanosis is the most common cause of cyanosis at birth. Uh, cardiac causes like uh, almost all cyanotic heart diseases, other than uh, tetralogy of Fallot, uh, can present at birth. And uh, even tetralogy of Fallot with the severe uh, right ventricular output tract obstruction can present at birth. So, Smriti, how will you differentiate between a cardiac cause and a non-cardiac cause? What is the simple test you can do? Uh, you can do hyperoxia test, huh? you give uh, five liters of oxygen per minute for 20 minutes and check the oxygen saturation all limbs the pre ductal and post ductal and uh, based on that it might improve in case of cardiac cause if it's will not, not improve in cardiac <laughs> will not improve it will not improve in cardiac cause in case of a respiratory mm-hmm. other cause it will improve. so what is the simple screening test you do for a congenital heart disease at birth which is now coming under the delivery point program Ah, uh, delivery point screening is when the pulse oximetry is checked in all four limbs, ma'am. And uh, you do the pre-ductal and post-ductal, and based on that, we can find congenital heart disease. Okay, you are both of you told that the uh, children, uh, your case was a full-term delivery. Is that what is the problem? Ah, uh, congenital heart disease, which is associated with prematurity. Um, uh, patent ductus arteriosus associated with prematurity, and uh, even septal defects can be associated. Mostly, it is patent ductus arteriosus. Yes. So if uh, if there is a ductus, what will you do as a medical management to close the ductus? Uh, most, in your institution, in your what will you do? Most commonly, we use paracetamol. What are the other drugs that can be used? Uh, other than that, ibuprofen and uh, indomethacin. Indomethacin. Okay. Indomethacin. Any, uh, so in some, uh, as we told, in a critical congenital heart disease, the ductus only if it is patent will make the child survive. Mm-hmm. So, Siddharth, what are the drugs which can uh, keep the ductus patent? Um, prostaglandins, so PGE one can keep the ductus patent. Okay, right. Thank you. Uh, immunization history. Uh, immunized up to date according to national immunization schedule. Um, immunized up to five years of age according to national immunization schedule. Sir. What the specific vaccine which uh, you advise for uh, children with uh, congenital diseases? Sir, uh, pneumococcal conjugate vaccine and uh, hemophilus influenza vaccine. Uh, okay, now these vaccines are included in the government of India schedule. What is the schedule of pneumococcal vaccine which is being given Sir, now? Uh, first dose is at six weeks. The second dose is at uh, fourteen weeks, and uh, booster dose is given at uh, nine months. Okay. This is uh, different from uh, AAP schedule. AAP schedule we use a different schedule: six, ten, and fourteen weeks, and at uh, one and a half years. That is government of India schedule is little different. Okay. Next. Breastfeeding history. Ah, uh, the baby is exclusively breastfed. History of altered suckless suck cycles. Nutrition history. There is a calorie deficit of four hundred kilocalories and a protein deficit of five grams. The diet doesn't contain adequate allowance for micronutrients. <clears throat> so you told uh, there is no. Uh, dietary deficit in the micronutrients in the child. So, what is the role of micronutrient? What is the micronutrient you are more worried in this case? I'm uh, uh, I'm most worried about iron deficiency now because uh, um, even though there is polycythemia here, there can be related anemia because of the uh, iron deficiency. So, there can be microcytic. So, what are the problems you expect when the child has anemia in the setting of a cyanotic heart disease yes, okay. and a cyanotic heart disease? But in case of anemia, there is more chance of going for congestive cardiac failure, and uh, also more chance of infections as the child will be more immune compromised. So in cyanotic heart disease, so the cyanotic spells are are more common when there is a anemia. Yes. And also thrombosis is more common. Yeah, thrombosis. Thrombosis. Thromboembolism is also more common with anemia. Okay. Family history. 
No history of congenital malformations or hereditary diseases in the family. No history of similar illness in the family. No history of congenital malformations or hereditary diseases in the family and no similar illness. So if there is a family history which is positive for a congenital heart disease, what are the chances of getting a congenital heart disease in the child? So if the mother has congenital heart disease now, there's a 3 to 4 percent chance the child will also get it. Uh, when both parents have congenital heart disease, the risk increases by 3 to 4 times. Um, when the first uh, child has a heart disease, the second child has a 2.5 percent chance of getting heart disease as well. So, so can you repeat is, it for the benefit of other students? Yeah. Repeat. Can you repeat that? Uh, slowly, slowly. So that other students can uh, not take it down. If the mother has congenital heart disease, the child has a 3 to 4 percent chance of having a heart disease as well. When both parents have heart disease, the chance increases by 3 to 4 times. And uh, when the first child has heart disease, the second child has a 2.5 percent chance of getting heart disease. Okay. So it okay. depends upon the degree of consanguinity and the type of heart disease they have. The risk of congenital heart disease in infants with first degree relatives, that is either the parents or the sibling with non-syndromic isolation because by syndrome itself has a more chances. That is, as she told, it's three to four fold higher than that of the general population. The risk varies considerably depending upon the congenital heart disease whether the mother, father, sibling or multiple family members are affected. The left heart obstructive lesions carry a higher risk of occurrence. Detransposition of great arteries carries the lowest risk. So if we the examiner us which has the highest risk, it is the left heart uh, LBOT obstruction and which has the lowest risk is the detransposition. Social history, uh, lower middle class according to modified Kutsami scheme. Um, lower middle class, the child is from a broken family. The parents are separate. So, what do you think? Uh, overcrowding, uh, what is the relationship with the overcrowding with heart disease? Either it can be a congenital heart disease or an acquired heart disease. Uh, overcrowding can cause uh, rheumatic, can predispose to rheumatic heart diseases and uh, infective endocarditis. And also, if the ch child is prone to uh, recurrent respiratory infections, they can. So why you told like the child specifically told child is from a broken family. So uh, why do you think it is important? Because ultimately the social issues are more than the medical issues. Um, the uh, broken family could have even occurred because of the heart disease. So should uh, deal with the. And uh, another thing is the broken family, single member, uh, the nutrition apart from the child suffering from the nutrition. A compromise because of the congenital heart disease, it will add on to the nutritional compromise. And unless you have a nutrition uh, which is normal, you cannot manage this child as you told congestive cardiac failures, growth failures, and even developmental um, problems will be there. Yes. Summary 60 day old male infant, firstborn of non consanguineous marriage, and presented with cough and effort intolerance in the form of suckless suck cycle for the past two weeks without history of cyanosis. This is probably a case of congenital acyanotic heart disease with congestive cardiac failure. Summary, a uh, five-year-old girl born to third degree consanguineous parents with history of cyanosis, cyanotic spells since infancy, squatting episodes, without recurrent respiratory tract infection and cross motor death. Probably a uh, congenital cyanotic heart disease with decreased pulmonary growth. General examination, uh, the baby is awake and looks around, dyspneic, tachypneic, no pallor, no cyanosis, no icterus, no presacral edema, and no generalized lymphoma. Vitals, the heart rate is 166 per minute, regular in rhythm, both femorals are felt well, felt equally in all palpable peripheral vessels. The respiratory rate is 62 breaths per minute, which is tachypneic. Subcostal and intercostal retractions are present. Uh, blood pressure is 70 bar 40 millimeters of mercury in the upper limb, and 72 bar 42 millimeters of mercury in the lower limb. Temperature is 98.4 degrees Fahrenheit. Capillary refill time is less than three seconds. The SPO2 in the upper and lower limb are 95 percent. Anthropometry length is 48 centimeters, which is less than first percentile, uh, severely stunted. Weight is 3.2 kilograms, which is less than first percentile, again, severely underweight. Weight for length is between third and 50th percentile, which is normal. Head circumference is 38 centimeters, which is normal. And chest circumference is 36 centimeters, normal. The baby has a failure to thrive. A head to foot examination. 
Skull is normal in shape and size. There's no dysmorphic facies, no cataract in the eyes. Ears are normal, uh, no cleft lip or cleft palate. Hands and feet, no polydactyly or syndactyly. Chest is normal and spine is normal. Uh, no markers of infective endocarditis are present. So what are the external markers for heart disease? Um, I mean, the face, uh, elfin facies might indicate Williams syndrome. Uh, mongoloid facies and Down syndrome. Uh, web neck occurs in Noonan and Turner syndrome. Um, absent radius in TAR syndrome. Um, and White space nipple in Turner syndrome. Uh, in Marfan's, you have uh, arachnodactylium and tall stature. Polydactyly and syndactyly. Again, and they always think of a isolated cleft palate, most commonly associated with midline defects. Spine and uh, spine abnormalities, again, comes as a part of Vactoral syndrome. So the rule of the thumb is when you see an externally a congenital malformation, you look for other problems, mainly the cardiac problems and the renal problems, which are a part of the syndromes or in association. A single external marker will give a clue to the internal problem. Yes, next slide. So again, we the, again repeatedly asked question, the Down syndrome most commonly associated with endocardial cushion defects, VSD, Edward syndrome, the septal defects, ventricular septal defect, PDA and the pulmonary stenosis, Patau is associated with VSD and PDA and dextrocardia. Noonan, very classically associated with the pulmonary stenosis. In Marfan's, you get mitral valve prolapse and aortic regurgitation. Turner's, most commonly associated with coat of iota. And Holtaram syndrome, otherwise called as the <clears throat> absent thumb and radius associated with ostium priming type of uh, atrial septal defect. Yes. <coughs> the syndromes that are associated with the tetralogy of phallus will be the Down syndrome, Poland syndrome where there is abnormality or absence of the pectoralis major, the golden ass syndrome and the spins goldberg syndrome. Because these are the, again I want to emphasize, repeatedly asked uh, viva questions. Yes. Examination of the cardiovascular system. Uh, on inspection, the chest wall is bilaterally symmetrical, apical impulse not visible, no precordial bulge, no visible pulsations, no deformities, no scars, sinuses or dilated veins. Uh, on palpation, <coughs> apical impulse is felt in the fifth intercostal space at anterior axillary line. It is hyperdynamic in nature. A uh, grade one parasternal heave is present. Systolic thrill present over the lower left parasternal area. So what are the, what causes a parasternal heave? A uh, parasternal heave is caused by right ventricular hypertension. Okay, right. Uh, on percussion, the right heart border corresponds to left sternal border and apex is felt at the fifth intercostal space in anterior axillary line. Uh, on auscultation, at the left lower sternal border, first and second heart sound is heard normally. A high pitched soft, blowing pansystolic member of grade 4 is heard with the diaphragm stethoscope. Mitral, aortic and tricuspid area, first and second heart sound are heard normally. S3 is not heard. And there's a radiating pansystolic murmur heard with reduced intensity. In the pulmonary area, there's a loud P2 and radiating pansystolic murmur heard with reduced intensity. What are the causes for a pansystolic murmur in left sternal border? Differential uh, so diagnosis for a pansystolic murmur in left sternal border. Um, atrial septal defect, ventricular septal defect, and uh, pulmonary stenosis. And even sometimes uh, PDA murmur also can be transmitted. So it is the lower left sternal border. You have the classical VSD murmur, namely the pansystolic murmur as uh, described by Melody D. Roger, called as the Roger's area and the Roger's murmur. Mm. So according to the murmur intensity, can you say whether it is a small VSD or a large VSD? Uh, the size of the VSD and the murmur is uh, inversely proportional. Huh? In a smaller uh, defect, the murmur is more loud. And in a larger defect, the murmur is uh, softer. So uh, the classical uh, VSD will be the small VSD, which has a very harsh quality. Yes. Other systems examination uh, are normal. Okay, or skip. Normal? Skip, yes. skip. Some uh, general examination. So you are going now telling general examination of your cyanotic heart disease child. Yes. Um, the child is conscious and oriented. Central cyanosis is present on tongue and palate. 
clubbing of grade three present involving all digits, uh, child is plethoric, not ectoric, no generalized lipidinopathy, and no bilirubin. So you told there is a central cyanosis. So in central cyanosis, what are the parts you see to say it is central cyanosis? I mean the oral mucosa, lips, palate, and uh, tongue. Yes. And uh, fingers. Including the fingers and toes. toes. So what are the causes of central cyanosis? Uh, central cyanosis is uh, due to uh, decreased oxygen saturation. It can be uh, in cardiac cause, uh, such as cyanotic heart diseases. Um, it can also be respiratory cause, uh, in any conditions causing respiratory failure, such as pneumonia or uh, separative lung diseases like bronchic diseases. Um, it can also be due to polycythemia and uh, high altitudes. Hemoglobin of the So, what are the, and you told uh, clubbing, what are the grades of clubbing? Um, grade 1 is when there is fluctuation of nail bed and obliteration of the lower bond angle. Grade 2 is when there is a parrot peak appearance. Grade 3 is the drumstick appearance. And uh, grade 4 is uh, hypertrophic osteoarthritis. Next. So, this is uh, again, I want to emphasize on that. It depends upon the interphalangeal uh, diameter and the digit uh, diameter. If it is uh, more, uh, yeah, if it is more than. If it is more, then it is called clubbing. When it is, uh, you also look after the hyponychial angle. If it is less than 180 degrees, it is normal. If it is more than 180 degrees, it is abnormal. And you look for the Shamrath sign, which is obliterated. And as she told already, grade 1 is nail fold. It is filled. Grade 2 is parrot beaking. Grade 3 is increased pulp in the AP diameter. And grade 4 is increased lateral uh, diameter giving up the drumstick appearance. Next. So, what are the causes of central cyanosis? Again, I want to reinforce this. Central nervous system, whenever that dry is low, as you see in obesity, otherwise called as the Pickwickian syndrome, the respiratory system, either due to obstruction of the airway, which can be congenital or acquired, like uh, two causes, I'll say, so that it is easy to remember, severe pneumonia and cystic fibrosis. Cardiovascular system, either it can be due to an intracardiac right to left shunt, the classical cyanotic congenital heart disease, when there is an intrapulmonary shunt, as you see in pulmonary AV fistulas, pulmonary hypertension with resulting right to left shunt at the atrial, ventricular or the ductal level, namely the reversal of the shunt of the ASD, VSD and the PDA, otherwise called as the ASN Minger syndrome. So again, Please remember the causes of cyanosis very, very repeatedly asked question. Next slide. Vitals. Uh, the pulse rate is 100. Can we go to the summary? Because we are running short of time. Already sir, 40 minutes. Irikha, sir. Irikha, sir. Irikha, sir. Time, irikha, sir. Irikha. Sir, irikha. Okay. Sir. okay. Seven minutes to go. Yes, sir. Think, yes, ma'am. Uh, vitals. Pulse rate is 100. Normal. 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 Okay. Uh, BP is 90 per 60 millimeters of mercury. Respiratory rate is 34 per minute. Temperature is 102. 100.2 degree Fahrenheit and the uh, SpO2 is 86 percent in the right upper limb and 87 percent in the left, left yes. upper limb. Anthropometry weight is 14 kg, which is less than third percentile. Height is 104 centimeters, less than third percentile. Vidam circumference 12 centimeters, which relates to moderate acute malnutrition. And the head circumference is 47 centimeters, which is normal. Head to foot examination is normal. Uh, serious examination on inspection, just follows bilateral symmetrical, apical impulse. Is seen in the fifth intercostal space, just uh, lateral to the clavicular line. Trachea appears to be in the midline. Dilated veins are present over the anterior chest wall. JVP is not visible. So, uh, wow. how will you measure JVP? Uh, the child is asked to is recline in a 45 degree angle. Uh, two scales are needed, and one is uh, uh, <clears throat> kept uh, perpendicular to the sternum. The other scale is kept at the topmost uh, point uh, where the JVP, the pulsation, is visible. And uh, the measurement is made on the second. Yes. So, uh, normal JVP is less than 8 centimeters of water or less than 6 millimeters of mercury. We have an elevated JVP in CCF and uh, tricuspid problems and constrictive pericarditis. There is a fall in JVP. You think about hypovolemia and shock. And hepatojugular reflux is present in right heart failure and tricuspid regurgitation. Next slide. Palpation. So, you confirm it. Yes. Proceed next. On Proceed. 
um, auscultation in the pulmonary area, S1, S2 third, single P2, grade 3 ejection systolic murmur is third. Um, other I, systems are normal. Other areas are normal. Other systems are normal. Systems. Okay. Summary 60 day old male infant, first born on non consanguineous marriage, immunized up to age, presented with cough and effort intolerance in the form of altered suppressed sub cycle for the past two weeks without history of cyanosis. On examination, showing failure to thrive and tachycardia. On cardiac examination, hypodynamic picardium with uh, cardiomegaly, grade 1 parastonal heel, grade 4 pansystolic murmur in the lower left parastonal area with a loud P2 without any signs of infective endocarditis. Uh, the probable diagnosis is congenital acyanotic heart disease, uh, left to right shunt lesion, probably a large ventricular subtle defect, pulmonary hypertension, in cardiac failure without infective endocarditis, in sinus rhythm with failure to thrive. For the investigation, it's okay. Okay, no, sir. tell me, tell me, sir. summary. Summary a uh, five year old girl born to third degree consanguineous parents with history of cyanosis, cyanotic spells since early infancy, squatting episodes without recurrent respiratory infection. On examination, central cyanosis, clubbing, failure to thrive, single P2 and grade 3 ejection systolic murmur in pulmonary area were heard. Diagnosis congenital cyanotic heart disease, probably tetralogy of fallow with moderate acute malnutrition. Okay, what are the investigations which you are going to do in the first case? Uh, so, first I'll do a complete blood count, then uh, chest x ray, ECG, and echocardiogram. What are the abnormalities you can expect in the x ray? Uh, in chest x ray, I expect uh, cardiometaly, that is, the cardiothoracic ratio would be more than 0.5, and uh, pulmonary congestion by uh, demonstrated by uh, increased pulmonary markings, vascular markings, okay. and a prominent next. pulmonary artery. Okay, next okay. investigation. Uh, next, next investigation, uh, ECG. In my case, there will be biventricular hypertrophy. Um, so there will be a uh, right axis deviation. And on echocardiogram, we will be able to uh, uh, determine how many lesions are there, the size of the defect, and uh, if there's any pulmonary hypertension or infected endocarditis. Based on size of the defect, can you classify VSC? Based on, based on, on the size of the defect. Size. Uh, based on the size, small, uh, moderate, and large, sir. Hmm. Okay. For the second case? For the second case, investigations. Sir, I'll do a complete blood count to rule out any latent iron deficiency anemias. Um, sir, and okay. uh, I, I will do a chest X-ray. Um, okay, what are the radiological signs of uh, signs in TOF? Um, sir, in chest X-ray, we can see uh, uh, pulmonary oligemia along with mm. the classical boot-shaped heart. Mm. Um, the boot-shaped heart is due to upturned apex, uh, mm. obliterated pulmonary bay and uh, narrowing of the pedicle. pedicle. In about 25% of cases, you can also see a right sided aortic arch. And ACC okay. abnormalities also. Hmm. Okay. Uh, in okay. echo, you confirm your uh, diagnosis. What are the um, components of tetralogy of fallow? Uh, in tetralogy of fallow, there is uh, right ventricular outflow tract obstruction, uh, such as pulmonary stenosis, the right ventricular hypertrophy, a ventricular septal uh, defect, and an overriding. So, what is the basic anatomical problem which leads on to the sequence? Um, there is a infundibular, uh, there is anterior displacement of the infundibulum. So, that causes uh, pulmonary stenosis and uh, overriding of aorta along with the malalignment of BSD. So, malaligned BSD is Second, the anterior problem. displacement of the anterior displacement of the infundibular septum that divides pulmonary artery and aorta. It is displaced anteriorly so that the pulmonary artery becomes narrow and aorta becomes wide. And there is a small island uh, VSD below. Okay. All will lead on to right ventricular hypertrophy. What uh, and hypertrophy. Uh, okay. Uh, how will you go on with the treatment? Uh, treatment in case of a small VSD, we can wait and watch. No, what is the medical management? Because you are according to history, there is congestive cardiac failure. Uh, so only thing, only single most uh, pr problem we can uh, suspect a congenital heart disease will be the unexplained or a disproportionate tachycardia will be a first sign of a congenital heart disease. Yes. So, how will you manage congestive cardiac failure? Uh, you advise rest to the patient and administer dig digoxin and furosemide. Uh, digoxin, the dose is uh, 10 to 15 microgram per kilogram. You give it uh, twice daily. And uh, furosemide, 1 milligram per kg uh, in divided dose. Also, enalapril can be given, which is 0 0.08 gram per kg. What is the surgical management of ESE? When will you advise the surgical correction? 
Uh, surgical correction. In case of a moderate to large VSD, we can wait for up to one year, giving uh, congestive cardiac failure management. If there's no improvement or there's infective endocarditis or development of pulmonary hypertension, we would advise the surgery. Uh, the surgical treatments can be either by patch closure or device closure. So what are the complications uh, of VSD? Complications. Uh, complications of VSD, congestive cardiac failure, uh, pulmonary hypertension, uh, Eisenmenger syndrome, um, infective endocarditis, uh, failure okay. to drive. What the percentage of VSDs that can close spontaneously? Percentage, sir. Spontaneous, um, spontaneous closure. Uh, spontaneous closure in a small VSD is about 30 to 50 percent. In a perimembranous VSD, it's 35 uh, percent. In muscular VSD, it's the highest, which is 80 percent. In a large VSD, it's very less, about 8 uh, percent. Which is a VSD which you cannot close, you have to, on spontaneously, which you have to close surgically. Uh, the most we have to make sure we close supra crystal VSD because there's chance of progression to aortic revegetation. So we have to close in surgery. So for Siddharth, how will you manage a synoptic spell? Because the commonest manifestation of phallus tetralogy. Um, we have this to hospitalize. often repeated question in uh, theory exam. Hmm. First, we have to hospitalize the child, then uh, put him in, uh, put her in knee chest position, and uh, administer uh, oxygen. Uh, we have to give. Uh, Morphine, uh, 0.2 uh, milligram per kg, uh, propanolol, 0.1 milligram per kg, and uh, uh, soda bicarb for managing acidosis, that is uh, 2 milligram per kg. Two so we have to correct two. anemia because it could be one of the precipitating factors. Mm -hmm. So, what are the surgical okay, what are surgical? Uh, Sir? Surgically, uh, what are the surgical uh, managements available? Um, we now, now we do single step management uh, where we uh, do a definite. Uh, uh, surgery to uh, cure, treat the uh, TOF, but uh, which is Brock's procedure. In conditions where that is not possible, we go ahead with the palliative uh, shunt procedure, such as uh, modified. What the palliative care. surgery, which is uh, done now? What the commonly so, used palliative surgery? Uh, modified, what the commonly uh, used palliative surgery? Toxic gushant, sir. Uh, what is the shunt? Uh, it is a shunt between the ipsilateral uh, pulmonary artery and the uh, subclavian artery. Yeah, it's a cortex conduit is being placed between the ipsilateral uh, pulmonary artery and the subclavian artery. Okay. What are the other so, shunts yeah. which are available? Uh, Watterson shunt, uh, mm. Portsmouth shunt. Yeah. Okay. So whenever there okay. is a shunt is there, you also expect uh, congestive cardiac failures are common when you after uh, shunt procedures. Okay, right. Uh, sir, uh, so the, so the carry-over messages will be, so whenever there is a, a heart disease given as a case to you, you ascertain whether it is a congenital or acquired heart disease. Congenital heart disease, the symptoms from infancy, failure try, recurrent hospital admission because of recurrent respiratory infection. And acquired heart disease, as far as the exams are concerned, it is rheumatic, 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 and nothing but rheumatic. But also you think about Kawasaki disease, uh, infective causes, autoimmune disease, and uh, MISI and idiopathic uh, causes. And if it is a synotic uh, congenital heart disease, you ascertain whether it is asynotic or synotic. And asynotic heart disease uh, divides again classified whether it is a volume load or the shunt or obstructive because of the um, pressure overload. When it is a volume overload, it is mostly the septal defects, the atrial septal defect the ventricular septal defect and the patent ductus arteriosus and it is pressure overload because of the obstruction, pulmonary stenosis, aortic stenosis and coarctation of aorta. Again, again, I want to emphasize it's mostly the case given will be the volume overload <clears throat> and if it is synotic, you ascertain whether it is due to a increased pulmonary blood flow or a decreased pulmonary blood flow. Decreased pulmonary blood flow will be there in tricuspid atresia and pulmonary atresia and the classical tetralogy of fallow as described by tetralogy in 18 and 1888 and a single ventricle with pulmonary stenosis and DORV with PS. Increased pulmonary blood flow, the critical heart disease, namely the TGA, truncus arteriosus and TAPVC. And how to go about with a complete cardiac diagnosis you say the nature of the heart disease, whether it is congenital or acquired. If congenital, whether it is synotic or asynotic. If synotic, whether it is the increase or decrease pulmonary blood flow. If acquired, tell the etiology, whether it is rheumatic fever, rheumatic heart disease, 
Kawasaki disease, whether it is infective, autoimmune or idiopathy and tell the nature of the lesion and tell the severity of the lesion, whether it is mild, moderate or severe when there is a valvular defect or whether it is small, moderate or large, which is a shunt lesions like VSD, ASD and PDA and whether there are associated complications like congestive cardiac failure, bacterial endocarditis, active carditis, cerebral uh, abscess, pulmonary hypertension, arrhythmia, etc. What are the functional limitations that is associated in that child? Namely, the grade 4 dyspnea, whether there is growth and developmental retardation, the immunization status of the child, and associated chromosomal abnormalities or dysmorphism, uh, dysmorphic syndromes like whether there is associated Down syndrome, Patau, etc., and others, like whether they, that child could have come to you with fever or diarrheal disease. So you tell that then it becomes a complete cardiac diagnosis. So this point you have to take in mind before you give a complete last diagnosis at the end of your session. And thank you. And stethoscope is the only jewelry that can be earned by money. It can only be earned by passion and hard work put forth. And thank you again, TNSC and all the listeners and all my students. And I thank uh, Siddharth and Smriti for being the part of the team. And, we, and of course, Kumara will be uh, distantly connected to us. But uh, I think uh, we were able to do justice to this. And Ramachandra Mohan ma'am and IAP TNSC, Dr. KR in particular. And all the best students for uh, coming out with flying colors. One day, I want to honestly say I made it. And this should be the statement for every one of the listeners uh, listening to this digital platform. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity, madam. It was a nice uh, presentation. Yeah, excellent. Uh, very, very good class. It's really com like a complete cardiac diagnosis. It's a complete cardiac class. We had planned it so well with what are all the frequently asked questions at the end of each part. I think that made a lot of difference, you know. We know what to expect at that point. So it was extremely good, very good coordination between the two examiners also. And I'm very, very grateful to you. And congrats to the presenters who have done an excellent job. Thank you. And i like to thank my postgraduate who helped me with that, Dr. Makesh and other. And my colleagues also gave so much of inputs because everybody told, Madam, this is the exam. So I like to uh, thank the whole of my faculty who helped me with this. Yeah. So team teamwork always works. Yes, triumphs. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Dr. Bhuma sent me uh, this thing, comments to you because you asked for it. <laughs> thank <laughs> you, sir. In your phone. Thank you, sir. I'll, I'll check, sir. I kept. My phone, I put it switched off, sir. I'll um, mm -hmm. see it again, sir. Now you can read Thank it you, for the others. Just one minute. Yes, sir. <laughs> because she wanted me, you know, yesterday she has sent me a message. Please attend and then give the feedback. One minute, sir. Just one minute. There's actually a fusion of two cases, sir. Uh, cyanotic and asynotic. Sir, so, thanks to hear presentation by students. Relevant, sorry. Relevant questions covering all possible areas in CCHD by you and Dr. Kumarvel and clear answers by the students. Very good and will be extremely useful to both UG and PG students and other teachers who will be discussing uh, on cyanotic heart disease. Congratulations. You mentioned the impact of CCHD in... in uh, GND. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir, for your positive comments. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes. We'll log out, sir. Thank Stop you. Stop screen. Thank you, ma'am. The next session would be on FAQs in neonatology by our very own Professor Rema Chandramohan, madam. My teacher and presently the director of Institute of uh, Social Pediatrics at Garmin Stanley Medical College. Uh, over to you, ma'am. Yeah. Can I start? Yes, ma'am. 
So uh, first of all, uh, let me thank uh, IAP TNSC for giving me this opportunity to organize right. uh, undergraduate um, a session for exam going uh, students. And I had a lot of uh, happiness putting all this together and I profusely thank the uh, faculty for their contribution once again. And uh, let, first of all, let me say that I was very ambitious in thinking that I can finish the entire neonatology in 45 minutes. So I might not be completely going into every topic, but I'll just be giving an overview of what I thought was necessary for an undergraduate to know. So we'll start with simple definitions. Most of the time we get stumped in these things. So uh, neonatal period is uh, the period from birth up to 28 days of life and based on the weight. So we know that an average newborn should weigh between 2.5 kilos and three kgs. And a low birth weight is that which is less than 2,500 grams. Very low birth weight is less than 1,500 and extremely low birth weight, which we see quite a number of these days is less than 1,000 grams. And when it comes to uh, whether this child is appropriate for gestational age or not, it has to be plotted on charts. So when it comes between the third and the 97th centile in your growth chart, then we call it an appropriate for gestational age. If it is less than the third centile, it is SGA. And if it is more than the 97th centile, it is an LGA or large for gestational age. So when you say IUGR or intrauterine growth restriction or retardation, it is a baby who we commonly think is an SGA with signs of wasting, but it can also be an appropriate size for the gestational age. Baby, that baby was destined to be about 3.5 kg or even 3.8 kg, but due to some factors in the uh, placenta or in the uterus, a child turns out to be only about 2.8 kg. So whenever there is a sign of wasting in that child, the child has not reached its potential, then we call it an IUGR. So these are some of the charts that we use, not some of the charts, but in term babies, we commonly use the WHO growth chart. And as I told you earlier, anything between the third and the 97th centile, if the weight falls, weight or head circumference or length falls within these two lines, then we say it is normal. This is less and this is more. When it comes to a preterm baby, then we use Fenton growth charts. The problem with Fenton growth charts is the representation is mostly from the West. So our children may appear SGA, although in our charts, they may be AGA. This is a better chart, which is an intergrowth 21 chart, which has representation from five different continents, including a representation from India. And here, these are the charts which are now used in um, several institutions where there is a good representation for our Indian population. Everywhere it's the same between the third and the 97th century will be an AGA. Further, some more definitions. Preterm baby. What is a preterm baby? Any baby which is born before 37 completed weeks, we say preterm. Now, there are many more terms which have come to probably confuse the students also, but it is very important when it comes to uh, prognostication and management. A late preterm baby is that which is born between 34 weeks and 36 and 6 by 7 days. And moderate is between 32 weeks and about 34 weeks. Very preterm is 28 to 32 weeks. An extremely preterm baby is one which is born before 28 weeks. We also have another term between 37 completed weeks and 39 weeks. We call them early term. That means the ideal time for a baby to be born will be between 39 weeks and 41 weeks. So that is when we expect a newborn to have complete development, especially of the brain. Then we have a perinatal period, which is 28 weeks to seven days and an extended perinatal period because we have seen more and more uh, viability extending further down. So we say 22 weeks to seven days postnatal becomes an extended perinatal period. So how do we know? So we know that weight is plotted on growth charts, either by WHO or by Intergrowth 21, whereas gestational age assessment also has an objective chart, which is called as a modified Ballard scoring chart. So an gestational age assessment is done by a combination of LMP EDD, which is not very accurate, but an ultrasound done in the first trimester, the way it's called as a dating ultrasound, will give you the expected date of uh, the gestational age close to five days to one week. Then we confirm it with the modified Ballard score, where we have six physical criteria and six neurological criteria. So we have to examine the baby and then we 
put the score. Supposing you find that this baby has got a fully flexed tone, you give them a four for the posture. Then we do each of these things. When it comes to square window, normally we think that a preterm baby will be very, uh, what shall I say, hypotonic. So the square window should be very much reduced. But you should remember that this square window becomes approximation. That is, the palm can approximate on the dorsum of the hand only in term babies because the, there is a flexibility of the tissues and the ligaments. Okay, So that's one thing that you have to keep in mind when it comes to square window. So it's all pictorial. And because we have more and more very, very small babies who are surviving now, we also have scoring. See, now we have two things in addition. That is only modified Ballard score. We see the length of the baby's foot, okay? And th that this is here. And we also look at the lids of the baby. So the tightly fused lids, it can be, that means the baby is most likely to be less than 26 weeks gestation. So after that, we plot it here. It starts with minus 10, which is about 20 weeks a gestational age and goes on up to 44 weeks. So this just to compare, you see how the breast nodule is in a preterm, in a term baby, it is nice about 5 to 10 millimeters. You can just pinch it and see how it is. A preterm baby, look at the ear, how it is still not fully formed, whereas here it is nice and firm. Then this is the scrotum where you do not have much of, uh, you know, rugae and it is, should become pendulous. And look at the skin of this uh, preterm baby, which is looking so thin and fragile and creases, just faint red marks, whereas you can see a very deep crease here. Same thing with tone. This is a tone of a preterm baby. And if you see the scarf sign in a term baby, it will only come up to the midline, whereas it can completely come around the neck in a preterm baby. And here again, if you see the popliteal angle, you can see that it is almost an obtuse angle in the case of a preterm baby. Now, some further definitions which are very, very valid now is the special newborn care units, which are the SNCUs. We have about 73 of them in Tamil Nadu now, and they are very well equipped take care of babies when less than 1,800 grams and ventilation facilities are also there. And when it is attached to a medical college, you know that it has got more and more facilities to take care of micro preemies also. And newborn stabilization units are present in most of the uh, GH hospitals. And then they can take care of babies even above mostly above 1,800 grams. And if they have babies which are smaller, they have to be referred. And every delivery point will have a newborn care corner or the NBCC where resuscitation is done. So we know that is the most important step in newborn care is to give the child a breath at life. And so that is done in the newborn care corners and all these are supported by the NHL. Now we come to the different aspects of neonatology. First, we'll start with a few points about NRP, which is a neonatal resuscitation program. And this is updated every five years based on the evidence which is available at that point. Certain guidelines may be changed or if there is nothing against them, that will continue. So if it's an inverted pyramid in newborn resuscitation, most of the babies only require dry, uh, drying, warmth, positioning, suctioning, and stimulation. Some babies will require oxygen. Some babies may require positive pressure ventilation, but those requiring chest compressions and medications, it is much less. So this is the charm algorithm, which I know it's not very clear for you to be seeing it on screen. We start off with first antenatal counseling. That means when you go for a resuscitation, we first have to go through the case sheet of the mother and find out whether there is any problem which is there in the antenatal period itself. You brief the team so that the team knows what each person's role is. It's very, very important is anticipation. That's what you have done. Adequate preparation. See whether the oxygen is in flow, whether the suction is working, whether the laryngoscope batteries are there, whether you have adequate ET tubes. So equipment check is very important. And then when the baby is born, we have to quickly note the time that which the baby is born. Three important questions that you have to ask when the baby is born, whether the baby is a term baby, whether the baby's tone is normal, whether the baby above, most important, whether the baby has cried. So uh, my daughter keeps telling me that there is an MCQ for this and they remember it as three T's, tears, tone and term. So we can also use those three. So baby is crying, baby's tone is normal and baby's a term baby. So if it is yes to all these questions, you quickly wrap the baby in a towel, put the baby on the mother's chest, bare chest, okay? In between the two breasts, you put the baby, wait for one to two minutes for the 
cord clamping. You cut the cord and then the baby should be on the mother's chest. It is called as routine care. It doesn't mean that when you put the baby there, you can forget all about the baby. This baby should be monitored. You should see whether the baby has really transited well or not. You can give a quick check and see whether any anomalies are there. But, but in any case, supposing you find that this baby does not say no to one of those three questions, then this baby will require initial steps of ventilation. So, so this is our routine care. They can ask you what is routine care. Routine care is what 90% of the babies will require, nothing else. Just drying, putting the baby on the mother's chest and ensuring that the baby has his breast beats. If the answer to the one of those three T questions are no, the baby requires initial steps. What In what form? Baby has to be taken quickly, cut the cord, take the baby to the warmer, put the baby there, dry the baby, remove the wet linen, position the baby, clear the airway if you think that the baby has secretions. In spite of all this, if you find that the baby has not attained, has not established respiration, we have to give tactile stimulation in the form of a quick rub to the back or flicking the soles. So uh, these are the initial steps which we do. All should be done within one minute and you have to evaluate the baby after this. What will your evaluation be? Whether the baby has started breathing, whether his heart rate is normal. If there is a problem with this, they normally we do not rely on color anymore. We have to connect the baby to a, a pulse oximeter to see the saturation. So having said this, we should next is, you know, that a baby can be born through meconium stain like and when a baby is born through meconium stain like we decide whether the baby needs uh, clearing of the airway or not, depending on whether the baby is vigorous or not. So vigorous baby means strong respiratory efforts, good muscle tone and heart rate of more than 100 beats per minute. Now earlier we were telling that if the baby has come through meconium stain like and it's non vigorous, we have to intubate the baby, take clear the trachea and then only start on bag and mask. But now they say that it does not matter even if the baby's uh, trachea is full of meconium. The main thing is to give positive pressure ventilation and uh, the chance of that baby developing MAS is much less than if the baby is just allowed to go and then the baby can, its chance of getting MAS and hypoxic uh, ischemic injury to the brain is much more. Okay, so now the baby after that, after the initial steps, you have done these initial steps uh, and you find that the baby is still not uh, establishing respiration, having gasping or not at all breathing and the heart rate is less than 100 beats per minute, then you have to give positive pressure ventilation with the bag and mask, uh, ambu bag. Okay, so if there is no, so uh, you're finding that you're giving bag, you have to give five breaths, one uh, one, two, and release, one, two, and release, one, two, like that five times. But the chest is not rising and the baby is not improving. So either there can be a problem with the airway or with the way you're giving the bag or maybe the pressure is not enough. At the end of this, if the baby starts breathing, you can give the baby to the mother, but the baby has to be under observational care. That means every two to three hours, you have to go and see whether the baby is all right or not. So they can give you this ambu bag and ask you, what are the parts of it? This is the uh, this is the patient outlet. This is what we keep on the baby's face in such a way that the nose and the mouth are covered. Then you have the expiratory valve here. You have the peep valve, which sees that you don't give more than 30 centimeters of water. This is the self-inflating ambu bag. So even without an oxygen source, it can work. You have a reservoir, which will see that you can give, you give 100% oxygen if you connect oxygen to this point. Okay, so now you have done positive pressure ventilation for 30 seconds and you're examining the baby, you find that the heart rate has not increased, okay? Then what do we do? Then give chest compression. So earlier we were saying two thumb method or two finger method, but now we know that this two thumb method is the one which is preferred. You give it at a uh, just the lower part of the sternum, just below a line joining the two nipples. This is where we have to give. How much depth should I give? So when you look at the chest of this child from the side, anteroposterior, one third of it, that's the depth that we have to give. And how long should I give? I'll give it for 30 seconds, along with coordinated positive pressure ventilation. So if you are very skilled in intubation, you can even start intubation at this point so that you can improve the oxygenation. You know that the heart is dependent on oxygenation and only with positive pressure ventilation, you should give chest compressions. Both cannot be given without the other. So I've given chest compressions for 30 seconds and I'm reviewing the baby. Still the heart rate is less than 60. This is the point at which you have to decide on starting medications. Okay, the heart rate has increased, it's 80. What should I do now? Stop chest compressions and give only bag and mask ventilation till the heart rate reaches 100. So these kind of babies who have required positive pressure ventilation for a prolonged time and 
with or without chest compressions, with or without medications, they have to be admitted in the NICU for further care, which is called as post-resuscitation care. So you have to remember in NRP that only 10% will require resuscitation. 90 of them will be born, 90% will be born without any problem. And only 1% may require the final steps of resuscitation in the form of intubation, chest compressions or medications. In one minute, you have to decide whether this baby requires positive pressure ventilation or not. Ventilation is the most important step. So the bag, is bag uh, ambu bag, self-inflating ambu bag is the most important part of your resuscitation kit. And I know that the baby is improving once the chest rise, I mean, heart rate starts increasing. Now this baby is born at the labor ward. What and all this baby requires? You have to make sure that this baby has established respiration with a good first cry. To prevent um, hypothermia, I'll put the baby on the mother's chest. I ensure that this baby has started breastfeeding within the first 30 minutes of life. And to prevent sepsis, I'll see that the mother and baby are bedded in throughout and quickly take a look whether all the um, external orifices, that's what we can see in the labor ward, whether they are all patent. So when it comes to the cord, when should I uh, close, when should I clamp the cord? Earlier we were saying soon after pulsation. So now we say we wait for about one to three minutes. At least one minute we have to wait so that the baby gets the benefit of those extra ml of blood, which can prevent anemia later on. We know that anemia is quite common in our newborn babies. Only problem is that can be a slight increase in hyperbilirubinema because of the extra blood. But otherwise it does this baby a lot of good. So where should I clamp? Just see that you don't clamp too close to the abdomen. Two to three centimeters above the abdominal wall, you have to clamp it. Just don't leave it like that. Sometimes the cord clamp may give way and the baby may bleed. So just check every two to three hours and see that there are. So I try to make it everything two and three. There should be three vessels, two arteries and one vein. Vein will be in the 11 o'clock to 2 o'clock position. Do not apply anything on the cord and you will see that it goes through these stages before it completely heals and it falls off. So what screening should I do at birth in the labor ward? Most of the labor ward babies, if they are normal, they're quickly sent to the postnatal wards without even a complete check. So see that the cord, you have clamped it properly. See quickly auscultate and see when the heart is in the left side. You know that if it is in the right side, we have to suspect a diaphragmatic hernia quickly put in. If the baby is stable, you put in a tube. If the baby is having problems, don't be doing checking the esophageal. Some of them will try to do a stomach wash, which is not necessary. Quickly pass a tube, check for esophageal patency, see whether the anal opening is good, pass it and see whether the um, uh, tube is stained for um, meconium. Quickly look at the back. Sometimes it may be fully covered with vernix. You might not pick up a small defect. Just rub off the vernix in the middle of the spine alone. See whether there is any defect. Otherwise, this baby is fit to go to the postnatal ward. So these are some of the physiological variations which I think every student who is having exposure to intramural units should go and see these babies because these are some things which uh, throughout your life, your, your own children or your neighbor's children, somebody can come and ask you, you should have the confidence to say that these things are normal. So erythema toxicum is just a rash, evanescent rash, second day it comes, fourth day it goes away. Milia is small white dots on the yesterday, um, our spotters, Tilakavati was talking about all this Mongolian spots which are there throughout the back. Sometimes it's quite scary to look at the color, but at one year it will disappear. Epstein pearls will be seen on the palate. Salmon's patch is the hemangiomas which are seen. Subconjunctival hemorrhage can normally occur in a, a normal delivery. Tongue tie, this is given too much of importance, but most of the time it doesn't interfere with uh, feeding. And as the baby's tongue grows, the tongue tie also resolves. Vaginal discharge and bleeding will come around the fifth to seventh day due to the withdrawal of maternal hormones. Breast engorgement can also come at the same time. Sometimes they, when there is over manipulation, trying to squeeze out the milk, it can get infected and becomes an abscess. Tight prepuce, a prepuce also grows along with the penis and at one year, this child will be normal. There is no need to do anything for that till that one year. Hymenal tags can be seen at the closer vagina. That also is not, it's just a physiological condition. Jaundice and transitional stools are those which will again come between that five to seven days. So this, this is the erythema toxicum. Uh, this is milia. This is vernix. Even vernix, some of them will be worried when there is excess. We can uh, reassure the mother that it is nothing to worry. No need to uh, rub it out or anything. Just leave it. The next day, it will dry out and fall off. Mastitis, subconjunctival hemorrhage, Mongolian spots, and Epstein's pearls will be seen in a line along the middle of the heart palate. 
so these are some of the reflexes this is something that the student has to know i am not going to spend much time on this because unless i show you by video you will not know how each one is to be done so rooting just stroke along the side of the baby's mouth and you'll find him turning towards the stimulus and don't keep one hand on this side and stimulate on that side because a baby will try to move to the other side sucking and swallow you can observe during a feed palm or grasp is when you put the baby's hand uh, put your finger into the ulnar side the baby will grasp it so strongly that you can even lift up the baby with this as you can see in this picture plantar grasp is stroking the inner border of the toes how the baby will clamp on your finger stepping and placing here you can see it so uh, stepping is when you keep the baby on the um uh, allow the baby's uh, leg to dorsum to touch on the surface here how he keeps his leg and placing is when you keep him like this keep him on a surface like this he will take little steps it's called like moon walking asymmetric tonic neck reflex is when you turn the baby to one neck to one side you will find that the limbs on the same side extend and the opposite side flex gallon stimulate the back here and you will find that the bottom is turning to that particular side <coughs> okay now we come to the prematurity we are seeing a whole lot of it 10 to 15% of our babies are preterm babies and uh, when you're going to if you get a preterm baby as a short case you quickly have to find out what is the reason for the preterm why should we know that we should know the reason so that one is it can occur in subsequent uh, delivery is or it can be due to infection which will have to be treated so quickly find out whether there are previous preterm birth if there is then there is a very high chance that this baby can uh, this mother can have another preterm extremes of age the young mother will not have the, the uterine development to have a full term an older mother may have uh, other comorbidities like obesity diabetes hypertension that can cause a preterm multiple pregnancies there's no place in the uterus so the baby can be delivered preterm assisted reproduction is usually it is can be what shall i say doctor planned preterm or it can have a problem so the baby can be preterm and uh, again multiple pregnancy is also part of assisted reproduction repeated abortions that means the uterus is not favoring the growth of this baby due to several causes can be uterine cervical or placental abnormalities that we have to keep in mind and infection so chorionitis is one of the very important risk factors for prematurity substance abuse more than that cigarette smoking is a very big risk factor for preterm deliveries anything which will make the uterine environment hostile to the baby the nature make sure that the baby is better off outside okay so that is the basis of prematurity when the when nature feels that the baby can survive better outside the mother's womb then the baby is delivered preterm poor nutrition in the mother and obesity these are risk factors for preterm hypertension diabetes you know anything which can produce trauma undue physical exertion and even now mental stress is supposed to be a cause for preterm periodontitis is another cause of a preterm so they advise a dental uh, hygiene during their pregnancy especially in those with recurrent preterm deliveries so what will happen to these babies they can have problems from the minute they are born so they can be born asphyxiated because their brain is not Uh, uh, what shall i say to uh, mature enough to tackle the stress of labor soon after they have born within a few hours they can develop respiratory distress syndrome due to the lack of surfactant because of the immature liver because of the shortened lifespan of the rbcs they can develop jaundice because of the lack of subcutaneous fat and their extended position and lack of brown fat they can develop hypothermia because of the lack of liver glycogen last trimester only the glycogen gets stored in the liver in the absence of that they can go in for hypoglycemia moreover you're going to start on feeds very slowly for these people sepsis they are immunocompromised immunoglobulin reaches these babies only in the last trimester so they have highly susceptible to infection feeding difficulties they do not know how to coordinate sucking and swallowing which comes only after 34 weeks so they can have feeding difficulties their ivh their uh, germinal matrix will uh, be so vascular the vessels are so thin that even a, a hyperosmolar bolus or a slight shaking of the baby can cause a, a ventricular hemorrhage the pda remains open it will close only in term we know that as we discussed earlier and nnec so these are problems which are uh, special to these preterm babies 
So is there problems over at the point of discharge? No, there are certain problems which can continue even post discharge and they have to be kept under surveillance, like anemia, which can come because of our therapeutic sampling or because the bone marrow takes time to pick up that four to till four to six weeks. It will take time for the bone marrow to start acting up. Osteopenia, because I told you calcium reaches the baby on accretion. Calcium accretion comes to the baby only in the third trimester or the last month. So that this preterm is deprived of. So they can go in for osteopenia because of all the things that we do and the unnecessary exposure to noise. They can have hearing loss, cerebral palsy, failure to thrive. Most important is retinopathy of prematurity, uh, which I have failed to mention here. Very, very important problem retinopathy of prematurity which has to be picked up in the uh, NICU itself the ophthalmologist should come to the NICU and pick it up and tell give them the schedule so the, our job is to involve the ophthalmologist thereafter they will give a schedule and treat them for ROP so next is a very important uh, problem in these newborns, which is temperature regulation. We, we should know that the normal temperature of the baby is between 36.5 to 37.5 degrees. And cold stress is from 36 to 36.4. Moderate hypothermia is from 32 to 35.9. And anything less than 32, severe hypothermia is less than 32 degrees centigrade. So how do we measure? We measure with the digital thermometer. Earlier, we were using mercury thermometers and we were saying that it should be measured up to three to five minutes. Now we say that it is digital and wait till you hear the beep and then you read off the temperature. But the most reliable way of measuring the thermometer temperature is by using the skin probe. When you keep the baby in the radiant warmer, you fix the thermo probe onto the abdomen and remember to see that it is securely fixed. Sometimes it can move off and the baby can get unduly heated so that's one also we have to train the mother to pick up temperature with the dorsum of the hand so she should be able to compare the temperature between the abdomen and the lower limbs whenever the feet are very cold as compared to the body you should remember that it is cold stress and then into the next stage even the abdomen will become cold so before that the mother should take care of the baby what is warm chain warm chain is a warm delivery room when the baby comes into the outside the uterus, we should have it uh, put off the ACs and see that the baby is received at 26 to 28 degrees centigrade. Immediately dry the baby, see that the resuscitation is done under the warmer. The baby is put on the mother's chest with skin to skin contact. Breastfeeding should be started, postponed be bathing for at least 24 hours. In a term baby, in preterm baby, it should be given only much later. Baby and mother should be together. Wherever they go, you should transport the baby with on the mother or adequately covered if it's going for some opinion, mother should be taught how to check the warmth of the baby. So uh, you might, uh, uh, the first stage of hypothermia will be, it will be very subtle, you may not uh, know. Slowly you'll find that this baby is lethargic, refusing feeds, it will become irritable. And because of the acidosis, the baby will start developing tachypnea. We should quickly pick up these signs and before the child becomes, goes into respiratory failure and all the other problems of um, ventilation. So here comes kangaroo mother care, which has been um, a God's blessing and it is um, very, very well picked up now in our community also. All babies which are less than 2 kgs, as soon as they become clinically stable, so even babies which are, who are on CPAP, ventilator, there are babies who are kept on the mother's chest, skin to skin contact. How long should we keep till the baby decides that he doesn't want KMC anymore? If he starts wriggling, every time you put him on KMC, if he's wriggling, you know that this baby doesn't want KMC, you'll have to take him out. So what are we providing? We're providing a warm environment, skin to skin contact by baby become being on the breasts all the time. Baby starts feeding well um, and then baby starts gaining weight well. And in the bargain, he goes home very early, thereby the hospital stay rate of infection, everything is less. And when the baby mother goes home, she can practice or even other caretakers can practice that. And that has been found to have tremendous benefit, not only for the weight, but also for neurodevelopmental outcome. So can I just call the mother and say, come, you have to put the baby on KMC? No, the mother should be adequately counseled. Mother and the caregiver should be adequately counseled, told them the importance of KMC. You must get her consent, then only we should put. 
so make the mother sit in this reclining position only thing is she cannot lie down flat and this reclining position the mother's front of the dress is open now we have certain slings which are available uh, earlier we were using this lycra in the previous slide i showed you but that is a little costly so we have this uh, different slings which are available where the baby can be bound to the mother's chest and then the mother can even get up and do little jobs by doing this head is turned to one side the baby will be lying like a uh, frog on the mother's chest head to turn to one side baby's front of the chest will be normal he'll wear a frock where the front is open with a cap and a diaper and socks next is feeding so we know that uh, uh, we know that breastfeeding is the most important uh, uh, what shall i say survival for the baby to survive well and to thrive well and to have an optimum brain development it is breastfeeding 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 exclusive breastfeeding from the minute the baby is born till about 6 months of life okay so there are two reflexes which will help in breastfeeding in the mother it is a prolactin reflex and the oxytocin reflex prolactin is from anterior pituitary which causes the milk to be uh, produced whereas oxytocin will cause it to be released in the baby there are three reflexes that is a rooting sucking and swallowing which in optimum condition only it will favor a, a good breastfeeding and uh, the sustenance of breastfeeding so how do we position the baby the baby's whole body should be uh, supported like this whole body is supported with the baby's head and body in one line turned towards the mother and the nose is at the level of the nipple this is the optimum positioning in attachment see that the baby's mouth is wide open most of the nipple and areola inside the mouth only little bit of the areola on top can be seen and the chin will be against the breast and the lower lip is inverted so this is called the uh, attachment or the latch that is very very important to prevent nipple problems and also to see that the baby is having a successful uh, breastfeeding relationship with the mother so now if uh, the, there are low birth weight babies which are kept in the nicu where the mother cannot feed the baby uh, you know continuously by direct feed so then we have to encourage storage of breast milk so you can either uh, use the pump or you can use a combination of the two so those are the three ways hand using pump or a combination of these two and then it will depend on the reason for expressing and how long you want to keep the milk so if it is uh, in our uh, country we can keep the milk in the room temperature only for about 4 hours maximum 6 hours in the refrigerator we can keep for 24 hours in the freezer we can keep it for 3 to 6 months but since the pumps are costly we tell them we teach them how to express the milk using their hands and most important is to keep wash the hands thoroughly before they express the milk okay now what about feeding of these babies so we know that sucking swallowing is coordinated when the baby is more than 34 weeks so when it's more than 34 weeks we start uh, uh, initiating breastfeeding we have to sit and see whether the mother and baby are able to uh, you know uh, understand each other the baby is nicely uh, positioning and sucking at the mother then you continue breastfeeding but you find that at 32 to 34 weeks you give a trial of feeds by spoon or palladay if the baby is feeding without much of a problem yes from you give continue to give spoon or palade feeds and then you go on to direct breast feeds if this baby is between 28 to 31 weeks you can start feeds but this time with orogastric or nasogastric tube keep an eye on whether the baby is tolerating feeds or not whether there is vomiting or abdominal distension no none of those problems are there then you can Uh, continue to gal uh, tube feed then go on to palade feeds and then to breast feeds if you find that there is a problem in these babies especially those which are less than 28 weeks then we have to start on iv fluids okay so when you're starting on iv fluids also it does not mean that the baby's uh, stomach should be kept empty we should start on trophic feeds otherwise called as minimal enteral feeds and these are very very necessary for improving the gut enzymes gut maturity so you start on small volume so you start with 10 to 20 ml per kg and then slowly you increase the feed and as you're doing it you should also try once the baby is off all the tubes you can again start on spoon feeds and there is something called non nutritive sucking where you empty the mother mother tells me to empty the breasts keep the milk separately and then put the baby on the breast and empty breast sucking is called non nutritive sucking which will again help the baby's uh, not only the effective sucking but here again it will help with the gut maturity 
So next, um, a big bugbear for all neonatologists is the neonatal sepsis, and this is the major killer. And um, much as we try, we are not able to reduce the rates of neonatal sepsis. So you should know that there is something called early onset sepsis and late onset sepsis. Early onset sepsis is that which comes within 72 hours, and late onset sepsis, which comes after 72 hours. 72 hours um, uh, infection is usually got from the mother or from the uh, labor ward, and it can be due to uh, you know prolonged rupture of membranes, repeated vaginal examination or chorea amnitis. Late onset sepsis is maybe from the hospital or from the community. So when you're asking for late uh, onset history risk factors, we have to ask whether it's a low birth weight baby, whether he's been breastfed or not, whether there is some uh, problem with the uh, integrity of the skin all those things are predisposing factors for sepsis uh, prolonged um, you know antibiotics antifungals and all that okay then sepsis screening so quickly we have to do certain tests before we wait for the blood cultures to come as soon before you start antibiotics do these tests do um, blood culture and then you uh, start the antibiotics so, so if the total count is less than 5000 that means the sepsis is swamping it is depressing the bone marrow you will get a low leukopenia is much more significant in newborns than leukocytosis and if an absolute neutrophil count is less than 1800 definitely it is a risk factor it, i mean it means that this baby is having sepsis crp more than 6 esr micro esr more than 50 it ratio immature to total uh, WBC count. So when you're having more and more immature cells into the circulation, more than 20% is immature cells, it means that the uh, bone marrow is uh, fighting the infection by producing immature cells. Okay, so band form. So that nucleus has not divided into uh, hypersegmentation and band forms are a very big indicator of neonatal sepsis. So uh, sepsis is a, it's a masquerader. So many things will present as sepsis and sepsis will present as I mean, it may be very subtle, you may not know, but uh, when the weather is temperature, don't expect fever in babies with sepsis. It is most often hypothermia. The baby will not feed well. He will develop tachypnea due to acidosis, or he can have pneumonia and tachypnea. In preterm babies, they can present with just apneic spells. They may be lethargic, seizures due to CNS involvement, or due to electrolyte disturbances, or due to hypoglycemia. He can uh, uh, going for shock and uh, septic shock and uh, uh, of course, abdominal distension and uh, early onset sepsis is more often associated with pneumonia, whereas late onset sepsis is associated with meningitis. So how do I treat these babies? All these problems should be treated. Supportive treatment should be started. Treat the hypothermia, hypoglycemia, shock, hypoxia, anemia, start on appropriate IV fluids, uh, blood component therapy, ventilation if necessary. Specific will be antibiotics. Antibiotics usually, we say ampigentamicin first line, but most of us start with piperacillin, tazobactam now as a first line itself. How long will uh, depend on what the organism is, what the site of infection is, conditions like bone and CNS and all will require longer duration of treatment with antibiotics okay so but the best thing will be if you can prevent sepsis so vaccination of the mother uh, where will prevent tetanus clean water see that your hands are uh, whatever you're using see that you wash your hands whatever has to be washed and used see that you wash it under clean water see that you are not responsible from the hospital we are hands we have hands that heal and not so we should see that we do not cause harm to the child. So see that you, the environment the child is uh, the, uh, treated in is very clean and see that all the areas around it is clean and awareness. So we have to treat, tell the mother the importance of being clean and uh, frequent baths and how the child should be minimally handled by visitors also. So this is another problem that the child has, which is asphyxia. Asphyxia is still about 20%, affecting even 20% of the newborn. And for practical purposes, if a baby does not establish spontaneous respiration at birth, we call it asphyxia. Although it can be non-asphyxial causes also, but if you want to document, yes, this baby has asphyxia, these are the things that should be acidosis, in the cord, pH less than 7, APGAR should be 0 to 3, 5, and theological manifestations, multi-organ ailment. Only with all this, we can say that there is asphyxia. So APGAR is one thing which is very important. We know that all of us are still assigning APGARs, although the importance of APGAR is not as high as it was earlier. What is the importance of first minute APGAR? That will tell you what was the baby's condition in utero, a reflection of the baby's condition in utero, whereas your five-minute APGAR will tell you whether you have done an adequate resuscitation or not. If by chance a five-minute APGAR is less than seven, then every five minutes, still 20 minutes, we have to keep on doing an APGAR score to see whether it is going up or not. Any APGAR which is less than three, 
even in an extended apgar score is a very poor prognostic factor for the child's further neurodevelopment so this child is admitted with asphyxia what is the management it is mostly supportive temperature should be maintained you know about the importance of therapeutic hypothermia it should be done within 6 hours the baby's temperature is maintained around 33.5 with some kind of uh, you know temperature phase changing material or equipment where the temperature is maintained for about uh, 48 to 72 hours we keep the baby cool so that the metabolic activity in the brain is reduced giving time for the brain to heal we do not allow the baby to either become hyperoxygenic or hypo hypoxic because hyperoxygenic will cause release of free oxygen radicals which can also cause brain damage we see that the baby's perfusion is maintained there should not be shock only then you can have adequate cerebral perfusion you know the baby should not have hypoglycemia or hypocalcemia and if there is any seizures we have to uh, treat that so this is levins i got it from uh, op guy only how we can uh, you know uh, classify or we can assign how severe the baby's hie is whether it is mild moderate or severe if the baby is totally comatose we call it severe if there is seizure we call it moderate or hie stage 2 next is our Um, neonatal seizures neonatal seizures the commonest cause of neonatal seizures are hie but it can also occur due to uh, malformations hemorrhage genetic genetic causes metabolic and infections and um, so the uh, we already discussed the etiology and how do we manage so most of the time what are the uh, investigations that we require just look see whether you can find out any uh, abnormalities any syndromic abnormalities in physical examination sugar calcium is a must try test for um, any electrolyte abnormalities test for sepsis if the what is now gold standard is a video eeg monitoring or an amplitude integrated eeg which is going to give us adequate and established information whether this child has got seizures or not in addition neuroimaging also we can do so you first treat the metabolic problems phenobarb phenytoin levy these are the uh, uh, investigations or i mean sorry these are the drugs which are used for the treatment i'm not going into the dose of it which is available in your textbooks only for hypoglycemia i thought we should have a special mention so hypoglycemia is when the blood glucose is less than 45 mg we have to see whether it is a very sick baby or a well baby if the well baby is showing a sugar of less than 45 mg you can start on breastfeed and you monitor before the next feed you repeat the blood sugar and see if it has become above 45 you can continue to breastfeed and monitor 12 hourly supposing you find that the sugar is continuously dropping even between 25 and 45 once again you can give continue to give breastfeeds but if the baby becomes symptomatic then you will have to start on iv fluids so So IV fluids will be in the form of 10% dextrose, 2 ml per kg. Please do not stop with one bolus dose because there can be rebound hypoglycemia. After that, you have to continue giving an infusion, starting with 6 milligrams per kg per minute. So most important uh, condition, and this is a exam case: neonatal jaundice. There is physiological jaundice, pathological jaundice. We know that any jaundice which appears before 24 hours is pathological jaundice, affecting the palms and soles. Going above 15 milligrams per deciliter, we call it pathological jaundice. If it prolongs beyond two weeks, or the direct bilirubin is more than two milligrams, also we say it is pathological jaundice. Anything other than that, if it is coming after 36 hours and values are low, commonly we see physiological jaundice only. And because of the increased RBC mass, this RBC mass is increased because the baby is dependent. on maternal oxygenation in utero and this rbc has to reduce has to break down so that it will create you know the polycythemias are 18 to 20 uh, grams we cannot manage with that high rbc count so rbcs have to break down in the first week of life and the by product of that is the jaundice so the in a one weeks time the liver will be able to mature have enough udpg and uh, y and z proteins to tackle it but when there is an increase in this happening of physiological like in hemolytic disease where there is increased breakdown of rbcs g6pd when a concealed hemorrhage or sepsis that will overburden the liver and result in jaundice so these are the things that we have to ask when did it appear we know with earlier means uh, pathological later means physiological pre term means it requires a higher uh, you know quickly we have to put on phototherapy because the baby blood brain barrier and all is defective feeding is the baby feeding well if it is not feeding well we think of early signs of bilirubin encephalopathy if it is baby is continuously vomiting and having jaundice think of galactosemia think of sepsis 
and dehydration of the baby is not feeding well we have to think of dehydration aggravating jaundice so feeding history is very very important in jaundice how is the cry and activity oh baby is crying well feeding well then you know that it is not a problem but if the baby is lethargic once again bilirubin encephalopathy or sepsis we have to think then the urine and stool so you have to ask for the stool history very very important delayed passage of meconium think of hypothyroidism prolonged passage of meconium means for up to 10 days baby is passing only meconium there again you have to think of hypothyroidism or even hirschsprung's disease urine see how much volume frequently passing baby is adequately hydrated passing small amounts dark colored urine it can either be dehydration or the baby can be going in for conjugated hyperbilirubinemia then you find out other history for conjugated hyperbilirubinemia infection hypothyroidism diabetes and hypo anything which produces vascular insufficiency in the baby can produce polycythemia which can aggravate the jaundice so also whether the baby has had a normal delivery which is traumatic concealed hemorrhage sibling elder sibling is having okay then this baby has a high risk of having jaundice could be krigler najar family history anybody having prolonged jaundice anybody on phenobarbitone anybody with cholecystectomy all that we have to uh, tell i'll just uh, take about two more minutes and i'll finish so in examination look for signs of prematurity or sepsis see whether there is cephalomatoma subgallal bleed in the eyes ictus pallor pallor polycythemia cataract look at the level of jaundice look for any skin bleeds hepatosplenomegaly and umbilical hernia investigations uh, obviously bilirubin we have to do next should be blood grouping typing do a coombs test and find out whether you have antibodies peripheral smear if nothing else is giving you clues see whether there's peripheral smear morphology of rbc look at the reti count anything above 6 is significant hematocrit so hematocrit will tell us whether so polycythemia is the cause of jaundice thyroid profile again will be useful to find out whether it is a prolonged jaundice ultrasound abdomen and cranium you have to see whether there's any concealed hemorrhage abdomen will tell us or any clue for congenital i mean uh, conjugated hyperbilirubinemia so is sepsis cranium so this is a phototherapy uh, charts are available no need to ask anybody you can just see the day of the hour of that's why we should remember the mother says john whenever you present a case with john this alone you have to tell it hours for the first three to four days tell them how many hours it was when the baby's jaundice was detected find out what the bilirubin level and plot it so if the baby has got no risk factors then you can even wait up to this level to start on phototherapy so with some risk factors at this level if there is a very high risk factor or if it is a preterm late preterm baby at this level itself we should start on phototherapy similar for exchange transfusion also all these are established international guidelines and this is what is being used in all the nurseries now so uh, this is the last uh, part of my presentation where respiratory distress there can be several causes for respiratory distress which can not have anything to do with the respiratory system itself so at birth delayed adaptation ttn asphyxia or mas surgical causes like cdh quinal atresia pulmonary agenesis within 6 hours if you have respiratory distress think of rds if it is beyond 6 hours it is not rds tef will present a little later because the secretions the child has to aspirate within 6 to 24 hours it can be due to polycythemia metabolic causes congenital pneumonia pneumothorax or pph and conditions which can present res with respiratory distress any time will be ccf and iem and uh, congenital lobar emphysema so we have the down score which will depend upon the respiratory rate the cyanosis the air entry the grunt and the retractions so we have a score anything more than 6 means this baby is going in for respiratory failure and requires ventilation so whenever a baby is presenting with the grunt what we have to do see whether it's a preterm or a term baby if it's a preterm think of rds if it's a term baby most likely to be an mas then you uh, confirm with the saturation you start with the baby with supplemental oxygen if the baby is not being um, you know can't maintain with the cpap hfnc or cpap then you have to start on ventilation take an x ray and see and uh, you can uh, if the baby is not showing any improvement as i told you ventilation and just watch there are some conditions which by the time the child is shifted from the labor ward to the dicu the respiration will settle down 10 to 20 minutes this is delayed adaptation from fetal to neonatal circulation when it is changing then you can find that it is delayed adaptation and that will resolve spontaneously 
so okay my baby is going home so what are the discharge criteria my baby is steadily gaining weight over the past 3 days 30 grams per day he is feeding on his own there is no sepsis the temperature is stable i've stopped all antibiotics and i'm a self confident mother you can just advise her only about danger signs and you can discharge her and tell her that whenever the baby refuses feeds having poor weight gain vomiting lethargy hypothermia any respiratory distress jaundice abdominal distension or decreased urine output the baby should be brought right back to the nursery from where it was discharged unless she stays very far away and this is the flow of follow up protocol uh, when the baby comes back i look at the anthropometry growth i'll see whether she's breastfeeding i'll counsel her so that she knows what problems to anticipate i'll do a development screening and eye examination i'll do an ultrasound in case that the baby had cranial problems earlier i'll monitor the growth for this child i'll do a hearing screening and immunization so these are my references and good luck to all the undergraduates i hope i have at least been able to cover most topics which i had um, planned to do thank you thank you ma'am uh, that was a very extensive and comprehensive presentation and you had managed to give us the entire neonatology in a single capsule very easily uh, edible for the ug stu thank you ma'am the next session would be a case presentation on uh, heptosplenomegaly with anemia by uh, dr a janavi and dr harish narasimhan of madras medical college the faculty for this session would be professor dr lakshmi velmurugan professor of pediatrics at madras medical college and uh, uh, professor s kalpana associate professor of pediatrics at government vellore medical college over to the faculty for the session thank you very much daksha it was an excellent uh, thank you very much professor ramachandra mohan director of uh, institute of social pediatrics uh, for having given such a lovely session on neonatology we always do the best when we are very passionate about it i would like to th thank our iap tnsc and professor ramachandra mohan madam especially dr and dr rajendran sir and ramesh babu sir for having given this opportunity to me and dr kalpana the jan you can start sharing your screen you can start sharing your screen now the for the next for, i would like to introduce my uh, co faculty dr kalpana dr kalpana yes, she is the pro uh, professor of pediatrics at velour medical college both of us will be talking to you about a case of anemia with hepatosplenomegaly it is a and mostly we'll be talking to you about thalassemia as all of you know thalassemia is uh, if you get thalassemia 100% you are passed because the questions which are we, which we are going to which we are going to ask and which we are going to give the answers are standard questions one 30 40 questions 30 questions if you know the answers you are through with it uh, the how are we going to go about this session we are starting by 10:45 will complete it by 11:30 at the most 11:35 we'll finish it off first janvi will present the case presentation and we'll ask the standard questions at the end of the session i'll be showing a ppt consolidating the same facts for 10 minutes over to janvi janvi and harish narasimhan these are both of them are our uh, madras medical college uh, student pgs who will start presenting now you can start janvi Can we unmute yourself? Uh, am I audible, ma'am? Yes, yes, you are audible. Your slides are seen. You can start. Next slide, please. Uh, a very good morning. I am Janvi from Madras Medical College. Your presentation on anemia of splenomegaly. Uh, Umesh Varun, ten-year-old boy, uh, second and birth of his comment is Mrs. Malika, his mother, and his sister. Uh, has come for regular transfusion to achieve complaints of easy fatigability and in slides are not visible janvi uh one second yeah uh, yes yes okay yeah go to the next slide one one minute one minute yeah yes yes we can see umeshwar start with umeshwar Can you see now, ma'am? Yes, yes, we can see. Umeshwaran uh, slide, we are seeing. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Umeshwaran, eleven-year-old boy, 
uh, second and birth order, born out of second degree consanguineous marriage, is hailing from Tirupattu, whose informant is uh, Mrs. Lalita, his mother, uh, reliability is good, has come for regular blood transfusion, the chief complaints. Any importance to that hailing from Tirupattu, Janvi, any importance to hailing from Tirupattu you would like to give? Incidence of thalassemia, the Tirupattu, Tirupattu. So you can't, Madurai. there is no need to stop sharing. You can continue sharing the slide. We will just Ma'am, audio it's alone. Sharing only. Okay, not sharing your slides. slides. They're not able to see your slides. Yeah, what is the importance of Tripattu Janvi? For example, what I would like to tell you is that uh, thalassemia in Tamil Nadu is more common in certain places like Madurai, the Saurashtra community of Madurai, Madurai Dharmapuri, Vellur. And uh, Tarpatur is somewhere close to Vellu Thir uh, and Thiruvannam. These places, thalassemia is common. And the prevalence of thalassemia in the whole of India is around 3 to 4 percent. Okay. Proceed, Janvi. Still present. Can you see the slides now, ma'am? No, no, no. Shall I share you slides? I think you've got some issue. Ah, yes, yes, yes. You can share, Kalpana. Ma'am, I, uh, I made your changes. Uh... Oh, okay. But we're not seeing your slides. You can start reading. Janvi's network bandwidth is low. I think Kalpana, you can share her screen. Uh, can you see the slides now? No, no, okay. your bandwidth is low. Wait, uh, you stop sharing. Kalpana, please share her screen. Have you stopped sharing, sir? Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, please go to the next slide. Yes, Kalpana, we can see you. Yeah. Any changes, you just uh, read out from your I'll slides. tell it. Yes, yes. He's still presenting on this. Yes, he's come for blood transfusion. Start from there. Uh, has come for regular blood transfusion. The chief complains of easy fatigability and increase in the intensity of pallor for past one week. Uh, he's still presenting on this. Uh, um, the patient is a known case of hematological disorder who was diagnosed at six months of age when his mother noticed poor feeding, uh, pallor and lassitude. Uh, and then his hemoglobin was found to be very low and blood transfusion was advised. Mm. At present, there is history of increase uh, uh, in uh, pallor for past one week um, and uh, easy fatigability for past one week on doing regular work, which is relieved by rest. Um, there's history of uh, yellowish discoloration of eyes, which the mom noticed for past three months. Uh, there is uh, no history of high colored stools or uh, urine or high colored urine or pale colored stools. Uh, there is history of gradual abdominal distension with dragging pain. Uh, and One no minute, Janvi. Kalpana, you'd like to answer, ask her anything? Uh, what is important about the uh, age of presentation? Um, ma'am? Six the child was requiring transmissions from six months of age. Six months of age. Is there any uh, relevance to that? Uh, I'm mostly thalassemia major presence around the, uh, the three Why? to six months. Fetal hemoglobin. There was a switch of fetal hemoglobin from HBF to HB. Uh, adult excellent, hemoglobin. excellent. Fetal to adult hemoglobin. So if the yes. child presents with thalassemia with a like symptoms before six months of age, what is the probable diagnosis? Hereditary spherocytosis. Or uh, RH incompatibility. Uh, Could be no. alpha thalassemia so or alpha thalassemia. Spherocytosis. Okay. Okay, very good. Then what is the importance of this? Uh, there is no history of high colored urine and no history of pa or pale stools. What does it indicate? Uh, Whether it indicates conjugated hyperbilirubinemia or unconjugated? Unconjugated. It indicates rule out rules out conjugated it is more likely to be unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. Okay. What is the type of hyperbilirubinemia which we expect in a case of hemolytic anemia, that is thalassemia? Unconjugated. So it, it goes with the history. Very good. Please is proceed. Is yes. an unusual complaint in thalassemia major? Uh, there is increased pallor. 
So, yes. Yes. Is, severe, very severe anemia. It is very severe anemia and easy fatigue. It's jaundice a major complaint. Okay. okay. If the child has significant jaundice and the child with thalassemia major, what does it indicate? It indicates that the child is under transfused and there is ongoing hemolysis. Or the child, because of repeated transfusions, can have chronic hepatitis because of hepatitis B or C. And sometimes it can be because of RH immunization. Uh, usually, uh, aloe immunization, red cell aloe immunization. Usually, jaundice is not a major complaint in thalassemia major. Uh, it can be a complaint in heterospherocytes, other hemolytic anemias. So, the child with thalassemia major presence with significant jaundice, try to rule out other causes of jaundice in the child. Uh, history of abdominal distension, you want to qualify it more? Was it uniform? Yes, ma'am. Uh, it was more in the upper, upper abdomen initially and uh, progressed uh, downwards uh, later over the... And mom noticed some five months ago. Yeah, and uh, so the child complains of dragging pain, but there was ring. no complaint of early uh, uh, satiety. There's no complaints of? Early satiety, but there is dragging, disturbing pain. Okay. Why, Janvi, you are very particular about this uh, dragging pain and early satiety. Anything about it? You want uh, to indication for splenectomy. Dragging pain, no. Dragging pain indicates its child is having a massive, massive splenomegaly. splenomegaly. Uh, and early satiety and dragging pain, they become one of the indication for indication splenectomy. For Excellent. Splenectomy. Very good. Very, very good. Proceed, Janvi. Uh, no history of. Uh, uh, palpitation, breathlessness, uh, edema. Next slide. Um, no history of oliguria. Uh, Why did you ask for this history? Uh, congestive cardiac failure. Palpitation, breathlessness, oliguria, for all this for asking. What did you ask them? As a congestive ca cardiac failure, as a complication. Okay. Of okay. Yes, good. So this child is not having secondary CCF. hemochromatosis. Okay. So this child is not okay. The CCF in a child with thalassemia can be due to severe anemia or due to. Myocardial Overload. involvement and cardiomyopathy with congestive cardiac failure due to iron overload. Yes, very good. Next. There's no history of easy bruising, bleeding gums or epistaxis. Uh, this is for okay. hypersplenism. Trauma oh, side yes. of kidney due to hypersplenism. So that okay. is also because of, if you want to uh, stress that only the RBC lineage is involved. So you also ah, need yes. history to see whether the platelets are involved and the WBCs are also involved. The WBC cell lineage, what history you will ask? Infection. Increased in, uh, in, in, increased number of infections, hospital fevers or other site of infections like abscesses or diarrheas. And also you should mention for the plated inv involvement, you asked about bleeding gums as well as skin uh, bleeds. Easy bruising is more of a history of coagulation abnormalities. Mm -hmm. Coagulation. Okay. Okay. As for bleeding infections. Gums, okay. Infections are more common in which hemolytic anemia. We have three prototypes, no? Sickle cell anemia, hereditary spherocytosis, and thalassemia. These are the main three prototypes which we talk about. Infections are common in which hemolytic anemia? Sickle cell. Very good. Why? Because uh, there is uh, a One thromb word. Uh, more auto prone for thrombosis and then autosplenia. Ah, yes. So they have functional asplenia or they would have undergone autosplenectomy. Excellent. Yes, proceed. Um. There is no history of pain in the legs, abdominal pain, seizures or limb weakness. Uh, this is to rule out sickle cell anemia and the crisis of sickle cell anemia. Okay. No history of bony pain uh, with fever. Uh, no history of loss of weight and appetite. No Why history of fever that? with... Ma'am, for lymphoreticular malignancies, ma'am. Loss of weight and appetite. Okay. A sick child. Child will be sick if it's lymphoreticular. Oh, okay. History okay. of fever with chills and dry gut to rule out uh, uh, malaria, ma'am. Here, it can either see anemia could have become severe because of the malaria also. Uh, jaundice can be. And jaundice is also there. Okay. Uh, yes. No history of uh, polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia, uh, tetany convulsions. Why did uh, you ask for polyuria, polydipsia? Yeah. Um, uh, if, if there is endocrine, endocrine pancreas involvement, ma'am, because secondary hemochromatosis. Diabetes. Child has gone in for secondary hemochromatosis. Diabetes mellitus, for that you asked for polyuria, oh. polyuria. Very good. Okay, proceed. So, complications due to secondary hemochromatosis. Yes. 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 Uh, same for parathyroids, I asked tetany and convulsions. Hypoparathyroidism can also occur as a complication in thalassemia. So, you asked thalassemia. for tetany and convulsions. Okay, yes. Uh, no history of uh, blood in stools. Uh, Why? Do you have any chronic loss of blood? 
any condition which produces chronic loss of blood, which produces iron deficiency anemia. For that you asked. Yes, ma'am. Can iron deficiency anemia present with hepatosplenomegaly? Yes, ma'am. Mild hepatosplenomegaly. Very good. It can present mild hepatosplenomegaly, but massive splenomegaly, which we are talking about in this case, is very unlikely. Not because of... Uh, okay. Can you tell me some causes of... Sorry, ma'am. In iron deficiency anemia, why do they have hepatosplenomegaly? Um, if it's uh, it's a very severe anemia and not uh, supplemented, they can uh, uh, start uh, extra so If they have congestive cardiac failure, cardiac failure. Iron deficiency, they can have hepatomegaly. Sometimes nutritional anemia can be because of B12 deficiency. And 30 to 40% uh -huh. of those children can have hepatosplenomegaly. That means we won't expect splenomegaly in iron deficiency anemia. Good. Okay. Very good. Yes? Fast uh, history. Uh, there's history of blood transfusion since uh, six months of age. Initially, it was given for once in two months and has increased in frequency of once in 15 days for the past three years. Uh, Intertransfusion periods were uneventful. Um, no history of tuberculosis, uh, jaundice, epilepsy, thyroid disorder. There was no history of any previous surgery. Yes, Kalpana. What are the conditions that cause uh, frequent blood transfusions like this? Uh, um, congenital hemolytic anemia, like thalassemia. Thalassemia, yes. Yes. Plastic hemolytic yes. anemia. Black, diamond black. Diamond black sun syndrome. Fan point. Very good. So, congenital uh, red cell aplasias and diamond black sun syndrome. And uh, more important, suppose you don't have hepatosplenomegaly, what will you suspect? You should suspect aplastic anemia, like Fanconi's anemia. Fanconi. You will also be requiring frequent blood transfusion, but there will not be any hepatosplenomegaly. Another important history is history of uh, visual disturbances and hearing loss. Why is that important? Toxicity of chelators. Yeah, anything unfair the etiology? Yes. Any child would require frequent blood transmission similar to thalassemia, massive hepatosplenomegaly, and the child is blind. The diagnosis is osteopetrosis. Osteopetrosis. The early loss of vision because of the optic nerve getting compressed. Optic nerve compression. Yeah. Very, okay, good. 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 Very good. Why did you ask for history of previous surgeries? What are the surgeries you expect in a child with hemolytic anemia? Yes, what surgery and why did you look for a Polycystectomy. Very good. Polycystectomy. Polycystectomy. Gallstones. They are more common in which hemolytic anemia? Hereditary spherocytosis. Very good. Another, any other surgery? for This child is 11 years old. So any child who is more than 6 years old who would have underwent what the child would have underwent? Splenectomy. Splenectomy. When, where do you, how do you look for the scar? Where do you look for the scar? On the left side from the sub, Not left necessarily sub it's a fan, It is low, for, what, for it's just below the umbilicus, a long horizontal scar. Was Did this child have any scar? Okay, you oh, tell in the examination. Okay. There was no okay. scar. So, leg like ulcers with... Okay. Kalpana? No, 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 please go on. Okay. Leg ulcers with anemia, think of sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell Gallstones anemia. with anemia, think in terms of hereditary spirosis. Massive hepatosplenum, splenohepatomegaly with anemia, think in terms of thalassemia. thalassemia. Okay, yes. Please proceed. Next slide. Next slide. Why do you think there is increased transmission requirement in this child for the past three years? Um, ma'am, first they wouldn't have titrated the growth, growth, ma'am. There is uh, growth and uh, Hypersplenism could be... Hypersplenism. Very good. Very good. Excellent. Hypersplenism. The second... It be because of... Any... As the child grows. So for that, they will calculate. According to the hemoglobin, not with the growth, with the hemoglobin percentage, we will calculate and get the... give the requirement. One is because, as your friend has said, hypersplenism is one important cause. Yes. Second is chronic red cell yes. aluminization because of minor blood group incompatibility. Uh. That can also can cause uh, frequent uh, transfusions uh, and um, those two will be more important. Okay. Third is parvovirus oh. infection, probably will not require, that is also another uh, cause, causing a plastic crisis. Crisis and producing transfusion. Next slide. Next slide, please. Treatment yes. history. Uh, the child is on tablet deferous syrups from uh, two years of age. Uh, daily morning dose is taken on empty stomach. The child is compliant. Uh, dose has increased by half a tablet for past three years. Uh, calcium supplements are taken. How did you know it was tablet Deferocerox? Deferocerox. Oh, my stomach. No, no, ma'am. The... No, ma'am. They told she me showed it to you. Morning dose on empty stomach. 
How is the take? How is the oral tablet? Is, uh, Very good. How do they take it? What is the other oral tablet? In a glass full of water, we have to mix it. Oh. Oh. Very it good. is dissolved in a glass of water. Plastic tumbler. Excellent, Harish. Why Excellent. not in a metal Please. tumbler? Yeah. It will chelate the metal in the tumbler. So the key, they just chelate it. So we get sticks on to the metal. Okay, very good. Okay. Any advantages of Defresorox over the other oral ion chelator? It is more Which selectivity is? for myocardium and as well as intra and extracellular ion. Okay, it has both the mechanisms. It it, it, can, it acts through both the mechanisms. Very good. And it is a oral and tablet. And it has small molecular waves, so it is more effective. But this child has been on Defresorox from two years of age, Harish. So, uh, any other, wh wh what the child should have done, what they should have monitored and whether it was done. Did you ask them? Did they the monitor the, what function, wh what are the, what did they monitor while the child was on deferous rock since two years of age? Uh, any, hearing they should have monitored the renal function test. Renal and function, function test. test. They should have monitored SGOT, SGPT, blood urea, serum creatinine, and urine routine. Every six months, any child who's on deferous rock should be monitored. Next slide. Calcium tablets also also given. Yes, ma'am. They're more okay. prone okay. to other tablets that are usually Folic given in Folic acid hemolysis. also. Folic okay. acid also. So there is active hemolysis. There is consumption of folate. So folate is usually given. Okay, go on. Very good. Please proceed. Yes. Family Done history. Fast. Yes. Uh, it's a second day consanguineous marriage. Uh, there is history of similar uh, illness in his older sister, who was also diagnosed at six months of age and was on blood transfusion. Uh, she died at five years of age. The cause is not, uh, not known properly. Okay. Uh, even after the death, there was no genetic counseling given. Kalpna? Suppose the mother wants to have another child. Has she completed the family? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, okay. Suppose the mother hasn't completed and wants to have another child. What will be the usual counseling that you'll get? What is the mode uh, of inheritance? Autosomal recessive. Okay. What well, about hereditary spherocytosis? Dominant. Autosomal, autosomal dominant. dominant. If both of our parents are carriers, what will be the risk in the uh, children? 25%. Both are carriers. 25%. 25%. Every, every. Risk of what? 25% risk of? Thalassemia major. 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 Uh, disease. Yes, and then the risk of carriers and being risk of normal is? 50% of carriers. 50% of carriers and 25% will be normal. normal. The most important thing that you must counsel is this risk will, will exist in every pregnancy. Every pregnancy. Every pregnancy, child will be at risk of developing the disease. So how will you counsel this mother? Suppose she wants to have a child. Any uh, way you... Ma'am, both the because... father and mother have to check if both of them are traits. Okay. Uh, if yes, you have to tell them there is 25% chance. Yeah. After that, you have to tell we will do antenatal screening uh, by DNA, uh, blood sampling and DNA analysis. If yes. it is found to be a uh, major, you have to, re you have to re be ready to You have abortion. to know the mutation causing thalassemia major in this child, in the index child. A lot of mutation, more than 50 mutations causing thalassemia. So find out what mutation this child has got. That will be determined first. And then you will go for amniocentesis, the mother around 16 weeks. See whether the mutations are there. If there are no mutations or one mutation is there, you allow the pregnancy. If both the mutations are present, then you will have to terminate, give the okay. option of termination till 24 weeks of age. Okay. 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 But what do you think is the cause of death in this child? You asked any more history? Was it because uh, of inadequate transfusions? Ma'am, they told they were regularly transfusing, ma'am. So I think it should be something related to cardiac cause. So when does cardiac, when do you start screening for cardiac kind of overload? Uh, after 10 years. 10 years of transfusions, 10 years of age. After 8 years, you start transfusing for cardiac. So cardiac uh, overloading will not cause death before that. It's usually after 20 or 40 years of age. So maybe overload. Uh, that's not okay. possibly child is <laughs> being Natasha Kessent. Okay, we'll see. Antenatal history. Uh, first trimester, pregnancy was confirmed by urine pregnancy test. She was registered and immunized uh, at a nearby PHC. A uh, history of folic acid intake was present. There was no history of fever with rash or lymphadenopathy. No history of radiation exposure, drug intake. Uh, dating scan was done at two months. Second trimester uh, and third trimester. Anything significant, Janvi? Can we go to no, the natal history? Everything is oh. Yeah, go to the natal history. 
yes next yes. list uh, full term uh, delivery at a private hospital uh, normal vaginal delivery the child cried immediately after birth birth weight of 3.2 kg there was no history of uh, nicu admission meconium and urine was passed within 24 hours after birth and breastfed within half an hour which hemolytic anemia can present in the newborn period as high drops period gross edema alpha thalassemia okay Heterocytosis and alpha thalassemia both compared. can present in the newborn period with high drops fetalis and edema. Good. Proceed. Neonatal history uh, exclusively best spread for six months. There was no history of neonatal jaundice okay. or seizures. Okay. Proceed. Proceed. Next. Next. Developmental history. Uh, all age appropriate milestones are attained. Good scholastic performance. Uh, immunization. The child is immunized at very good age according to national. You have asked for immunization for hepatitis mm -hmm. A and B. Why? Mm -hmm. Why did you? Why are you very particular about both these immunizations? Uh, Because hepatitis B are they optional uh, or they are part of the national immunization schedule? Then we. Hepatitis B is a uh, uh, part of the schedule, ma'am. Schedule. Very hepatitis good. Hepatitis A is optional. It's optional, but still, patient has had both. What significance both. you attached it? How? How is hepatitis A going to help this child? Uh. They will cause acute uh, hepatitis. Uh, already, uh, decompromised. Jaundice, 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 Why hepatitis B is one of the most uh, it is, uh, is one blood of the causes of blood borne infection that is the transfer you can transfer uh, you can transmit hepatitis B when the patient is in window period by giving repeated blood transfusions so they should be given hepatitis B any particular precaution while giving uh, hepatitis B how many doses you would like to give three what is the usual bird. schedule of uh, hepatitis give a B bird dose yes so you, have, you have to be extra because like uh, after 12 months and five boosters once in five years Okay, boosters you have given like doses. Uh, Anything you else you want to do? Checking the antibody. Type. Okay, okay. Yes. very good. Yes. How? Whatever they say, better check the antibodies and what level you call it as protective. More than? Okay. Yes, than zero point zero. More than twenty here. We even expect here. more than forty for them. Okay, that is what is expected. Okay, proceed. Next. What other immunizations are important for this child? Uh, a pneumococcal, meningococcal. Yeah, you should ask. Uh, influenza, hemophilus. Probably. This child has uh, it will be uh, will be require might be requiring splenectomy uh, because of the hypersplenism. So ask for pneumococcal vaccination and meningococcal vaccination when they should be ideally given. Suppose you are planning splenectomy, two to four weeks before uh, splenectomy. Four two weeks, weeks before the two weeks before. Okay, how frequently you should repeat them? They yeah. had three to five weeks. years. Three, very good, excellent. They have to repeat well, it after three weeks. Only uh, only two vaccines vaccine after yes. five weeks. Hemophilus yes, okay. influenza and uh, yeah. flu every year. Influenza. Flu Why all this? Why particularly all these? After splenectomy, uh, there won't be. Uh, there'll be increased chances for uh, capsulated organism infection. Encapsulated organism infection. Okay. Excellent, 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 Janvi. Very good, very good. Among What which are the national vaccine? Sorry, ma'am. Tenth year vaccine. Sorry, ma'am. I can't hear you. Child eleven years old, no? Ah, uh, yes, ma'am. What about the tenth year vaccine? Tetanus, uh, T T. Uh, was it received? Ah, uh, yes, ma'am. Was it received? Received? No. Okay. 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 Good. Good. No, ma'am. I asked. I just put. Meningococcal vaccine is it available in the national schedule, Janvi? No, ma'am. Harish. No, not, it is not available. Not. Pneumococcal is. Pneumococcal is available now, ma'am. Is now available. Very good. Available now. H influenza, pneumococcus. Are available. No. Any other vaccine you want to give, we also give influenza vaccine to them every year. Every year, we don't routinely don't give, but for these children who are planning for splenectomy, we give influenza also. Okay, go to the next slide. Yes, yes, next slide. Next slide, Janvi. Diet history is okay. Child is deficient in protein and calories by twenty percent. Okay, good, very How good. How do you calculate this calorie requirement? Uh, so the uh, ideal weight or expected weight? So the thousand five hundred is little less for a eleven year old. I so it should be for the, the it should be for the expected weight, especially for an older child. Okay. Okay. Not for the existing. Okay. Yes. General examination: the child okay. was active, conscious, and cooperative. 
uh, pallor is present, uh, ecteris is present. There was no cyanosis, clubbing, lymphadenopathy, or generalized edema. Where do you look present. for pallor, Janvi? Palmar uh, pallor. That's what I was asking. It is palmar pallor. We look only for children less than five years. Older children, lower it is not palmar. Yes. Okay. Yes, as you usually do, and usually. For looking for jaundice, whenever your examiner asks, go look for jaundice, go near broad daylight or near a window and just look at the upper pal yeah, and the upper conjunctiva. Yes, next, go. Yes. Head to foot examination. Yes. The hair is normal. Uh, frontal bossing is present. Uh, eyes were widely spaced. Uh, flat nasal bridge. Mala prominence is present. Eyes, uh, there was pallor seen, as well as icterus in the sclera. There were no bite touch spots. Uh, there was crowding of the upper teeth and prominent incisors. Uh, tongue looked pale. There were no dental caries. Uh, palma pallor was seen. Nails looked normal. There was no hyperpigmentation in the skin or the nose. Where did you look for hyperpigmentation? What do you mean by bronze uh, that is? Um, because of secondary hemochromatosis, uh, there is uh, iron deposition in the pancreas. Uh, so there's diabetes, hyperpigmentation. Uh, what is the typical appearance? Slate gray, gray, ashen gray. gray. Good, good. Very good, Ajanvi. Proceed. Uh, and then there were no abnormalities in the chest, spine, limbs, or the back. So the limbs yes. for any absent radius or the top. Yes, yes. Good, good. Proceed, Janvi. Next, next, next. Uh, vitals were not. Uh, pulse you might have, if the child is going for congestive cardiac failure, you might have a wide pulse pressure. Wide in pulse deep. pressure. Okay. Yes, but here child is okay. Yes, next. Next slide. Yes, yes. Think about the heart rate. Heart rate is normal. No? 11 year old. Slightly on the higher side. That is tachycardia. Slightly on the higher side. That is tachycardia. 11 year old. Okay. okay. Yes. 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 Uh, height oh. uh, 126 centimeter. It is below the third percentile according to IAP group chart. Uh, weight is 25 kilogram. It is between the third and tenth percentile according to IAP group chart. Uh, so, so more than five years. More than five years use the IAP modified WHO growth charts. IAP growth charts are for children less than five years. Okay. More than five years, I IAP, IAP modified, modified WHO growth charts, not the IAP charts. Okay. Okay. As per your anthropometry, height is less than third centile. Child comes under short stature. Can you tell us some of the common cause of short stature in a child with probably thalassemia? Uh, one is and what, else, what, what do you call the short stature? Less than third centile or what's the definite third. definition? Less than the third standard deviation. More than three standard Four. deviations below the expected normal. Very good. Now, can you tell me the common cause of short stature in a child with thalassemia? Short stature. I think Janvik will tell. Janvik, start. Chronic hypoxia. Um, there is chronic tissue hypoxia and reduced. Very good. Growth. Excellent. And Excellent. as a complication of uh, deferoxamine, there is upper upper segment shortening. No, oh, not because of that. One is because of the chronic hypoxia. Hypoxia, yes. And because and of uh, all these extra growth hormone pituitary is affected, so reduced yes. growth hormone production. Okay, okay well, one, one of the causes. Yes. First is because of chronic hypoxia. Second, because of the extramedullary hematopoiesis, you can have frequent pathological fractures, fractures. and bony yes. deformities can be present. And third is because of the hypogonadism, the or there will be or peaking of the pubertal growth spot will be delayed. So, because of these three, they will have short stages. Okay. okay. Also, have spinal fractures, vertebral fractures, and will reduce their uh, overall height also. Right. Yes. Proceed. Proceed. Next. Next. Next slide. Fast. Abdomen examination. Uh, yes. Inspection. Uh, abdomen appeared distended more in the upper quadrants, uh, and and the left lower quadrant. Uh, flanks were free. Uh, okay. That means how does it indicate flanks free? Uh, no free fluid. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Janvi, one important examination you left in the general examination. Before proceeding to local system examination, you would have done, you should have done mandatory SMR, for this child. Yes. Uh, yes. 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 Is it important or not in this child? Yes, ma'am. Very, very Proceed important. Delayed delayed are more likely to go in for right. hypogonadism. And how will you examine the gonads? For example, you want, this is a male child. You want to examine the testis for the student. How are you going to examine the testis? Testicular volume All and... The very good. By with what testicular instrument? Testicular, testicular volume with what instrument? Arcidum what arcidum device? Prada. Very good. Excellent. Super. You could have done this. Uh, rapidly, you could have done that SMR staging. For any child, more than six, five years. Five was, years. I saw, ma'am. It was only in you stage see. one. The testicular okay. volume yes. was less. So, but whatever is. Testicular volume, but there was no presence of pubic hair. 
So okay. what does okay. it indicate for an 11-year-old? He should be in what stage? It should be in maths. So for boys from 12 years, you can expect Anna stage one. So this is still in the pre-puberty. Pre-puberty. Why be hypogonadism in this child? She's supposed to be in. But stage you should not anticipate it later. At a later age, you can come. Very yeah, good. Excellent. Just keep it in the back of your mind. Okay. Mind, but you should always document, Janvi. When whatever you write, whatever you see, please document. Okay. Yes. Next, go for the examination of the abdomen, palpation. Uh, yes. Uh, palpation. Abdomen was not warm or tender. Liver is palpable in the region of right hypochondrium, six centimeter below the right uh, costal margin in the mid clavicular line. It good. moves with respiration, firm in consistency. Edges good. Good. Around it. Next slide. Next slide. Spleen is palpable 15 cm below the left costal margin along its long axis, extending towards the right iliac fossa. It was firm in consistency. Border was sharp and the splenic notch was felt. Uh, it was smooth in surface. As Why the hacker classification? Hmm. Hacker awesome. classification. Semi quantitative hackers classification. Okay, yes. So here it, it, come, uh, it, is, uh, all, it is below the umbilicus, ma'am, so 5. So, so it's massive, massive spleen. Massive okay, spleen. Okay, very good. Eko. Why do Can you get hepatosplenum spleen Sorry, ma'am. Why do you get hepatosplenum spleen at all? Reason. Here, the, here can... because there's inadequate transfusion. So, extra what happens? Extra, and there's extra medullary hematopoiesis. Yeah, extra medullary hematopoiesis. One is because of hemolysis, then it's because of extra medullary hematopoiesis. Sometimes if the liver can also be chronic hepatitis because of hepatitis. the repeated uh, the transfusions. So, in the presence of jaundice and uh, more of a hepatomegaly, think about chronic hepatitis also. Okay. Can you tell me some common causes of massive splenomegaly in children? Um, tropic malaria, color hazard. Okay, not malaria alone, tropical splenomegaly. Tropical malaria. malaria. Very good, very good. Excellent, Janvi. Then, color hazard, color West Bengal. Okay, add to this. But Bengalis are coming to Chennai. Okay, very good. Next. Anything else? Myelofibrosis, myeloproleukemia. Chronic myeloid leukemia is not a leukemia which occurs commonly in children, but the storage disorders. Mm -hmm. Excellent. That is a very important cause. Spino hepatomegaly storage disorders. What two storage disorders which can produce Gosh. a spino hepatomegaly? Vultures and nematrix. Very good. Percussion liver span was found to be 12 centimeter in the right uh, clavicular line. There was no free fluid. Other system examination. A uh, cardiovascular system, uh, JVP was not found to be elevated. There was no venous hum between the two heads of sternocleidum as well. Uh, first and second heart sounds were heard. Uh, I could not venous hum, where did you look for, Janvi? Between the two heads of sternocleidum as well. In between the two, with the bell of the stethoscope or diaphragm of the stethoscope? Uh, bell. You didn't know, but bell. It is with the bell, bell. of the stethoscope. Bell what, is this? Uh, with the, what is the specific characteristic of a venous hum? Uh, it is a continuous one and it uh, on Very continuous the murmur resembles the murmur of PDA and does what happens when you change the position? Change the position, you, it will reduce. Murmur. Okay, what happens when you apply and pressure? And you can obliterate it also. One question, one answer. When I ask six questions okay. for one answer, then automatically the marks gets reduced. Okay, but okay, it changes with position, pressure, and with respiration. Excellent, Janvi. Okay, yes. And hemic um, murmurs are best heard in a case of anemia. Where do you get the hemic murmurs and what is the characteristic? It's a, it's a soft, a systolic, mid-systolic murmur in the le lower left sternal border. Okay. Uh, the, what is the grade? Usually? Less than three. three, three okay. Less than three. associated with thrill. Very good. Uh, can we, uh, okay. Can, can you go to the next slide? Yes. Okay. You come to the summary. Very good. Yes, a 11-year-old 11 year old boy, Umesh Varan, of second birth order, born out of second degree consanguinous marriage, hailing from Tirupattur, is a known case of hematological disorder uh, who has come for regular blood transfusion with chief complaints of easy fatigability, increase in pallor for past one week. Uh, he has been on transfusion from six months of age with increased requirement for past three years and on tablet deprocerox and calcium for past uh, from two years of age. There's history of uh, yellow discoloration of eyes, abdominal distension, uh, dragging pain, um, a calorie def and protein deficit of around 20%. History of uh, death in an elder sister due to similar illness at five years okay. age. There's no other significant history. On examination, it was found to have a uh, short stature, uh, pallor, icterus, a hemolytic facies, and massive spleen or hepatomegaly. Okay. Diagnosis. 
uh, it is a case of inadequately transfused and inadequately chelated hemolytic anemia uh, with massive splenohepatomegaly with no signs of congestive cardiac failure or other complications and so it is probably a transfusion dependent thalassemia or thalassemia so better you say chronic hemolytic anemia uh, okay. with no congestive cardiac failure and what about the short stage uh, through the short uh, stage uh, and the significant jaundice i'll also think about other causes like so why do you say inadequately transfused and there was such a massive spleen or hemolytic facies and there was facies also typical facies hemolytic okay. facies okay but uh, inadequately okay. transfused or uh, any other cause it might be just because of increased transfusion requirement because of the hypersplenism so you didn't bring it at the starting of your uh, diagnosis say it is a chronic hemolytic anemia uh, required regular blood transfusions uh, probably a transfusion dependent thalassemia major with no signs of congestive cardiac failure with short stage of it will be uniformly present and with any of the complications if you identify uh, in this child uh, i don't think you can bring the Uh, inadequately transfused directly because there might be other causes of frequent transfusions in child and how do you okay. say inadequately chelated mm. oh, i can't tell that no, she has said oh, it's not like okay. transfused but chelated well chelated yes. well okay yes. yes possibly due to hepatotoxicity causing yeah, if you think the jaundice is significant i will think you will just rule out any other cause i mean you will rule out liver overload i have to test for uh, hepatitis how do you rule out liver overload Sorry, ma'am. How do you rule out? I mean, how do you diagnose liver iron overload? Uh, either uh, liver Bio. biopsy or uh, squid, ma'am. Squid will liver be liver biopsy. Uh, squid will be more than three point two gram per uh, milligram okay. per we'll gram. Okay, we'll go. So, Tabo, okay, go on. Okay, very good. Fantastic, Janvi. You did an excellent job, both of you, Harish and Janvi. You are presenting like. Uh, literally like post graduates uh, even the answers which the post graduates wouldn't have known both of you were able to make out ekna can we share your can we share the screen now my screen thank you ma'am yeah i'll just i will just uh, we'll go to the uh, i'll rapidly go through the slides uh, for the next 7 uh, to 3 7 to 8 minutes yes or shall i try kalpana to share the screen? Uh, yeah ma'am i'll try otherwise uh, sure host disabled participant screen sharing then we have to stop uh, stop oh, she has stopped madam stop. okay divya yeah uh, can you divya? just uh, i am not able to share my screen divya ah yes yeah yeah i will rapidly go through a few slides it may be a repetition just the salient points which will be asked in your examination now hemolytic anemia as you all know is an anemia due to increased and premature rbc destruction coupled with increased erythropoiesis evidence by reticulocytosis normal life span of an rbc is 110 to 120 days and the half life is around 55 to 60 days hemolytic anemia may be congenital or acquired we are not going to talk about the acquired hemolytic anemias this question we will definitely ask what's the normal hemoglobin pattern hemoglobin a alpha 2 beta 2 95% hemoglobin a2 alpha 2 delta 2 3.5% hemoglobin f alpha 2 gamma 2 2.5% this pattern is usually seen after uh, you are uh, after 6 months of life next slide uh, the three common prototypes are thalassemia syndromes spherocytosis among thalassemia syndrome and sickle cell disease we call them as hemoglobinopathy thalassemia is a quantitative defect sickle cell disease is a qualitative defect hereditary spherocytosis and is a membrane defect enzyme deficiency also is a membrane defect that's not uncommon uh, thalassemia syndrome is as i said it's a quantitative defect there's decreased production of uh, uh, beta globin chains major is complete absence of the beta globin chain minor is partial absence in alpha thalassemia there's partial reduction of production of alpha chains next slide now the spectrum is it can they can be carrier it can be trait it can be intermediate or it can be a major in carrier and trait there is one abnormal beta globin chain in uh, uh, intermediate and major it is there are two abnormal uh, mutations okay there are two abnormal hemoglobin genes for example in trait hemoglobin the hemoglobin pattern is a2 is elevated in intermediate and major it is a hemoglobin f which is uh, which sorry 
which is which is uh, which is elevated next slide now that certain common features which are present for all these hemolytic anemia is un anemia unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia and increased reticulocyte count but in thalassemia major because of this erythropoiesis we may not see a we may not see increased reticulocyte count the clinical features of pallor jaundice as uh, it was there in janvi's case it's a massive splenomegaly and a moderate hepatomegaly severe anemia child can also present with congestive cardiac failure next slide and this is the typical facies with frontal and parietal bossing depressed nasal bridge prominent maxilla over crowding of the teeth or over riding of the teeth there is no adequate bite between the upper teeth and the lower teeth because of the maxillary prominence next slide this is a typical hair on and appearance seen in the x ray chest and these children and we have already discussed about the cause of short stature in a child with thalassemia next slide and the important investigations are cbc with rbc indices peripheral smear examination retic and quantitation of hemoglobin percent which will be the confirmatory investigation cbc shows hem less uh, hemoglobin less than 7 grams percent the high leukocyte count in thalassemia is usually due to uh, the increase in the normoblast in the immature cells which usually which have the same size as leukocytes and are counted in not an analyzer as a high leukocyte count mcv is low and reticulocyte count him uh, usually next slide reticulocyte count is uh, you uh, is done the count is usually done by supravital staining with brilliant crystal blue normal is 1 to 2% uh, and reticulocytosis is uh, uh, we occurs in thalassemia intermedia whereas it is low to normal in thal major next slide peripheral smear is very typical microcytic hypogammic rbcs with severe anisopyclocytosis nucleated rbcs basophilic stippling target cells are very characteristic leukocytes normal and platelets are normal next slide this is a typical target cells with a center dot are you able to see the dot in the center slide that is a typical uh, target cells which we are seeing next slide and hemoglobin next slide hemoglobin electrophoresis and high performance liquid chromatography confirms the diagnosis of uh, thalassemia and this question we always ask in the examination how do you differentiate between thal trait and major thal trait hemoglobin a2 is raised hemoglobin f can be normal or increased in thal major it's always hemoglobin f which is raised rdw is increased in thal major whereas normal in, in uh, trait next slide how to differentiate between iron deficiency anemia and thal trait again rdw is increased in cases of iron deficiency anemia whereas in thal trait it can be normal next slide and again the complications we have already discussed it can be either endocrine complications cirrhosis liver congestive cardiac failure or osteoporosis and osteoporosis and osteopenia next slide transfusion transmitted infection this question we will ask you hepatitis b hepatitis c hiv ursinia malaria and cme these are next slide next slide and when is the first transfusion given when the hemoglobin level is less than 7 grams percentage on two occasions at least two weeks apart we call the, that is the way time when we give the first transfusion next slide and what what do we mean by hypertransfusion regime in hemoglobin when it is increased to when we try to increase the hemoglobin to 12 grams percentage we call that regimen as hypertransfusion regimen next slide and we give packed rbcs every 3 weeks next slides that promote and they are usually next like previous slide and they are the packed rbcs are usually leukocyte reduced by using bedside filters and the, they should be usually young rbc so we always give blood which is not more than 2 weeks old next slide and we always the mean target which we aim at is 12 grams percentage and for your understanding for uh, the for you to increase the hemoglobin to 1 grams percentage you should give 3.5 ml per kg of packed rbcs at the rate of 5 ml per kg per hour and every unit of rbc increases the iron by 200 to 250 mg of iron so iron supplements are contraindicated next slide and always monitor for the iron overload by serum ferritin but more Uh, more useful or more definitive investigations are now myocardial iron monitoring and liver iron concentrations myocardial iron is has to be done every year next slide and treat how do you treat iron overload we when do you start them on iron chelators we start after transfusions or 10 transfusions or when the serum ferritin increases to more than 1000 micrograms next slide and this is this is question one question which i always ask is what do you mean by shuttle hypothesis that is combination chelator therapy for example l1 or defriprone mobilizes tissue iron into the blood stream and when you use it along with dysphereoxamine that mobilized iron will be excreted by it so when you use combination chemotherapy it works out more over 24 hours even very severe cardiac iron overload can be reversed with intensive iron chelation next slide and as we have already discussed defresrox is the oral oral iron chelator which uh, chelates iron from both tissue and blood is a once a ther once a day therapy and the half life is 11 to 16 hours next slide next slide 
and you'll have to always monitor no the in desferioxamine you'll have to uh, as kalpana was pointing out you will have to monitor the ocular parameters auditory parameters and you should also be, be uh, vigilant about allergy allergic reactions developing for desferioxamine in the case of defepron gastrointestinal side effects arthralgia we called as l1 arthralgia which is reversible when you reverse the drug and but most important side effect is agranulocytosis and neutropenia with defepron with desferioxamine it is renal and liver abnormalities otpt elevated urea creatinine elevated then next slide then what are the important indications for splenectomy splenectomy is contraindicated in children less than 5 years indications are when the blood requirements are between 200 to 220 ml per kg per year hyperspinism or symptomatic splenomegaly next slide and the vaccines we have discussed pneumococcus h influenza neisseria meningitis and influenza viral vaccines and the cure for thalassemia is stem cell transplantation and the sources can be bone marrow peripheral blood or cord blood from the another sibling and gene therapy is on vogue and one question again we ask is what are the drugs which can precipitate hemolysis it can be anti malarial like chloroquine primaquine sulfonamides cotrimoxazole aspirin next slide and two points about sickle cell disease it is a qualitative defect glutamine is replaced by valine in the sixth position of beta chain of hemoglobin next slide and it can present with fever anemia anemia fever dactylitis may be a presenting manifestation in children splenic sequestration crisis or pain crisis more common in adults priapism can be a presenting manifestation chest wound acute chest syndrome can also be the present they usually sickle cell patients have normal immune function and they are more prone for sepsis next slide and coming to the last slide next slide next slide hereditary spherocytosis is a very important autosomal dominant mode of inheritance there is an abnormality in spectrin ankyrin and ban3 it can manifest in the newborn period and present with eye drops vitalis next slide and i i already in, uh, insisted on this gallstones can present in these children as early as 5 years and skull changes are less prominent when compared to thalassemia and the blood transfusion requirements are also less the peripheral smear typically shows as spherocytes they are norm, uh, smaller in normal they are smaller in size than the normal rbcs and are hypochromic and the normal central pallor is lost the osmotic fragility is investigation which confirms and it is increased next slide thank you thank you for patient uh, hearing we haven't spoken a little about prevention of thalassemia but want of time maybe all of you can read it thank you very much for patient i really would like to thank my co examiner and my favorite uh, examiner dr kalpana for having done a wonderful job janvi and harish you really did a very good job hats off to you both of you and i finally my real thanks to professor rama ma'am uh, who did a such a wonderful job in us she is now going to be a pioneer in ug intensive trans uh, intensive training for from this year we are starting it thank you so much rama ma'am i can never i uh, fail, i will never complete without thanking my dear dakshaini who is doing a wonderful job for the past 2 years thank you all for patient listening thank you iap tnsc Raj, uh, ramesh sir Uh, Rajendran sir and Thirumurugan sir, uh, uh, Thirumurugan sir and Gopal Subramaniam for having given us this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am and sir. Excellent, uh, Lakshmi and Kalpana. It was just plain fireworks for the past forty-five uh, minutes, and your the UGs were no less. They just came up to your level, and uh, we really we had a lots and lots of learning points as far as I was concerned, and I'm sure UGs also would have benefited a lot from you. We were very lucky that we had two presentations in a span of forty-five minutes. <laughs> and uh, you know the success of this is. the faculty and the enthusiastic students it is definitely my my job was very limited thank you so much lakshmi and kalpan thank you enough with the overall fantastic thank you ma'am thank you uh, we move on to the next session with uh, dr sri devi and uh, arundhati shri uh, dr sri devi is a associate professor of uh, pediatrics in uh, kilpock medical college and arundhati shri is a professor of pediatrics in tirunelveli we did our uh, post graduation together we welcome you both on board to take over the next session and uh, over to you and your post graduates thank you ma'am uh, i am going to together with uh, professor anand shri going to have conduct this session on ara or pneumonia yeah hari hari sudan you can start uh, the screen sharing uh, go to the slide show uh, the, the case will be presented by our kilpak medical college undergraduate hari hari sudan he will be helped by another student jana in answering the questions So, anything you want to tell, Madam Anandishri, Madam? Yeah, uh, that's want to thank the uh, IAPT NC chapter and Dr. Rama, Madam, for this uh, good opportunity for both the faculties and as well as the 
students and i welcome uh, the presenter sari and jana for a good presentation yes we can move into the presentation yeah we can start adihara sodan you can start yes so master s a 3 year 1 month old boy from kollathur presented to the opd the history was elicited from his mother and the reliability is good he presented with the chief complaint of cough for the past 5 days fever for the past 5 days and fast breathing for the past 4 days history of presenting illness i was apparently normal 5 days back after which he developed wet cough which was insidious in onset progressive in nature no diurnal or postural variations were seen there were no aggravating factors the cough was relieved by medications and it was not associated with post tussive vomiting fever for the past 5 days which was high grade intermittent associated with rigors relieved by medications the child was normal during the interfebrile period the child had fast breathing for the past 4 days which was acute in onset there were no aggravating or relieving factors the child had difficulty in feeding the mother reported observing chest retractions history of running nose for the past 4 days the watery discharge present there was no history of coughing up of blood wheeze discoloration of lips or extremities ear pain ear discharge mouth breathing snoring or voice change there was no history of any cardiac involvement there was no history suggestive of aspiration of food or foreign body aspiration diarrhea any rashes convulsions vomiting feeding difficulties headache malaise lethargy loss of weight loss of appetite or bad child rearing practices yes sir yes sir we'll uh, stop here yeah or uh, yes. first slide of present history no yes, first slide yeah so the history always will uh, take us to the correct diagnosis probably no so what do you mean by apparently normal 5 days back um before 5 uh, days the mother told that the child was normal and she did not he did not have any kind of uh, symptoms he developed yeah. the symptoms only after that yeah fine uh, go to the next slide yeah no history of cardiac well, instead of that we can say no history suggestive of cardiac involvement so the apparently normal usually rules out this cardiac involvement also good very good then in the present history you are asked for fever So, yes. what is the clue you are getting from the presence of fever? The presence of fever indicates that this could be some infective etiology. That yes, uh, very good. So, the presence of fever, most of the time, we'll say that it is an infective. Most probably, always no. It can be bacterial. bacterial. Yes, sometimes it can be viral. Yes. And sometimes viral pneumonia that may not be associated with the fever. Okay. So yes, that is from the second point. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So you said this child has cough, fever, and fast breathing. Those are the three main symptoms. Yes, so can you tell me some causes of nocturnal cough? You said there is no aggravating, relieving factors. Can you tell me some causes of nocturnal cough? Um, uh, nocturnal cough can be associated with either uh, GERD or it can be uh, associated with in GERD when the child uh, lies down, then uh, it might result in cough because of the gastroesophageal reflux. And then uh, other causes of uh, nocturnal cough include bronchial uh, yeah. asthma. Yeah. Yes. That's good. Jana, good. Yes. So usually nocturnal cough, no. Usually that will be present, you know, in case okay. of mild asthma. They can. Okay. Okay. Then you okay. said not associated with post-asthma vomiting. Can you tell some conditions where you have post-asthma vomiting? I'm uh, in. Uh, In severe cough, there might be uh, post-asthma vomiting, like whooping cough, ma'am. Yes, good. Okay. And good. Uh, you know, severe asthma after okay, uh, the, after after episode of coughs, the child might uh, end up so vomiting. What, yeah, good. What is the physiology behind post-asthma vomiting? No, the physiology because, uh, behind. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Because increase. Because excess cough, there will be increased uh, intrathoracic pressure and intra-abdominal pressure. Intra-abdominal pressure. Yes, very. Yes. Good. Yes. Yes, yes, good. Yes. Okay. Can you tell me some ca- one cardiac cause of cough in this child? We are thinking that this cough is respiratory. Yes. So, uh, can you tell me some cardiac cause for cough in child? Cardiac causes might either heart failure, cardiac cause pulmonary of pulmonary congestion, and cough. Yes, my mitral stenosis can cause cough. Cardiac failure okay, can cause cough. Okay. Very good. Okay. And I, I, 
Okay, very good. Some gastrointestinal cause of cough. You already said uh, that. GRD. Yeah. GRD is that is a GA cause gas of cough. Okay, and you yes, said this cough is a wet cough. So, yes, uh, is it with expectation? No, ma'am. In a, yeah, such a young child, expectation is usually not observed. Expectation is usually observed only after the age of three years or five years in uh, most cases. Okay, more than five to seven years only you can observe expectation, and not in a three-year-old child. Okay, yes, so if the child is going to be a bigger child with expectation, can the nature of sputum give you some clue about the etiology of cough? Yes, ma'am. Definitely, ma'am. If the sputum is uh, purulent, then we can suspect uh, bronchiectasis and uh, other okay. conditions like that. And uh, in bronchiectasis, characteristically, a three-layered uh, sputum is seen, ma'am. Okay. Uh, then a red, a red current jelly sputum will be seen in uh, pneumonia caused by uh, Klebsiella, ma'am. Okay. Or cancer Klebsiella. A green red, colored sputum. Red or rusty sputum, not red current jelly, red or rusty sputum. Red or rusty sputum. Yeah. And Good. a green yes. colored sputum can be seen in uh, pneumonia caused due to pseudomonas, ma'am. A yes. black colored uh, sputum can be seen in uh, fungal infections. Okay, very good. Yes. Pink frothy sputum? Pink frothy sputum usually uh, points towards pulmonary edema. Very which good. is uh, associated Very with good. cardiac conditions. Very good. And uh, does this child have chest pain? No, ma'am. This child does not have chest pain. Okay. Can you tell me if the child is going to have chest pain, what will you think of? If the child has if chest pain, child... it could be a complication of pneumonia, ma'am, in which uh, the uh, pneumonia results in an empyema, which will result in localized tenderness and chest pain, ma'am. If there is a okay. diffuse, yes, ma'am. Yeah, you, you just elaborate the causes for chest pain. So that is a routinely asked question during your viva in your presentation. Yes, causes for chest yes, pain. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Chest pain can be uh, either of, due to cardiac or respiratory chest pain, ma'am. Respiratory chest pain, the most common cause in child is pleurisy, ma'am. Due to involvement of the pleura, the pain will be uh, worsened on taking a deep inspiration and will be relieved on lying on the same side. In the case of cardiac chest pain, ma'am, uh, it will be worsened on activity or when the child cries and it will be relieved by rest, ma'am. Okay, you can start from very much from the skin, the uh, bones, yes, and the, the lung and the cardiac causes. Okay. So that will be a good answer during it. Now. Yes. yes I think you can, can you have through. any referred pain in uh, RS disease? Yes, ma'am. Uh, if there is any uh, irritation of the left diaphragm, then the, the pain will right. be referred to the uh, left shoulder ma'am, because they have the similar uh, dermatobal innervation. Okay, you may have referred pain to the shoulder or abdomen. Yes, okay, you said the onset of the fast breathing was acute in onset. So, yes, what are the etiologies you will think of when you have an acute fast breathing? Acute fast breathing is seen in a uh, foreign body, ma'am. It can also be seen in uh, a severe attack of asthma. It can also be seen in uh, pulmonary edema, pulmonary embolism, pneumothorax. So in your case, what is the etiology you are thinking of? The child is presented with a previously normal child is presented with five days duration of cough, wet cough, fever and fast breathing. So what is that you are thinking of? Uh, because this, uh, this, this, uh, the child has fever, then I am... Uh, Thinking of an infective etiology and uh, fever is more associated with the bacterial cause of uh, pneumonia. Okay, so in that case, the onset of fast breathing will be acute or insidious? Be insidious, ma'am. Because you mentioned acute, I am asking. So, generally in pneumonia, it will be insidious fast breathing rather than acute fast breathing. Okay, okay. so what all you cover under apart from in, instead of saying no history suggestive of cardiac symptoms. You could have elaborated the symptoms. You could have said what all symptoms you expect and what is not there. Okay. Yeah, Apart from uh, history of uh, uh, the history of uh, your uh, uh, what else you could have said in the history. If you want to talk about the history of etiology, what else you could have said in the history? Go to the next slide. Negative histories. Yes, ma'am. Ah, uh, yeah. So what else you could have said in the negative history? Uh, if you want to cover the history of etiology. Could, I could have asked about uh, uh, I don't know ma'am. I think Among the organism, pa, see if you are suspecting staphylococcal pneumonia, what is the peripheral sign which may be present? What there are may the skin boils. There may ah, be skin boils. boils and, yeah. 
Yes. So mention about history of boils also, whether the mother, okay. you're going to tell on examination, but anyway, even in the history, you can say no history of above whatever you said, you said so many negative history, you could have added that also to say that you are not suspecting staphylococcal etiology. Yes, you know, uh, okay. given us no rashes, no. So by the side of it, always remember skin infection, boils. No history of rashes you have given. So yes. rather than the rashes, you put that as a boil. And you okay, have asked the history of diarrhea. What is the yes, correlation between loose tools and respiratory problem? Um, uh, most of the uh, viruses which causes, uh, cause the respiratory tract infection also cause uh, diarrhea, ma'am. So yeah, very good. So you can give a clue that it can be a viral pneumonia. And yes, if the child is having chronic diarrhea yes, and the child is having a respiratory problem, yes, is there, can it be any correlation? Chronic diarrhea, respiratory tract infection usually points towards a uh, chronic immunodeficiency like condition, ma'am. Like, yeah, uh, HIV it can be also. immunodeficiency. Can it be anything else? Any other condition, genetic condition? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. It can be uh, like genetic immunodeficiency conditions like chronic granulomatous disease, Chidia Kiga, she said. Jana, you want to add anything? So, as you present now, probably we might get an answer for that. Probably oh. in the newborn period, whether there is a specific indicator for that. Okay, you can proceed now. Yes, ma'am. Yes. So fast history. History of similar illness one year back for which the child was hospitalized and treated with injections. No history of recurrent respiratory tract infections, skin infections, diarrheal diseases, or failure to gain weight. No history of exanthematous fevers. Not a known case of bronchial asthma or allergy. No history of any surgeries. Yes. Okay. So in the past history, go back to the past history. So whatever yes. you have presented. So history of similar illness one year back you have said. So what do you understand by the term recurrent pneumonia? Um, uh, we use the term recurrent pneumonia to describe either uh, two episodes of pneumonia within a six month period or uh, more than three episodes of pneumonia with a, uh, at any time interval. Okay. So, what are, can you tell me some causes of recurrent pneumonia? Some causes of recurrent pneumonia include uh, some anatomical uh, uh, anatomical uh, problems in the child such as sequestration of the lung or uh, it could also be due to uh, immunodeficiency ma'am or it okay. can be due to or it can be due to Any neurological uh, problem? Ma'am, in case of cyanotic cleft I mean, in case of cyanotic Left congenital heart disease, heart. further there is increased pulmonary congestion. No, pa, cyanotic heart disease, okay. Generally, acyanotics are the one who present with increased pulmonary congestion. Of course, some cyanotic do. Okay, that is not typical answer. Any Left. neurological thing? It can be due to cleft palate, ma'am. can be due to palatal okay. paralysis and aspiration. Any neurological cause? Neurological cause? Uh... Repeated aspiration. Yes, ma'am. It can be due to diphtheria causing the paralysis of the palate. Pardon me? Um, diphtheria causes palatal paralysis, ma'am. Okay. Not just that, your cerebral palsy. Cerebral, In cerebral palsy. palsy, you may have pseudobulbar palsy. It is associated with repeated Current aspirations. Aspect. It is associated typically with recurrent pneumonia. And okay. then primary immunodeficiency. Yes, okay. All those conditions. Okay. What do you understand by the term persistent pneumonia? A persistent pneumonia is when the episode of pneumonia lasts for greater than uh, four weeks. Now. Okay, more than a month, you call it persistent pneumonia. And you said uh, uh, there is uh, no history of exanthematous fever. What is that you are specifically looking for? We are looking for conditions like measles, ma'am. Measles causes uh, okay. more. Post measles state, what are the usual organisms which cause pneumonia? And the usual organisms are Haemophilus influenzae, Streptococcus pneumoniae, Staphylococcus aureus. Measles itself can cause uh, giant cell pneumonitis. Okay. Post exanthematous fever, specifically streptococcus and staphylococcus are more common in producing pneumonia in uh, post measles patient. Okay. And, uh, okay, fine. In the past history, no, now we have, have here said no history of recurrent respiratory tract infection, diarrheal episodes, failure to gain weight. So, all grouped together. Can you think of anything? Chronic diarrhea? Failure to thrive, recurrent respiratory tract infection. Uh, it is also it's a rare, but quite it is a possibility when a child is coming with failure to thrive, presenting. No? So always think of a possibility of your cystic fibrosis. Okay. Cystic fibrosis. So, so it is a rare one, 
because all together you have put recurrent respiratory infection diarrheal episodes failure to gain okay, we should keep it that in also mind okay yes yes can i can i go to the next slide ma oh yeah 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 antenatal history the birth order of the child is 2 the child was born out of a non consanguineous marriage registered and immunized the, the mother took iron and folic acid tablets regularly there was no history of any fever with rash dating scan anomaly scan and growth scan were done and found to be normal all trimesters were uneventful okay go to the next yes natal history it was a term delivery there was a normal vaginal delivery at the hospital the birth weight was 2.2 kg the child cried immediately after birth breast feeding was started within 30 minutes of delivery neonatal history meconium was passed at 5 hours there was no history of nicu admission no history of neonatal jaundice or asphyxia the child was exclusively breastfed for 6 months and breastfeeding continued up to 2 and a half years of age immunization yes. history yes previous slide no yes ma'am because we have said in the past history recurrent loose stools and other things so if it is going to the cystic fibrosis uh, sometimes there can be a delayed passage or meconium insufficient syndrome meconium yes, flux syndrome okay yes ma'am so this yes, is for you to answer during your exam yes go to them okay ma'am yes If immunization history the child was immunized up to date according to the national immunization schedule yearly influenza and pneumonia vaccines were not taken okay yeah. as for immunize as much as immunization history is concerned what are the vaccines in the national immunization schedule that protect against pneumonia the dr jana you please your can you switch on your video if your bandwidth is okay you switch on the video please yeah the various yes, vaccines that are Now the various vaccines in the immunization schedule that are protective are diphtheria, pertussis, uh, Haemophilus influenza B, and uh, the recently added uh, pneumococcal va vaccine is called the protect. And also one more, no, the birth vaccine, no, at birth we are giving one vaccine. BCG, ma'am. Yeah. Yes. BCG. Okay. Yeah. And also, what you said, post what stage you will get pneumonia? So also you should post uh, that. measles, post measles yeah. stage. Yeah. So even measles uh, vaccination is significant. to offer protection against pneumonia so you should okay. tell all these vaccines yes okay yes along with immunization no uh, one more drug is being given that also gives protection against respiratory infection vitamin vitamin a ma'am yeah very good so that you can also say along with this no in a case of respiratory problem. yes okay this child is a 3 year old child so when was the child immunized last from the According child was schedule means what do you expect according to the schedule uh, the child would have gotten a tt dose tdd dose uh, at the age of 2 uh, years ma'am what what national immunization schedule b taro okay yeah, that is very very much any mistake okay. jana you want to modify it you want to add some yes, around 16 to 24 months uh, a 1 and 1/2 uh, years what do you give yes a measles second, second, yes. second uh, mr second dose and uh, Vitamin second dose, uh, Japanese encephalitis second dose, uh, with the uh, DPT vaccine, DPT first booster, ma'am. First booster. So oh. immunization schedule B is around now during before your exam. And okay. in the immunization history, you are supposed to say what was the last vaccine as per schedule the child received, and what is the next due for the index. Okay, that okay. should be written. Okay, good. Okay. Yes. Okay. Good. Go to the next. Developmental history. a uh, gross motor the child rides a tricycle and can go upstairs with the alternating feet fine motor a tower of nine blocks and copies the circle social and adaptive the child shares toys language the child can ask questions knows his full name and gender for the present age of 3 years and 1 month the latest developmental milestones have been achieved in all four domains therefore the development is appropriate for age yes uh, what is the importance of developmental history in a child with a respiratory disease madam has okay. already told you no yes, yes ma'am uh, ma the child's uh, developmental milestones are lagging then uh, the child is more prone for aspiration okay good very good yes let's go to the next next diet history the child consumes a mixed diet diet history was obtained by the 24 hour recall method breastfeeding was started within 30 minutes of delivery and the child was exclusively breastfed for 6 months and breastfed breast kid feeding continued up to 2 and a half years of age so the child is taking a near normal diet 
the, all the reference values have been taken from the ICMR calorie reference chart. Okay. okay, you said breastfed up to two and a half years. What is the recommendation for breastfeeding duration? Um, uh, the recommendation is uh, six months of exclusive breastfeeding, and uh, the breastfeeding can be continued up to two years of age. Up to two years and beyond. Okay. So if the mother is going to feed for two and a half years, there's nothing wrong. There is no okay. cutoff that a mother should stop by two years. It can be continued up to two years and beyond, as much as the mother wants. So up to two and a half years is very much normal. Okay, ma'am. And in the nutritional history, you can also add on the child is having vegetables and fruits when they are taking, no? So thereby the child is getting micronutrients. That can also be added to the nutritional history. Okay, yes. Yes. So family history, yes. no history of similar illnesses in the family, no history of bronchial asthma in the family. No history of passive smoking or any allergy in the family. Always, so, it's, yes, always it will be good if you put a family pedigree chart. In, okay. Yes, and also, always undergraduates go by the pediatric case formatting. So, after okay. birth, neonatal, diet, development, immunization, family history, socioeconomic, like that. Okay. That immunization order. So, the order of presentation always keep it as per the IAP recommendation. It is available in the book, not text. Okay. okay. Yes. Okay. Fine. Yes. Yes. Socioeconomic history. Yes. The family lives in a semi paka house, which is well ventilated, and overcrowding is present. There is no separate kitchen, separate toilet and bathroom. The fuel used is liquefied petroleum gas. The water is obtained from a municipality, stored in overhead tanks, and boiled before drinking. The family belongs to a class four, according to the modified Kupaswami scale. Household waste is disposed in street beds. There's a history of mosquitoes building uh, breeding in the nearby area. There's a history of rodents present. There's no history of contact with either tuberculosis or COVID-19 patients. Jana, what is the significance of uh, socio-economic history in a RS case? What all you want to ask for? He's told, but I just want you to read it. Um, history of overcrowding, ma'am. Uh, okay, overcrowding, you'll uh, know what, what it will lead to. I mean, uh, respect. Uh, infectivity, uh, respiratory infection. Yeah. It can be a cause for pneumonia. It can predispose to pneumonia. Then? Uh, then indoor air pollution, ma'am. Okay, indoor air pollution and? And uh, hand I, personal hygiene maintain. Okay. Then he's mentioned something else. Ventilation. Passive smoking. Passive smoking, yes, ma'am. Okay, something else he's not mentioned. All these things are significant for what? Passive smoking, uh, your uh, indoor air pollution, all these things are significant for what? Um, they will uh, they will just decrease the local immunity of the respiratory tract, ma'am. So it makes them more uh, predisposed to developing respiratory infections. Okay, not only infections, what else? They can also uh, develop asthma. Yeah, allergic airway disease. They will uh, cause the exacerbation. Something else you have missed out for asthma exacerbation in your socioeconomic history, which you um, should tell in pollen, pollen, yes, ma'am. Uh, history of any, any uh, allergic... Uh, pets. History of any pets in the house. Pets, pets in the house, yes. You have to tell that okay. also in socioeconomic history, whether they are rearing any pets in the house. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Yes, okay, ma proceed. Allergy history, no significant allergy history. Male child came with complaints of cough, high fever, and fast breathing associated with chest retractions and running nose. He did not have any complaints related to the cardiovascular system. This is probably a case of lower respiratory tract infection. So I would like to examine the respiratory system. Okay. With history, you have said it is a respiratory tract system. Can you differentiate between upper and lower respiratory system? And how do you do that? I'm uh, in a lower because of the lower respiratory tract system. Uh, the child has uh, various uh, symptoms like chest retractions. Okay, and, very uh, good. If it is going to be just cough, cold, fever, it can be a simple URI as well as an LRI. So chest yes, retraction is one symptomatology that is clearly differentiating that it is a lower respiratory infection rather than an upper respiratory infection. Okay, yes, among lower respiratory infection, can you, can you differentiate in your history whether it involves airway, parenchyma or pleura? Yes, ma'am. If the infection involves the pleura, then there will definitely be pain, ma'am. Okay, pain. pleural involvement, you will have chest pain. Then, how do you uh, differentiate between airway and parenchyma? Uh, in airway, ma'am, there will be uh, 
mother might complain of uh, wheezing or uh, yeah there will be noisy breathing in airway involvement yes ma'am okay as per symptomatology noisy breathing means airway involvement and chest pain means pleura so these two things are not there only chest retractions are there and even again in chest retraction if it is going to be lower chest retraction it is more in favor of your uh, parenchyma if it is going to be a central chest retraction like your sternal retraction then it is going to be more of a airway disease so with the symptomatology itself you can localize it's a rs it is a lower respiratory tract it's a parenchymal disease so what is the common parenchymal disease you expect in a child of this age and the common parent common parenchymal disease is uh... what is your diagnosis that's what pneumonia ma'am ah pneumonia so you are thinking this your provisional diagnosis as per your symptom analysis is pneumonia okay proceed so examination after getting consent from the mother the child was examined in the setting position the child was alert active and looking at the examiner the tongue was moist and skin turgor was normal tachypnea subcostal and intercostal retractions were present no pallor ictus cyanosis clubbing lymphadenopathy or pedal edema was seen okay so you said uh, the child was examined in sitting position so what are the various positions you examine a child in different age groups how do you examine an infant infant is uh, examined in the mother's lap okay sitting or lying down position we can examine both the lying down and sitting positions Okay, generally in lying down position okay in mother's lap so how do you examine a toddler toddler is uh, examined in the sitting position and the toddler is uh, sitting comfortably on the mother's lap mother's lap so beyond 3 years only generally you make the patient lie down in a couch and examine that too if the patient is not uh, having any anxiety even more than 3 year old child if the child is anxious and resisting examination whatever posture the comfortable child is comfortable with you should try to put the child in the comfortable posture and examine why if you make the child uncomfortable what is the problem the child might cry and uh, that might uh, affect us uh, affect our findings and we might yes. not be able to do so all this when you're going to count the respiratory rate and heart rate if the child is crying you will get a erroneous high values so you cannot find out what is the exact situation so you want to be the make the child as comfortable as possible okay yes, then you said Uh, the child is alert active and looking at examiner so what do you imply out of it um uh, this means that the child is uh, reasonably well because uh, if the child is very sick then the child will be lethargic it means the child is neurologically intact well means you are you are talking about the neurological system you are saying neurological. the child sensorium is normal by meaning okay. to say that alert active and looking at examiner you are saying the sensorium is normal the yes. child is neither irritable nor depressed that is what you are trying yes. to say Okay, you said subcostal retraction. Can you describe subcostal retraction? Um, uh, subcostal What is retraction. What are you exactly looking for? Um, the chest wall will uh, go in, go into the. Uh, there will be a depression of the chest, lower chest wall, ma'am. Whenever the child inspires or takes breath inside. Very good, very good. Normally, what happens when the child is taking a breath in? What should happen? The chest wall should expand, ma'am. It should move out. Yes, so instead of moving out of the chest wall is moving in uh, you will think in terms of that is yes, called subcostal retraction okay yes, jana he is told no pallor ictus cyanosis clubbing lymphadenopathy pedal edema can you tell me one cause of pneumonia with ictus mycoplasma pneumonia can cause extra pulmonary okay, manifestations yes, okay so it can be associated with okay, jaundice Can you tell me one cause of pneumonia with cyanosis? If the child pneumonia child is having cyanosis, what is that you will think? It is a danger sign. Okay, means yes, the child Sorry. is hypoxic. So the pneumonia Before. child is having cyanosis. It clearly means it's a danger sign, and it is a very severe pneumonia. If the pneumonia child okay. is having clubbing, what will you think of? Madam gave us some chronic etiology, ma'am. Chronic, chronic. Cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis. Ah, something like cystic fibrosis. If pneumonia child is having cervical lymphadenopathy, what etiology you should think of? Tuberculous etiology. Tuberculous. Okay. What else? There could be some generalized immunodeficiency um, like uh, HIV. Uh, Again, mycoplasma, mycoplasma pneumonia can cause lymphadenopathy. Okay. Lymphadenopathy. You should think of mycoplasma okay. also. Pneumonia child with pedal edema. 
we should think of some cardiac complaint now. cardiac yeah, cardiac left to right shunt associated with pneumonia okay so everything has a significance okay, okay uh, just i want to add one thing so in general examination or the general examination you should describe we are as general condition then vitals anthropometry head to foot examination smr if it is applicable and uh, developmental assessment okay Okay. Here, no, uh, this is general examination. So, you need not mention yes. here tachypnea uh, subclass again because again you are going to say this in your respiratory system examination. So, here it is enough if you say the general condition, alert active, uh, then you can say the child is uh, dyspneic or tachypneic, phalerictocyanosis, and if there is dehydration, you can make a mention of it. Okay. Yes. Yes, so, general examination, you need not uh, say, but a good thing we discussed all about that. So that will help to in the respiratory system. So yes. first general condition, vitals, anthropometry, head to foot, SMR if it is applicable, and developmental assessment. Okay, because yes. we have said all the developmental history. Okay, this is okay. for all the undergraduate students. Okay, yes, let's go so to the next. Fine. Vitals, pulse rate 100 per minute, regular in rhythm and character, normal in volume, measured in the radial artery. Respiratory rate was 55 per minute, mostly abdominal thoracic. Intercostal and blood pressure was measured to be 100 over 70 millimeters of mercury in the supine position in the right arm. Temperature was measured to be 100 Fahrenheit. It was measured in the axilla. Okay, these all were measured values. You were yes. examination finding. So each yes. and everything you should add a comment. Pulse rate. This is whether it is normal for that. Rate is normal. Then you okay. can say respiratory rate. You are comment on that. You need yes. not say here also. Retraction, other things, the rate, whether it is increased or not. Okay. okay so, what is your comment on the pulse rate, respiratory rate, BP, temperature? Yes. Um, respiratory rate is increased, ma'am. Yes, good, very good. Respiratory rate. So, what are the cutoff point to say the respiratory rate increase in various age groups? Ma'am, um, less than uh, two months, in a less than two month old uh, infant, then the rate should be less than 60 breaths per minute. Ah, yeah. yes. two months to Two months to one year old, Child, the Very respiratory good. rate should be less than 50 breaths per minute. Yes. And in a one to five year old child, the respiratory rate should be less than 40 breaths per minute. Oh, yes. And in a greater than five year old child, the respiratory rate should be less than 30 yes. breaths per minute. Yes. Very good. You can remember it is 60, 50, 40, 30. Okay. Yes. So yes, here, your comment on this rate is increased. Three year old, 55 increase. Okay. Yes, yes. Jana, can you tell me how to count the respiratory rate? How long you want to count? We have to count for one full minute, ma'am. Uh, usually we count with pal. You count yes, by inspection or palpation? How do you count exactly? Palpation, ma'am. We have to count by palpation by placing our hand over the abdomen, ma'am. We have to count for the, uh, for one full minute. Okay. Why why can't you count for lesser time? Because in uh, infants, the breathing will be uh, periodic. Uh, periodic breathing, ma'am. Uh, breathing changes, ma'am. Okay, so you always count for one full minute and you count by palpation rather than by inspection. Okay, you can, you can miss a rate if you count by inspection. Okay, proceed. Yes. Head to foot examination. The neck was normal, oral cavity and ear normal, tongue, no cyanosis was seen. In the chest, retractions were present and fast breathing was also observed. The limbs were normal, the skin had no redness or rashes. The hair was black in color, there was no change in color, and the luster was normal. The spine and cranium were found to be normal. As Madam has said, you can add no, no redness, no rashes, no skin boils. Bioderma. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay. That can be added. Good. Yes. So anthropometry. The weight was measured to be 14 kilograms, and it was between the 15th and 50th percentile. Height was measured to be 93 centimeters, and it was between the 15th and 50th percentile. The weight for height was also between the 50th and 85th percentile. The head circumference was measured to be 48.2 centimeters and it was between the 15th and 50th percentile. The mid upper arm circumference was measured to be 16 centimeters. Just okay. your comment on your comment. Um, uh, you the, uh, yeah. Yes. The mid upper arm circumference is uh, normal, ma'am. The child is in a well nourished state. Yes. Based upon the it's normal. It's normal. Yes. Other parameters also normal. So you are given yes, it is between 50 and 50, but your comment should be it is normal. Okay. Yes. 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 Okay. So this child is nutritionally normal. 
If this yes. child had malnutrition, what is the significance? Jana, you please answer. If this child had malnutrition, you are seeing a case of malnutrition with pneumonia. So what is what should ring in your mind? Um, the severity uh, of the disease will be uh, is increased, ma'am, in case of a malnourished okay. child. Okay. And uh, the approach so to the child. It is the, considered... So how is your management going to differ? Um, uh, we, we consider it as a severe pneumonia. Okay. Any child with malnutrition, with uh, pneumonia, you have to hospitalize and treat. There is no outpatient yes, management. Otherwise, yes, depending on the severity, you may go for outpatient management. But if the child is going to have SAM with pneumonia, you will always hospitalize and treat. And the implication is that the mortality in pneumonia cases is specifically seen in malnutrition with pneumonia. So in a child with malnutrition with pneumonia, it should immediately ring your bell that you have to hospitalize the child. You have to be treat the child with utmost carefulness. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Let's go to inspection. After respiratory tract, uh, the nose was inspected and watery discharge was seen. The ear is normal. Clearing of the ala nasa was seen. Nasal septum is normal with no deviation. Sinus tenderness was absent. In the pharynx, there was no tonsillitis, no signs of pharyngitis or cleft palate. The lower respiratory tract. On inspection, the shape of the chest was elliptical. The trachea appears to be in the midline. The apex peak was not seen. The chest moves symmetrically on both sides. Subcostal and intracostal retractions are seen. There is use of accessory muscles of respiration. Both nipples are at the same level. No sinuses, scars, visible pulsations, or chest wall deformities are seen. Why you specifically said both nipples are at the same level? So th that can be avoided. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Asymmetry, other thing you can say. Okay. Yes. 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 So on palpation, the inspectory findings were confirmed. There was no tenderness. The chest moves equally on both sides. There was no local rises in temperature. The position of trachea is in the midline. Apical impulse was felt in the left fifth intercostal space, medial to the midclavicular line. And there is no tactile primitus. So no okay, local you warmth. You can put that as no local rise in temperature. Okay, ma'am. Okay, ma okay, you are telling in terms of warmth, tenderness, all those things. So yes, if the child is going to have a localized warmth and tenderness, what is that you are going to think of? Oh, it could it could be a complication of pneumonia. Ma'am, empyema usually presents with a localized warmth and tenderness. In all cases of empyema, do no. you have localized warmth and tenderness? Empyema in all cases we won't get. Okay. So instead of if what is it called? Called a, a syndemonic effusion. No, no. no syndemonic effusion means it's a serous effusion that will not be associated with pain or tenderness. That okay. may not be associated with any symptom. Other than chest may not move equal, that way it will be minimal. Only empyema, you will find decrease in chest movement. Have you heard of the term called empyema necessitans? No, ma'am. Where the empyema pus tracks through the chest wall. That yes, is where you will have localized tenderness and warmth. Not in all cases of empyema. In plain case of empyema, you will just find that the chest may not move symmetrically. That is what you may find. You may not find tenderness and warmth. That is found only if there is empyema necessitance. Okay. So the no local rise in temperature. Now this is a trap sometimes that will give you more trouble by more number of questions. So that can be avoided that. Okay. Yes. Fine. You said no tactile fremitus. What do you mean by tactile fremitus? Tactile fremitus is a uh, audible uh, crepitation. Audible crepitation. You are going to tell in palpable what is tactile fremitus? The palpable crepitation. Okay. Palpable breath sounds are called tactile fremitus. Yes. Okay. Good. Go to the next. The vocal fremitus. The vocal fremitus was increased in the right infraxillary, the left inframammary, and infrascapular areas. All the other areas were found to be normal. Okay, what is vocal fremitus? I mean, vocal fremitus, uh, we have to use the ulnar border of our hand to systematically uh, uh, check each area. And then uh, while the child uh, keeps on saying uh, a consonant like 1111 or... Uh, in you make the child children, vocalize, like, speak something yes, and palpate yes, for fremitus. That is palpable breath sound or palpable resonance. This thing. So that is called vocal fremitus. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So you are saying it is increased in certain areas. Okay. Yes, ma'am. 
percussion the, the percussion note was impaired in the right infra axillary area the left infra mammary and infra scapular areas the note was resonant in the rest of the areas auscultation normal vesicular breath sounds could be heard additional sounds namely the wheeze was heard in the right supraclavicular area infra scapular area and the left axillary area fine crackles could be appreciated in the right infra axillary area the left infra mammary area and the infra scapular area Jana, can you describe vesicular breath sound and uh, bronchial breath sound? Um, uh, vesicular breath sounds, it is a uh, uh, it is a high pitched breath sound, ma'am. Which which has uh, the breath sounds has increased time during uh, inspiration and uh, exp uh, expiration have less amount of time, ma'am. There is no time uh, time gap between inspiration and expiration, ma'am. Okay, bronchial. Uh, bronchial Bronchial breathing is a low pitch sound, ma'am. There is a gap between uh, inspiration and expiration. Mm. And for expiration, it lasts for the first half or the whole expiration. of expiration. It lasts for the whole of the expiration. Expiration. Okay. okay. Does, whereas vesicular will last only for the first half of the expiration. Okay. Can okay. you describe uh, what is the other terminology used for crackles? He said crackles. Repetition. Repetition. What is the other terminology used for wheeze? Uh, bronchi. Okay. Bronchi. Okay. 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 Ma'am, you want to ask something, ma'am? No, ma'am. He can go. And the where? What are the different percussion notes, ma'am? No? The percussion you have uh, put. Percussion. Yes, yeah. Percussion can be hyper resonant, resonant, or uh, dull or stony dull, ma'am. Yeah. The conditions. In uh, pneumonia, in, how it will be? In pneumonia, is there any impact pneumonia? note? No, yes. no, ma'am. It's a dull, dull note. Dull note. There is no condition with the impact note. Impact note okay. is uh, where it is dull. It is dull in a consolidation, ma'am. Dull fibrosis. in consolidation. Consolidation and fibrosis. It is dull, ma'am. Stony dull in the case of pleural. Usually, these are all the commonly asked questions. Okay, so go and read. Okay, what are the different percussion notes and what is your inference? Okay, yes, now go to the next. So we have to finish in time. Yes. So provisional diagnosis is a case of acute lower respiratory tract infection, probably pneumonia with no ear infection. Other system you have told. I haven't seen that. You finished uh, respiratory, uh, all other system normal. Okay. Yes. Yes, go to your diagnosis. Provisional diagnosis, it's a case of uh, acute lower respiratory tract infection, probably pneumonia with no ear infection. The child has been immunized up to date according to the national immunization schedule and also takes a near normal diet. The family belongs to the upper lower socioeconomic status. This is classified under pneumonia in the WHO classification. Actually, the provisional diagnosis is again looking like a summary of our conditions. Like, So you can uh, make it short like it's a case, case of acute respiratory infection. And there is no point to say this is a severe pneumonia, no? Okay. Only there is uh, fast breathing is there and retraction. Yes, so, so it is a case of ARI, pneumonia with no ear infection, uh, normal nutrition, normal development, with immunized up to the age, with no complication. Okay, okay. that will be the diagnosis. Instead of saying everything, if you yes. want, you can add the care of the scale also. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. okay, investigations? I mean, investigations, I would like to do a complete blood count, uh, pulse oximetry, a chest x-ray and uh, ultrasound uh, thorax at the point of care investigation. Blood culture and sensitivity can also be done and uh, other investigations are based upon... In what proportion of pneumonia blood culture may be positive? Uh, blood culture will be positive in... Uh, I'm not sure. I'm around 5 to 10% only, ma'am. Okay, only in 5 to 10 percent. Okay. If you are suspecting atypical pneumonia, mycoplasma pneumonia, what is the investigation you can do? We can do a serology, ma'am, and chest x-ray will show the diffuse patchy infiltrates, ma'am. Okay. And uh, the incubation period will be approximately for to, one to week. The, to definitely confirm the etiology, what is it you can do? We can do serology. Can do PCR. PCR. You can do a PCR, okay? okay. And if you are suspecting complication, what are, what are next investigation you will do? You mentioned here, ultrasound thorax. Okay. Yes, ultrasound if you are thorax. trying to look for pleural effusion or MPEMA, you will do an ultrasound thorax. What other bedside investigation you can do to confirm MPEMA? Bedside uh, investigation. Mm. Um, pleural tapping. 
yeah needle thoracocentesis is what you can do bedside to confirm okay so what are the complications to you expect in a case of pneumonia um, uh, the complications include uh, pleural effusion syndemonic effusion and then uh, empyema there, there can be a pericarditis and there can be uh, other foci the bacteria might uh, go to other foci and cause uh, polyarthritis can cause meningitis first you say respiratory failure okay respiratory pneumonia failure. can cause respiratory failure so that is the first thing you should say then you can say all this okay okay ma'am say the common things first okay after yes, saying empyema madam this res severe respiratory distress failure uh, hypoxia and the okay, pericarditis okay, so and other things uh, you can know research okay. how do you want to so treat that is this trapping case? ourselves yes how do you yes. want to treat this case Ma'am, uh, first uh, I will uh, assess the child and I'll classify. Very so, good. Based yes. on the classification, this child comes under uh, pneumonia, ma'am. So, so first, general management consists of managing hydration and uh, providing symptomatic relief from the fever. Specific treatment is uh, home treatment with oral amoxicillin, forty milligram per kg, twice daily dose for five days. I will advise the mother to give the ch child plenty of fluids. I'll explain the danger signs to the mother. and i'll ask the mother to bring the child back to the clinic for a follow up after a period of 5 days or sooner if any of the danger signs develop so very good this is for that for this case this is a, a pneumonia case so if the child is having severe pneumonia or it is also known as very severe disease it's very uh, very good you started at any case first i will assess then classify okay so okay. any disease can be classified into like the, we are saying emergency triage assessment and treatment okay so if yeah. there is any danger sign emergency treatment treat at once if there is no danger sign but this is like fever fast breathing that will become a priority there is no fast breathing there is no danger sign that will be a non urgent case so that child can be made to wait okay very good you told that uh, you assess classify then treat Okay, now say if it is going to be a severe pneumonia. If it is a okay. severe pneumonia, we have to give uh, inpatient treatment, ma'am. Now, what are the and points the to say? Support. One madam told malnutrition child should be admitted. What are the danger yes, signs in pneumonia? And the other danger signs are a cyanosis. If the child refuses Very to good. drink cyanosis. or eat, the child yes. refuses to drink or eat, yes. or the child is severely malnutrition, or the okay. child is lethargic and is not responding. so these are the very important things to say that a child is having severe pneumonia okay severe pneumonia how will you treat severe pneumonia must be managed uh, as a inpatient admit. care yes, ma'am very good yes admit I will, drug, i will start the patient on uh, iv drugs which includes uh, for all no uh, severe abc always yes, remember abc okay okay yes so, so yes ma'am oxygen yes after doing the initial airway management uh, after checking the breathing and circulation of the patient i will start the patient on uh, definitive management with uh, iv antibiotics yes. uh, which includes uh, ampicillin and uh, gentamicin ma'am yes the dose of gentamicin is uh, 7 mg per kg per day in divided doses and the dose of ampicillin is 100 mg per kg per day in divided doses i am in say guidelines uh, others can read it is given 50 mg per kg per dose six daily 7.5 mg of gentamicin oli so that should be okay. the first line drug very good you started with that so all the cases i think whether we are having uh, uh, much time Let's... no ma'am actually we have exceeded the time ma'am so okay. actually i would like to say that yeah, yeah. we have discussed more of the clinical findings and yeah, yeah, yes. symptomatology and findings rather than the uh, theoretical part so yeah, theoretical yeah. part you can always read up so ah, i yeah, would okay. just like to emphasize and uh, Uh, read rate on few things in any yes, case of pneumonia how to count the respiratory rate and what are the age appropriate rates how to classify the child as per the imncai and as per the who protocol and what other things theoretical aspects you can always discuss like what are the first line antibiotics second line antibiotics what are the supportive measures what are the specific measures what are the complications and what are the drug dosages what are the oxygen delivery devices all these things you should know these may be asked but we are not discussing all the theoretical parts because we thought we will concentrate more on the clinical part yes sir okay so i think the we are uh, we have exceeded our time isn't it more yeah. ma'am yes sir uh, uh, yes. yeah ma'am uh, 
minutes to you know want to uh, sum up you can otherwise yeah so we can sum up with the imnca so as per the imnca whenever you have a child between 2 months to 5 years so if the child comes with cough or difficult breathing first you ask what is the duration then you look and listen for counting the breath in 1 minute look for chest and drawing look and listen for strider and the child should be calm when you examine that is more important and then next slide so you should know the age appropriate rates and depending on the age appropriate rates you classify the child hariyana sudan you please move the slide so if there is going to be any general danger sign or chest and drawing or strider in a calm child that is one more danger sign which you missed out you classify it as severe pneumonia or very severe disease you give the first dose of injection now we don't use chloramphenicol we use ampicillin and refer urgently to a hospital so this is meant mainly for the peripheral uh, uh, primary health care setting then if the child is going to have just fast breathing you classify it as pneumonia you give oral antibiotic for 5 days and you give symptomatic treatment and you have to most important is you have to whenever you do a domiciliary treatment you have to advise the mother when to return immediately you have to describe about the danger signs the child is not having any tachypnea then it is just my, my uh, uri cough or cold and uh, you have to advise only uh, symptomatic treatment so this is the gist of the imnca which all primary care physicians that is a undergraduate should be thorough with and uh, i thank my uh, co examiner anandi shri ma'am professor anandi shri ma'am and i thank iapt nsc for the opportunity and uh, i thank rama ma'am for the opportunity and for the wonderful coordination of the event and uh, i appreciate our uh, students harihara sudan and jana who took active part so thank you ma'am it's uh, our turn to thank you it was uh... a fantastic discussion both by sri and anandi sri you steered it towards uh, mainly the clinical which is what is uh, lacking because of course these students have been deprived of their clinical postings for the past two years you've taken it in the right direction and you finished off with what they really have to know thank you so much uh, for nicely gelling thank with you your, your students have done a superb job really yes. they have uh, reached up to your expectations thank you very much and for keeping up to the time thank, thank you thank you thank you Thank you. Move on to the next session. Uh, the next session, ma'am. Uh, yeah, Daksh will go. Yeah, yeah ma'am. Yes, Dr. Selva Kumar is here. Welcome, Dr. Selva Kumar. Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. Yeah. So, can I share my screen? Yeah. Yeah. Welcome, Dr. Selva Kumar, sir, Professor and Head of Pediatrics at uh, Government Tanjore Medical College, uh, to deliver his talk on approach to fever. So, you have forty-five minutes for your talk. Am I audible, ma'am? Yeah, your audible visible slides are seen. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, very good afternoon to one and all. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank the organizing uh, convener and the organizing team and uh, the office bearers of IAPPNSC for uh, giving uh, me this opportunity to talk on approach to fever in this uh, intensive training uh, program for undergraduates. So, Firstly, I would like to clarify that uh, this is not a complete package on uh, fever. It's going to be uh, information which uh, which are bits and pieces of information which is frequently asked in the examination. And uh, I would like to also apologize, like uh, at the start itself, that is like I have a bad uh, throat, like and I, and if I inadvertently cough, like I apologize to start. having said that i'll move on to the presentation humanity has three great enemies fever famine and war of these by far the greatest and by far the most terrible is fever this is what sir william mosler had to say regarding fever he is considered to be the father of modern medicine what is fever fever is an elevation of 
poor body temperature that occurs during a specific biological response that is mediated and controlled by the central nervous system over a 24 hour period the temperature is variable it is highest in the late afternoon and early evening and it is uh, less in the morning hours the upper limit of normal body temperature is 37.2 degree centigrade or 98.9 degree fahrenheit in the morning the upper limit of normal body temperature is 99.9 degree fahrenheit in the afternoon late afternoon and early evening the mean amplitude variation between the highest and lowest temperature recorded is around 0.5 degree centigrade or 0.9 degree fahrenheit a rectal temperature above 100.4 that is 38 degree centigrade or axillary temperature above 99.5 degree fahrenheit or 37.5 degree centigrade is widely regarded as fever in both children and adults and the statement is based on the who as a general guideline the rectal temperature is considered the gold standard for recording the, the temperature and uh, the rectal temperature is higher than the oral temperature and the tympanic temperature which is higher than the axillary temperature each by 1 degree fahrenheit there is a great degree of variability when you record the cutaneous uh, temperature there is a forehead or the temporal artery temperature by infrared thermometry which reads the infrared heat waves released by the temporal artery in a nutshell what causes fever exogenous uh, pyrogens that is the infectious agents toxins and tumors induce the host cells the monocytes macrophages endothelial cells and other immune cells to produce endogenous pyrogens like interleukin 1 which are transmitted to the hypothalamus thermoregulatory center where they induce synthesis of prostaglandin e2 which raises the thermostat set point to initiate a febrile response in the form of vasoconstriction which causes heat conservation and involuntary muscle contraction which causes heat production which is manifested as shiver these are the sites where the temperature needs to be measured and which is recommended from birth to 2 years it is the rectal which is the definite uh, site for measuring temperature and axillary can be used for screening over 2 to 5 years it is the rectal followed by the tympanic and axillary where the temperature needs to be measured in children who are older than 5 years you can measure you can use the oral uh, like uh, site followed by the tympanic and axillary the thermometer must be placed in the rectal uh, rectally for 1 to 2 minutes and uh, in uh, probably in the axilla 4 minutes and in the oral cavity for nearly 2 to 3 minutes fever is classified based on the duration as acute subacute and chronic it's acute if it's less than 7 days subacute if it's 7 to 14 days and chronic if it's more than 14 days continuous fever this is the common question which is asked in the examination here the fever does not fluctuate more than 1 degree centigrade during a 24 hour period and the temperature does not touch the baseline that is the normal uh, values uh, this occurs like uh, commonly in uh, conditions like pneumonia and uti typhoid you have the character characteristic step ladder pattern where the fever progressively increases each day following treatment there is defervescence of fever gradually you have defervescence over a period of 4 to 7 days like for most of your most of the currently available antibiotics it uh, the temperature falls gradually by lysis this is very characteristic of typhoid typhoid in addition to being a continuous fever can also present as a remittent fever what is remittent fever temperature remains above the normal value throughout the day and uh, the temperature fluctuates by more than 1 degree centigrade and at uh, some books mention uh, nearly 2 degree centigrade 
common causes of brucellosis infective endocarditis intermittent fever fever which is present only for several hours during the day the elevated temperature touches the baseline and between if it occurs daily it is known as quotidian like which is characteristically seen in juvenile idiopathic arthritis it occurs if it occurs every other day on day 1 and 3 it is known as tertian malaria due to plasmodium ovale or vivax the fever occurs on day 1 and 4 it is uh, known as quartan fever uh, which is due to uh, like uh, plasmodium malaria periodicity is not apparent during initial infection in uh, malaria because of multiple growths emerging in the blood stream plasmodium falciparum though it causes uh, tertian uh, type of uh, intermittent fever can also cause a quotidian type of fever when there are multiple groups pellets steam fever is periodic fever characterized by 3 to 10 days of fever with subsequent afebrile periods of 3 to 10 days this is typical but rare manifestation of hodgkin's lymphoma relapsing fever recurring febrile disease caused by several species of the spirochete borrelia which is transmitted by ticks or lice here the symptoms are recurrent febrile episodes lasting for 3 to 5 days which is uh, separated by intervals of apparent recovery other common question which is asked in the examination are where do you get high grade fever with chills and or rigors the common causes are malaria uti infective endocarditis brucellosis amoeb amoebic liver abscess and any loculated collection of pus fever which is associated with night sweats the conditions are tuberculosis nocardia brucellosis liver or lung abscess infective endocarditis polyarthritis nodosa poly uh, and uh, lymphomas the fever defervescence also can be a clues if the fever normalizes suddenly it is called fall by crisis which is commonly seen in pneumonia and pneumococcal when appropriate antibiotics are used if the fever normalizes gradually as i have told you earlier it is called fall by lysis which is seen in typhoid fever the associated features of uh, fever are chills rigors myalgia headache anorexia excessive sleep fatigue thirst delirium and scanty urination the common sign signs include tachycardia the pulse rate increases 10 beats per minute for every 1 degree centigrade elevation of temperature tachypnea increase of respiratory rate by 2 to 4 breaths for every 1 degree centigrade temperature elevation there can also occur accentuation or appearance of functional murmurs or the third heart sound another question which is commonly asked is like uh, based on the day of appearance of rash associated with fever what could be the diagnosis it goes by the pneumonia very sick person must take double tablets if the rash appears on the day one of fever probably it is varicella day two it is scarlet fever day four it is measles day five it is typhus day six it is dengue and day seven it is typhoid how do you proceed to assess a fever of short duration if the fever is less than 7 days like first you will have to assess always the abc is the airway breathing and circulation if abnormal or the abc is the normal and the host is at risk the child is having risk factors like uh, the child is immunocompromised child is having asthenia if it's a neonate the child is uh, having sickle cell disease or the child is on chemotherapy or on steroids then you will have to hospitalize the child if the abc's are normal and the child is a normal host then probably you will have to search for the focus by meticulous history physical examination and lab laboratory support 
and look for clues for specific disease. If there are no clues or focus, then you will have to investigate and manage as per the age of the child. What is the clinical difference between a viral and a bacterial infection? This is a question which is commonly asked. How do you differentiate a viral fever from a, a bacterial infection causing fever? Viral fever, it has an abrupt onset. There is high fever at onset and usually subsides by day three or four. There is uh, usually some prodromal symptoms. Rash is very common. The child during the interfebrile period is normal. It affects the entire system, the upper respiratory and the lower respiratory system or multiple system. The child may have a diarrhea along with the respiratory uh, symptomatology. It, it can have seasonal variation. There's not much of localizing findings and mostly self-limiting. On the contrary, bacterial infection have an insidious onset. Starts with moderate fever, localizes uh, maybe uh, like sooner or later, if it localizes sooner, then the peak is a bit earlier, like in UTI, meningitis, or pneumonia. If the localization is later, the peak is late, like in typhoid fever, may last for more than seven days. There's not much of prodrome. Rash is less common. During the interfebrile period, when you're giving antipyretic, then the child looks sick. The symptoms are related to a specific organ. Pneumonia, the symptoms are confined to the respiratory uh, like system. There's not much of se seasonal variation, may have a systemic localization and organomegaly, and uh, usually they require antibiotics. What are the localizing features like which you look for in acute fever? It can be cough, coriza, sneeze, headache, which is part of uh, rhinitis and uh, rhinosinusitis sore throat, pharyngitis. If that, that can be cervical nodes and tonsillar and enlargement and tonsillitis. Cough, sore throat, loss of smell or taste, diarrhea and vomiting in COVID. Membrane over tonsils and expelling, which is uh, a feature of diphtheria, which is a life-threatening emergency, Ludwig's angina. Ear pain, discharge, headache, probably in acute otitis media and otitis externa. There can be rash in measles, chicken box, meningococcemia, dengue, noxial infarcture, Kawasaki, or infectious mononucleosis. There can be strider due to laryngitis, tracheitis, croup, epiglottitis, and diphtheria. There can be fast breathing, cough and chest in drawing, as uh, in, uh, it has been enumerated in the previous class, which is characteristic of pneumonia bronchiolitis and pleural effusion, vomiting, which could be uh, a symptomatology of viral gastritis, hepatitis, meningitis, enteric fever, and UPI, diarrhea, which can uh, be because of gastroenteritis and enteric fever, jaundice due to hepatitis, cholecystitis, and malaria, and chills with the uh, pallor, which may be a feature of malaria. The child can have altered sensorium, seizures, neurological deficits, meningeal signs and meningoencephalitis, cerebral malaria and brain abscess, abdominal pain, bowel disturbances in appendicitis, liver abscess, hepatitis and polycystitis, frequency, urgency, dysuria, hematuria and lower abdominal pain in UTI and cystitis, loin pain and dysuria in upper UTI, pyelonephritis, Hepatomegaly in hepatitis, splenomegaly in malaria, enteric fever, and infectious mononucleosis, hepatosplenomegaly in scrub and uh, leptospirosis, joint swelling, pain and reduced movements in septic arthritis, rheumatic fever, connective tissue disorders, skin boils, redness, pain, and abscess, pustules, cellulitis, and impetigo, conjunctival injection, injection, and mucopotaneous erythema periangual disc formation and BCG reactivation in Kawasaki disease. What are the red flag signs in acute fever? When there is a disproportionate heart rate, which may suggest there is a myocardial component to the fever. When there is a disproportionate respiratory rate, 
which may suggest there may be an underlying pneumonia. Differential body temperature, warm body for cold extremities, like which may be cold stress, and child may be going for going in for shock. Impact circulation characterized by poor capillary refill, mottled in the ashen skin. When there is obvious lower chest retraction, when there is membrane over the tonsillar fossils, purpuric spots, meningeal signs, and tense distended abdomen is suggestive of an acute abdomen or all red flag signs in acute fever. What are the investigations which we need to do in an acute febrile child? That is the CBC, like an acute fierce reactants like the ESR, CRP, urine, you need to do the microscopy and uh, dipstick, leukocyte estrays, nitrates, culture, peripheral smear for malarial parasite, blood culture, for septicemia as well as blood culture, for enteric fever, throat swab, when there is a suspicion of uh, group A beta amyloidic streptococcus causing streptococcal pharyngitis, chest x ray, if there is uh, like the features suggestive of pneumonia, LFT, NS1 antigen, IgM ELISA when you suspect dengue, RT PCR and rapid antigen test for COVID, IgM ELISA for scrub typhus and leptospirosis where indicated, and CSO analysis also if indicated. What could be the clues from CRP and leukocyte count? You have a CRP which is negative and CBC shows leukopenia, the possible diagnosis could be viral infection. If the CRP is negative and you have a leukopenia with thrombocytopenia, your diagnosis is very obvious, it is dengue. If you have a high CRP and uh, CBC is, uh, shows uh, leukocytosis, probably it can be any infection like uh, UTI, pneumonia, meningitis, Kawasaki, or multi-system inflammatory syndrome which is a complication of COVID. If the CRP is high, but the CBC shows like a, a total count which is low or normal, probably it can suggest it's entry fever. Modified Centaur score, MEC-ISAC or streptococcal pharyngitis is a bedside tool to gauge the risk of streptococcal pharyngitis. This is a common question asked in rheumatic fever. How do you know it's a streptococcal pharyngitis? It is used in patients with recent onset, less three or less days, like with acute pharyngitis. And uh, it has a scoring of uh, like uh, one point for fever, one for tonsillar exudate. If there is cough is absent, one. Anterior cervical lymphadenopathy, one point. If the age is between 3 to 14 years, one point. If the age is between 15 to 44, it is zero, and above 44, it is minus one. If the total score is one or less, then the child is having a lower risk for streptococcal pharyngitis. So you need not uh, investigate the child. If the score is between two to three, like the child is having a moderate risk, where you have to uh, rule out streptococcal pharyngitis by appropriate investigation and start treatment with the results based on the results. If the score is more than three, the child is at high risk where you can send uh, like the investigation and start treatment empirically. Why we should start treatment earlier is streptococcal sore throat will result in uh, rheumatic fever in 3% of the children who suffer from streptococcal sore throat. And if you are going to start appropriate antibiotics before nine days, like, you will be, be able to prevent uh, rheumatic fever by starting appropriate uh, treatment before nine days of onset of streptococcal pharyngitis. UTI is an important cause of fever without a focus, especially in children who are less than two years more so in girls. In neonates, it is part of septicemia and they may present with fever, vomiting, lethargy, jaundice and seizures. In infants and young children, they present with recurrent fever, diarrhea, vomiting, 
abdominal pain and poor weight gain older children the classical features like fever dysuria urgency frequency hesitancy abdominal or flank pain will be there in adolescent fever may not be there and symptomatology may confine to the genital urinary system what are the investigations which you do for a child with uti it is a microscopy and we say there is significant uh, biuria this is a question which will be asked like uh, in nephrotic syndrome like what are the infections you rule out one is latent tuberculosis and other is uti and how do you like uh, investigate you just uh, look uh, like for significant biuria it's more than 10 leukocytes per cubic millimeter in a fresh uncentrifuged sample or if there are more than 5 leukocytes per high power field in a centrifuged sample then you can consider the child may have a urinary tract infection you can also do a rapid uh, dipstick uh, test with uh, where uh, leukocyte estrays positivity or there is conversion of nitrates to nitrites by e coli klebsiella and protease can convert nitrate to nitrites uh, which may give a clue like uh, they can be screening tests and the gold standard is urine culture and sensitivity like, and uh, where midstream clean catch should have a colony count of more than 10 to the power of 5 per ml that is 1 lakh if there is uh, if you are collecting the urine by urethral catheterization more than 5 into 10 to the power of 4 colony forming units per ml and if you are collecting the urine by suprapubic aspiration, any number of pathogens are like even a single pathogen is significant. How do you evaluate a, a child with initial febrile UTI? If the child is less than one year, you do an ultrasound, mix uh, to rule out structural anomalies, MCU, and the DMSA scan. If the child is age is between one to five years, you do an ultrasound DMSA scan. MCU, if ultrasound or DMSA scan is abnormal because it MCU is an invasive procedure. The child's age is more than five years. You do an ultrasound. If ultrasound is abnormal, then you do a MCU and DMSA scan. Malaria needs to be uh, like uh, investigated by microscopy. That is what we do commonly. Uh, you do a thick smear and a thin smear, which is a uh, question frequently asked. What, why do you do a thick smear? It is for detecting the presence of malarial parasite to diagnose. You do a thin smear to identify malarial species, like what are the species which is causing uh, malaria, quantify the parasitemia, the percentage of RPCs which have been infected by the malarial parasites, and, uh, and to uh, the, find out the various uh, parasitic forms like cytosines or gametocytes, which can be uh, done uh, by, uh, which can be seen only by the thin smear. The staining is by Romanowski stain, namely uh, GMSA or Leishman. There are rapid diagnostic tests, which are immunochromatographic tests, and the antigens which are targeted in these rapid diagnostic tests is listed in rich protein uh, 2 or parasite lactate dehydrogenase. The recommended treatment of uncomplicated plasmodium vivax malaria is chloroquine, 10 milligram per uh, 10 milligram base per kg, strat orally, followed by 5 milligram per kg at uh, 6 gas or chloroquine uh, total doses 25 milligram uh, per kg, or you can give chloroquine 10, milli, uh, 10 milligram per uh, milligram base per kg, strat orally, followed by 10 milligram at 24 hours and 5 milligram per kg at 48 hours. Promacman should be given in a dose of 0.25 milligram per kg once daily for 14 days to prevent relapse. Promacman is not used in uh, infancy where uh, there can be rela relative uh, uh, deficiency of G6PD and uh, like it causes hemoly hemolysis in G6PD uh, deficient individuals. The treatment, recommended treatment for plasmodium falciparum malaria is artesanate plus sulfadoxin pyrimethamine or artesanate and mefloquine. Artesanate, sulfadoxin pyrimethamine is uh, the drug of choice. Artemether plus lumifantin is used in uh, Northeast where there is a resistance to sulfadoxin and pyrimethamine. We don't use it. Like we use artesanate with sulfadoxin pyrimethamine. 
Rumac one should be given as a single dose of 0.25 milligram per kg for its gametocidal action. Where uh, that is, uh, the child is suffering from complicated uh, Plasmodium falciparum malaria, that is cerebral malaria, artesanate is the double choice. Alternate drugs are artemether or quinine. Dengue, like you consider dengue, if a child lives and travels to a dengue endemic, uh, dengue endemic area, fever, along with two of these following criteria, nausea, vomiting, rash, aches and pains, tourniquet test is positive, leukopenia, any warning signs are there. You need to confirm laboratorily. It's very important, especially when there are no signs of plasma leakage. Another common question which will be asked, uh, what are the warning signs in dengue, like which occurs usually be day three to seven uh, after onset of fever, they are, the seven signs are abdominal pain or tenderness, persistent vomiting, clinical fluid accumulation, mucosal bleed, lethargy, restlessness, liver enlargement. And laboratorily, there will be an increase in hem hematocrit with a rapid decrease in platelet count. Severe dengue, there will be severe plasma leakage, like where the patient can present with uh, pleural effusion and ascites massive or hypotension. They can also have uh, severe hemorrhage, like uh, as uh, seen by the clinician, or severe organ involvement, like, uh, where there can be autox sensorium or uh, values of uh, the lower uh, ALT or AST more than 1000 can suggest the severe dengue it is diagnosed by non structured antigen like uh, protein like NS1 antigen ELISA during the early febrile period in the first five days. Followed later, you can do an IgM like IgM ELISA. COVID 19, like in this pandemic, like any child who has fever, cough, rhinorrhea, sore throat, or throat irritation, malaise, weakness as the diarrhea, anorexia, nausea, vomiting, loss of sense of smell and taste, you need to suspect uh, COVID-19. The investigations are RT-PCR and rapid antigen test for SARS-CoV-2. Kawasaki disease, like uh, any fever which persists for more than uh, five days because of an uh, un, uh, which is still not explained, unexplained, but four of the following five features, are bilateral conjunctival condition, changes of the lips, that is cracked lips, and uh, oral cavity, which is erythematous, and the strawberry tongue, or polymorphous exanthema, changes of the peripheral extremities during the acute phase, you can have erythema or edema of the hands and feet. And uh, in convalescent, you can have uh, periangual desquamation, Acute non purulent cervical lymphadenopathy. If uh, four of these features are there with fever lasting for more than five days, you can suspect Kawasaki disease. Scrub typhus is another common uh, cause of fever, usually with thrombocytopenia, which we frequently encounter of late. It is an acute febrile illness with macular papula or erythematous rash. Usually, uh, like you find them nearly 50 to 60 percent, and Eshkar, a blackish necrotic uh, a lesion, link, which is uh, seen in the picture, along with hepatosplenomegaly, lymphadenopathy, thrombocytopenia, but features suggestive of capillary leak. Then you should suspect scrub typhus. The investigations are IgM ELISA, Wheel Felix, or PCR. Link and which is eminently treatable by oral doxycycline or acetromycin. Typhoid fever, there is high fever which rises in a step-like fashion, headache, nausea, loss of appetite, cough. In children, diarrhea is more common than constipation. In adults, constipation is more common. An example, rose spots in the anterior trunk will be there. There is a relative bradycardia at the height of fever. The investigation goes by the mnemonic basu. The first week it is blood, clot culture or bone malar culture rarely. The second week you do the agglutination test, vital. 
third week is the stool culture the fourth week it's going to be the urine culture agglutinins like uh, that is the antibodies appear in typhoid in the blood by the end of first week so these o agglutinins like which we test in uh, the vidal rises rapidly four fold in 10 to 15 days they persist for month and disappear in a year h agglutinins that is the uh, flagella uh, which is against the flagella uh, antigens they like, uh, rise slowly and persist for years o agglutinins that the o antibodies is important in recent infection this is uh, this uh, frequently asked in the examination and the h agglutinins indicate past infection and it can also be elevated in immunization the diagnostic levels are more than uh, 1 in 160 or a rising tight or four fold or greater if two samples are taken 7 to 10 days apart the treatment of typhoid in un uncomplicated cases if uh, it is sensitive like uh, typhoid fever is sensitive to drugs the drug of choice is cefixim the other drugs which may be used is chloramphenicol amoxicillin and uh, yocotrimoxazole chloramphenicol is not preferred because there is a, a fear of idiosyncratic bone marrow suppression when there is multi uh, ch child is having a multi drug resistant typhoid multi drug resistant typhoid means the typhoid which is resistant to chloramphenicol amoxicillin and chloramoxazole there the drug of choice is cefixim and the our uh, second line uh, second line drug will be a cytromycin in complicated uh, typhoid fever where the rgi or uh, the child is quite toxic or uh, other complications of typhoid fever the drug of choice will be third generation cefalosporin is a ceftriaxone or cefetoxin and other drugs which can be used are uh, parenteral chloramphenicol or ampicillin the if it is a multi drug resistant complicated typhoid fever then the drug of choice are third generation cefalosporin and astrium the common infectious causes of fever between 1 to 2 weeks are common seasonal infection enteric fever leptospirosis and strep typhus other systemic infections which can be partially treated or complicated pneumonia uti meningitis less common infections like tb brucellosis osteomyelitis occult abscesses infective endocarditis it can be because of viral causes like epstein barr virus which causes infectious mononucleosis parasitic malaria fungus needs to be considered only in a child who is on chemotherapy or impaired immunity or on central venous uh, axis or a child who is on total parental nutrition the non infectious causes of fever between 1 to 2 weeks are neoplasm leukemia immune mediated disorders like acute rheumatic fever sle systemic onset juvenile idiopathic arthritis which are which are all quite rare in compared with kawasaki disease like which uh, has again uh, become quite common following the covid infections hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis hlh what are inflammatory disorders like your cough cough hypersensitive disorder uh, sensitive diseases like your hypersensitivity pneumonia anomonitis drug fever and and hydrotic ectodermal dysplasia you consider soje that is cystic onset juvenile idiopathic arthritis if a child has fever of at least 2 weeks duration daily for at least 3 days an arthritis in one or more joints and at least one of the following four uh, criteria that is uh, erythematous rash evanescent rash generalized lymph node enlargement hepato or splenomegaly and or splenomegaly serocytosis infectious mononucleosis is uh, other disease like where which will be discussed in the differential diagnosis of many a condition like a fever with splenomegaly where the child presents with fever fatigue sore throat rashes tonsillar pharyngitis hepatosplenomegaly and lymphadenopathy here the child develops a generalized itchy maculopapular rash when it is treated with ampicillin or amoxicillin 
The investigations usually show peripheral smear shows leukocytosis, absolute lymphocytosis, and atypical lymphocytes, where you can see the nucleus is indented and uh, the lymphocytes are quite large when compared to the normal lymphocytes, and the nucleus is placed eccentrically. The other tests which are done are Paul Bernal antibody tests and specific uh, uh, like the anti antibody tests for Epstein Barr virus infection. Carl Azar should be suspected if the child comes from an endemic area that is uh, Orissa, Bihar, Jharkhand, and uh, like parts of West Bengal. Here, usually, like you consider Karazar when the fever lasts for more than two weeks with uh, splenomegaly and there is weight loss. They have had the splenomegaly and appetite is uh, supposed to be normal or uh, voracious appetite is a feature of Karazar, may not be true. The lab diagnosis uh, consists of rapid diagnostic test, direct agglutination test, and parasitological tests like by which can be uh, to de uh, demonstrate LD bodies by bone marrow aspiration or lymph node aspiration or splenic aspiration. Tuberculosis went to suspect when there is persistent fever more than two weeks without a known cause and or unremitting cough for more than two weeks and or weight loss of 5% or there is no weight gain in the past three months despite adequate nutrition or failure of nutritional rehabilitation in a SAM child, there you need to suspect tuberculosis with or without contact with a patient with pulmonary tuberculosis in the past two years. The points which may, uh, wave, uh, which may favor your diagnosis of tuberculosis when, uh, like, uh, you, are, when you discuss uh, like, uh, fever with uh, abidospinomegaly, are weight loss, anorexia, night sweats, cough, lymphadenopathy, enlarged liver and or spleen with a family history of tuberculosis. Childhood malignancies, the points which favor a diagnosis of childhood malignancies are weight loss, anemia, bleeding manifestations, lymphadenopathy, enlarged liver or spleen, mass or lump in the body. The symptomatic management of fevers, the non-pharmacological measures are like you need to take rest like, uh, and uh, increase of fluids because uh, child tends to be dehydrated during fever. And temperate sponging, you can use lukewarm water, the temperature of 28 uh, to 30 degrees centigrade. You don't use ice cold water or ice or uh, hot water. And uh, temperate sponging uh, may be useful like, uh, after medications. If you are going to use it before medication, then you may induce shivering, which may actually increase uh, the temperature. And what are the drugs used to treat uh, fever that is not to treat fever? Like basically, to reduce the discomfort associated with fever are form, uh, paracetamol 50 mg per kg per dose, 4 to 6 hourly, not more than 5 doses, ibuprofen 10 mg per kg per dose every 8 hourly, or the two common. Uh, drugs which are utilized for bringing about a reduction in fever. And you should uh, remember the fact throughout your life that fever is just a symptom, not a disease. And antibiotics are used to reduce discomfort. Fever of unknown origin, presence of uh, daily or near daily fever, temperature of 38. 0.3 degree centigrade or 101 degree Fahrenheit for at least eight days in a single illness in a patient for whom a careful history, thorough physical examination and preliminary laboratory data has failed to reveal a probable cause, then you will label the patient as fever of unknown origin. Uh, it is eight days, like unlike adults where uh, the cutoff is three weeks. The causes are usually the infections which I have mentioned, rheumatological and malignancy. So, like when a when a case of fever with splenomegaly is given to you the examination, like when you are going to discuss like what could be the cause of fever with splenomegaly, these are the common causes like, uh, which you need to mention. The viral causes are like Epstein-Barr virus. Uh, 
causing infectious mononucleosis, cytomegalovirus, HIV. Bacterial causes could be sepsis, uh, typhoid, scrub typhus, tuberculosis, and uh, bacterial endocarditis. Parasitic, malaria, leishmaniasis when the child has come from a particular region like where it's gone. Toxoplasmosis is very uh, rare when there is exposure to pets. Neoplastic that is leukemia, lymphomas, and very rarely inflammatory, which, are, which could be systemic lupus and chromatosis. Fever with hepatitis splenomegaly, the differential could be enteric fever, infectious mononucleosis, malaria, infective hepatitis, leukemia, lymphoma, collagen diseases like SLE or uh, SOGIA, that is. Uh, Juvenile idiopathic arthritis, systemic onset, infective endocarditis, brucellosis. This could be uh, the differential diagnosis which you need to offer. Fever with hepatitis splenomegaly with lymphadenopathy. It, it is uh, like the differential diagnosis uh, will come down to like, infectious mononucleosis, disseminated tuberculosis, leukemia, lymphomas. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. In a very short span of 45 minutes, I mean, you've taken time lesser than that. Uh, you've uh, very beautifully brought up all the essential components needed for the theory exams as well as the practical exams for UGs. Whatever be the long case or the short case, definitely they'll be encountered uh, with uh, questions based on fever. And you have very comprehensively and coherently brought out everything, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you so much, sir. The last session for uh, this day and the UG clinical teaching program would be based on instruments by Dr. J. Balaji, Associate Professor of Pediatrics at Government Dharmapuri Medical College. Over to Dr. J. Balaji, sir. Good morning to one and all. Good morning. Sir. My slides are visible. Yes, sir. Your screen is visible. Your slides are visible. And your audible. Audible, sir. madam? Yes, sir. Okay, madam. Thank you, madam. You thank you. Thank you. thank you. Thank you so much. Very good afternoon to one and all. Uh, first of all, I thank uh, our IAP, Abhis <coughs> Perez, Dr. Ramesh Professor, Dr. Rajendran, sir, and Dr. Gopal, sir. And uh, the convener, this program convener, Dr. Rema, Professor Dr. Rema, madam, for giving me this uh, nice opportunity. A particular session is the topic is uh, instruments. Actually, for undergraduate clinics, instruments is one of the session will be hospital in offline session. Um, they are inspect up uh, an exam part apart from exam part. Nowadays, uh, because of this COVID and Google and YouTube, even common public knows about uh, more about our instruments. They are frequently speak, uh, talking about oxygen, HFMC, and CPAP, etc. More than that. And uh, even after finishing your uh, final year, when you enter as an internship, as a SCRRA at a ward, if you are at the rounds, some sick cases become sick, assistants will call you or tell that, please bring that instrument. If you don't know in that situation, you will be a little bit confused or you go for upward girls and everything. At that time, usually sharpness will have a smile, smile laugh, and looking at the intention that they don't know. So this is a very common scenario we are seeing routinely in our work. So to avoid this, I, apart from the exam, I will try to cover the maximum possible instruments in day-to-day -day practice, which a, a budding doctor should know. We'll go one by one. 
first of all is the thermometer you all know that it is a very basic uh, instrument but nowadays there are lot of uh, digital thermometers are available everywhere everybody in it is everybody every place is available everybody is having but the routine thermometer there are two types of thermometer one is the oral or axillary thermometer and another is the rectal thermometer and the routine thermometer you all know that it is usually looks like in this picture uh, it is a have a slide that is a uh, end is uh, slightly smaller than the uh, body but whereas if in a rectal thermometer if you have to look at the end there is a stout and blunt bulb is there this is way out to differentiate the rectal thermometer from the routine thermometer rectal thermometer is usually used in the severe frothing and the malnutrition cases in all other situations a routine thermometer is useful you can measure the thermometer either through oral or axillary or up the axillary region to measure the a temperature you should put the thermometer at least 1 minute in the oral cavity or at least uh, in the axilla you should put at least 3 minutes before taking temperature you should clear the clean the axilla of the patient and you put the th thermometer at the home pit and should be leave alone for at least 3 minutes then the beep sound will come then you can read the uh, what's exact temperature The usual all the thermometer have the temp temperature range from 95 to 120 degree Fahrenheit, whereas our normal body temperature is 97.7 to 99.5. So, what are the uses of the thermometer? You all know that it should measure the temperature wherever there is a fever, a child present with severe infections, or any tetanus, sunstroke, fountain hemorrhage, or uh, as in the previous speaker mentioned, there are a lot of cause of fever. In all these situations, thermometer is useful. So in sometimes uh, newborn babies are uh, put under the phototherapy and they are warmer. So if the babies become over it in that situation also you can use the thermometer. Apart from rising temperature, there are some situations where the temperature will go down. Like that's called hypothermia. Mainly in newborns, in premature newborns, hypothermia will kill the babies. In that situation also, temperature thermometer is very much useful. And other situation like infants with septicemia and again babies are warmer in phototherapy. and uh, all uh, severely small nurse children in this situations this uh, babies may go for hypothermia or even use the thermometer but whenever you are using the thermometer after using it you should be washed with <coughs> sterile water and stored in a jar filled with what chemical disinfectant like alcohol 70% alcohol to make it sterile this is another common thing you all know that it is a tongue depressor And there are two types. It is one is a disposable plastic spatula, another is the L-type uh, tongue depressor. It is mainly useful to examine the pharynx, oral cavity, and tonsils. And on your uh, clinical examination, be useful to examine the gag reflex and to examine the movements of the palate and uvula. In tetanus, the spatula test that is a test to perform uh, to look for the spasm of the masseter muscles in the cases of tetanus by trying to insert the tongue depressor in between the teeth. This is also another. A clinical indication where you can get treatment with this. You all know that a BP apparatus is useful. It is otherwise called sphygmo manometer to measure the BP. But in pediatric children, the cup size should be appropriate. Otherwise, in smaller cup, BP will be higher. The larger cup, BP will show be recorded as a low. So the cup, there are various size of cups are available uh, in our every hospital. So you choose the appropriate size of the cup to measure the exact BP. If you uh, take the bite of the cup, at least it cover the seventy percent of the distance between the acromion and the ulicaria in the our form. The cup bladder at least should encircle eighty to hundred percent of the arm circumference. This is the ideal cup size. So you choose and according to which child you are going to measure the BP. So usually in new uh, newborn, it is less than sixty is uh, uh, called is hypotension. Up to one year it is seventy. One to ten year, seventy plus age into two. More than ten years, ninety. The oh, and the below ninety is a normal value. Less than ninety, we consider as a hypertension. It is the common another mission. Everybody knows that it is measuring the capillary blood glucose. It is mainly used by type two diabetes patients in very elderly people. But it is in pediatric uh, department in newborns to look for hypoglycemia. And all critically ill children, the child brought with seizures, child brought with hypo uh, at a coma stage, uh, unconscious, 
those situations, this machine is very much helpful. And nowadays, we have come across a lot of type 1 diabetes mellitus patient also. In that scenario also, measuring the blood sugar with a simple uh, technique is very much useful. So, in well nourished child, less sugar less than 45 is considered as hypoglycemia. In, uh, in severe PM child, less than 54 is considered as hypoglycemia. In newborn, less than 40 is considered as hypoglycemia. In that situation, Unless you have to treat with the uh, newborn 10% exhaust or an elder child can go for 20% exhaust, 2 ml per kg to correct the hypoglycemia. It is very much important uh, instrument where correction of hypoglycemia is life saving. You all know that uh, our, even common public know uh, in the COVID scenario, what are you speaking about the oximeter and everything? This is a uh, hospital based pulse oximeter. So, uh, where it is more gives accurate results than the finger pulse oximeter, it is a non invasive device. Mainly, it is useful to know the oxygen level in the blood. It is mainly work based upon the principles of spectrophotometry. There is a LED, light emitting diodes present in this uh, instrument, which will transmit the light to the tissues through the tissues to the opposite side, which will pick up the exact level of uh, arterial oxygen level in the blood. So, any patient having oxygen saturation, it should be normal values at least 92 to 94%. Any child having less than 92%, these patients are in under hypoxia, where those children should be treated with oxygen. This is very valuable to in day to day practice. So, we are identifying that um, the child is having hypoxia or the child is having some distress, then you should know how to treat. So, this is another instrument kept at in every NACO or SNCO in every hospital. It is called oxygen food. It is mainly useful to deliver the oxygen in all newborn split and babies, term babies. It will deliver the humidified oxygen in all the situations where there is baby health, hypoxia, or respiratory distress. It is uh, where the flow in record is more than 8 to 10 liters. It delivers the flow of more than 90%. It is uh, another system, is, it's a low flow system. It is uh, called nasal cannula or nasal oxygen catheter. It is uh, whenever the child present with uh, hypoxia or respiratory distress, this is, uh, will be connected to the oxygen flow meter to deliver the oxygen to the child. These uh, two uh, cannulas are fit in the nozzles of the child and it will deliver the oxygen to the child. Here, usually, we will set the flow rate of 1 to 4 liters, where it will deliver a free of less than 40%, where the specialists are in mild hypoxia, this is useful. This is another way of delivering oxygen, it's called face mask. Here, the flow range should be 5 to 8 liters, which will deliver a out of 40 to 60 percent. So, in nasal cannula, the patient can talk and take feeding. Here, it will interfere with the feeding, but the proper feeding is secured. So, if, if you ask any uh, mild hypoxia, if you are having either cannula or face mask, it will be helpful to give the oxygen to the children. But uh, when the child is severe hypoxic, where there is more FEO is needed, so you have to go for the eye flow system. It is called non-rebreathing mask, where uh, there is CO retention is not possible here. And uh, in this particular reservoir bag, oxygen get accumulated so that there is uh, more FIO2, around 95% FIO2 can be delivered to the patient. But uh, the flow range should be 10 to 10 liter. That's why it's called eye flow system. So it is a non-rebreathing mask, which will be any, for even it is so many, uh, in COVID scenario, it was quite useful in many patients. This is another common thing usually kept in the hospital. It's called Jackson Riss or modified vein circuit. It's also useful in severe hypoxic situation to deliver the oxygen. Here, 100% oxygen will be delivered along with CPAP, continuous pascular pressure, will be delivered through this instrument, which will uh, save the patient from the uh, collapse of the alveoli when there is severe respiratory distress. So, Whatever SOPA discussed is the oxygen delivery devices when the patient has some respiratory distress or hypoxia. But when the patient brought with the respiratory RS, so there is the emergency, this is the main thing as a doctor, you have to save the patient. To save this patient, you have to go for CPR. What is CPR? Cardiopulmonary resuscitation. You have to give the chest compression and also you have to give the respiration. What, how you have to give oxygen respiration? This the instrument is useful. You all know that it's called self inflating ambu bag. So, you should know what are the parts of the ambu bag. So, this is the patient outlet to which the mask is attached. It is a, here, there is a one-way valve is available. It is where oxygen goes this side only. It cannot back come back. It is a pressure relief valve. 
excessive pressure will come out here so the barotrauma can be avoided this is the amic bag there are various sizes will be available this small child this is small bag from 500 ml to 150 ml for this elder child or elder patient can go up to 2 liters bag this is the oxygen inlet where oxygen will be connected this is the air inlet either air will be go through bag or you can connect the oxygen reservoir if you attach the oxygen reservoir you can increase the fio2 from 40% to up to 90% you can attach so mainly it is useful in any uh, emergency situation the child got the cardiac arrest to for resuscitation of the patient and giving the positive pressure ventilation how it works so when in the resting stage usually the ambu bag is filled with air if there is the, as usual in the if the oxygen is connected through this tube through the oxygen oxygen will be filled with the ambu bag when the patient is apneic or there is no respiration you should keep the mask over the patient's nose and mouth and you have to give the positive pressure to the cow squeezing this bag and squeezing this bag there is the one way wall which is available here you give the either air or oxygen to the mask to the patient which will inflate the patient's lung and releasing the pressure this bag gets gets reinfected by either air or through oxygen what which will attach here if you attach it to oxygen this bag again filled with the oxygen which will again your squeezing or compressing the bag the oxygen will be delivered to the patient so the patient's exhaled air cannot come back reenter to the bag because of the only wall mechanism and whenever you are using the bag and mask there are three things are important you should use the appropriate size of the mask and you see that your oxygen is connected to the oxygen inlet and the oxygen reservoir is connected because uh, you are being ambivalent in a very severe very bad shape the where the patient is brought with very bad shape here oxygen is very much necessary with i by uh, fio is needed so oxygen reservoir should be connected so i have already mentioned this oxygen reservoir it is usually connected in the to increase the fio2 of the amp in the amp bag is very much useful it will increase the oxygen concentration from 40% to 90% as already mentioned, mentioned these are the face masks which are uh, useful for the protein resuscitation which will attach to the amp bag here you should choose the appropriate size of the mask according to the patient's age and weight the ideal mask should cover the nose and mouth properly it should not be if it is a bigger size or a lesser size there will be leak then in that situation the resuscitation will be not helpful and save the patient so the appropriate size mask which will cover the nose and mouth from the uh, tip of the chin up to the uh, border of eye is correct size it should not cover the eyes and also should not come beyond the mouth so that is a proper size mask you should use while during ambulatory bag resuscitation so when the patient brought with hypoxia you are going to do bag and mask ventilation initially the patient doesn't develop spontaneous resuscitation immediately then you have to go for the intubation to save the patient for intubation you need the instrument called laryngoscope there are two types of laryngoscope there is a one is a straight blade another is a curved blade so usually in a small child so straight blade less than it is very much quite helpful because our larynx is anteriorly placed in small children whereas in older children adults adults this curved blade is very much helpful to visualize the larynx so there are various sizes of blade Full term babies, say zero size blood is helpful. When term minus one, up to ten years, two size and more than ten years, three size blood is quite helpful to intubate the patient. So it is a neonatal endoscope or a air up useful in the newborn as well as the infants to intubate the child. So it is main useful is any child brought with uh, arrest, respiratory arrest for resuscitation. Newborns mainly birth asphyxia, pneumonia aspiration, prematurity, precocious fistula. these are the some indications where you are going to intubate the patient in newborn in older children along with the resuscitation in general anesthesia as is also in doing surgical procedure for induction for giving general anesthesia is also very much useful in sometimes the patient may brought with foreign body aspiration in that situation direct laryngoscopy may helpful to look for any foreign body was present there you all know that this endotracheal tube it is the uncuffed tube this is a cuffed tube this will be useful in the elder child The smaller baby, we uncover this is enough helpful. Uh, after looking with using the laryngoscope, after usually using the larynx, this tube from through from through oral cavity, it is inserted in the trachea. It is uh, placed in the trachea, and uh, along with uh, uh, using the amber bag, you are going to continue the bag and tube ventilation. We are giving artificial ventilation to save the patient. So the main aim is for any case came with cardiac respiratory arrest, 
to give the artificial ventilation or doing intermittent fossil pressure ventilation this ct kit are useful these are various sizes were available according to the age you have to choose uh, according to the age criteria usually age formula is age by 4 plus 4 for the uncoupled is the formula using to choose the appropriate size of the tube and another thing it will give suction at the in trachea sometimes in open aspiration situation in diphtheria in angioneuritic pedema in tetanus these are the some indications where you can use the tube apart from the resuscitation places so while you are dealing with uh, putting the endotracheal tube in the larynx you are going to simulate the posterior pharyngeal wall which will lead to coughing hypoxia bradycardia that should keep in mind while you do the case because if you don't listen here the patient may go for arrest so but uh, when uh, there is a, when the child is not at respiratory arrest brought with a severe respiratory distress because of the wheezing so you all know that wheezing may cause in bronchial asthma situation where uh, bronchial dilators are very much helpful and the patient brought with a severe uh, breathing difficulty the bilateral wheeze so our uh, nebulizer is a life saving it is a nebulizer chamber you are going to fill the solbutamol ipropropyl bromide or cirrus like budisonate so using this nebulizer machine you are going to give the nebulizer which will be helpful to save the, uh, to decrease the distress in many children so it is called a meter dose inhaler also this is useful in situations like acute severe asthma and also it can uh, useful for prevention of the repeat attacks of asthma here uh, this meter dose inhaler will be kept at the patient's mouth and pressing the uh, this apparent for the drug will be delivered in the oral cavity during that period a patient should inhale the drug to go to the respiratory tract here uh, for activation of the machine and inspiration there is a coordination is very much needed to overcome this so the spaces are uh, prepared here the inhaler will be attached in one side of the <laughs> spacer and another side of spacer will be kept at the patient's mouth after pressing the inhaler the drugs will be collected in the spacer and asking the patient to inhale and keep breath for 10 seconds the drugs will be go inside the lungs directly so here uh, the disadvantage of meter dose inhaler it means uh, coordination between the inspiration and activation this is not necessary and uh, the drugs accumulating in the oral cavity is uh, avoided here so that's why the efficacy or efficiency of the uh, yeah, meter dose inhaler is very much improved by using these patients in children and adults also this is another uh, mode called dry powder inhaler or rot inhaler i and here and the power, the capsules will be kept in this area and the crests and the drugs will be accumulated here on inspiration the drugs will go to the respiratory tract here also coordination is not necessary and but is useful in uh, older child above 5 years of age where the child brought with uh, respiratory distress due to asthma and nebulizer is also useful in some situation like bronchiolitis and croup acute laryngotracheal bronchitis where uh, nebulization using adrenaline is helpful using the nebulizer now coming to another treatment for so you all know that it is a syringe or needle it is mainly know that you are going to deliver the drugs either subcutaneous or intramuscular or intravenous according to the clinical scenario and it is for therapeutic purpose for diagnostic purpose we can take the blood samples for any initiation in child drug any patient from the group it is the intramuscular needle where it is a little bit short and where the intravenous is a little bit longer and and the size of the needle is also a little bit uh, thicker so <clears throat> but whenever you are using this uh, needle syringe you should use aseptic technique and you should not see that you should not get injured also so but we are going to drink some drugs or fluids through intravenous for some more time you can use this scalpine needle so it is mainly used for vein puncture it is used for collection of blood as well as infusion of the iv fluids drugs blood etc so you all call this as vein fan but it is not a vein fan it's a trade name it is a intravenous cannula so it is our various sizes are available from this for the new bonds spiritum term by this it is 26 gauge it is 24 gauge it is 22 gauge according to the size the color also changes you can use for the giving the infusion for iv fluids drugs and collection of blood everything so it is quite useful when the patient needs drugs for some more time this uh, you can put the uh, iv cannula at the peripheral veins and uh, shake it with uh, our plaster and we can give the drugs for some more days so it is the intravenous bottle containing drug you already placed the intravenous cannula so you have to 
in the due to fluids you are using intravenous set iv set you all know that but there are two types of set one is adult set where the hole is bigger it is the pediatric iv set where the needle is here here one ml contains 20 drops whereas here one ml when you want to deliver the one ml 60 drops is needed you usually obviously to give the fluids in small children if you give more fluid there may be fluid overload to overcome this problem we are having two types of iv set so it is a pediatric iv set this is adult iv set it's also useful for the giving the fluids and drugs sometimes for total parental nutrition also so as already mentioned but while you are giving iv at your setup you should be cautious that so that should not be bulge there if it is uh, extra vision of the drugs or fluids may cause thrombocolitis at the local area which may cause swelling and painful for the child sometimes if it is uh, any contamination the child may develop rigors following iv infusion so because of some allergy and whenever you are giving iv fluids or iv drugs you should that air, uh, whatever the air present in the tubing should be let out so to avoid the complications of air embolism so it is also looks like iv set but it's a, it's a blood transmission set it is useful mainly to deliver the blood and blood products here there is a chamber called a marquis chamber which is helpful to filter the uh, or remove the any clots from the transfused blood so it is a advantage here but uh, in children putting the iv uh, means uh, securing the iv line is very difficult the child may be chubby a child may be that may be small thin vein so sometimes uh, yes, yes baby may need iv fluids iv drugs sometimes inotropes so but there is maybe one vein in that situation this three way current is very useful where you can give this way one drug and this way one drug so so this is the main advantage so in newborns sometimes the neonatal jaundice the bilirubin level is exceeding more than 20 or the child may present with kernic trust in the situation you have to go for extent transfusion in that situation also it's useful and in adults during dialysis it is useful and sometimes rarely and fluoral and acetic tap also it's used where to avoid the air and air to enter into the fluid cavity it is uh, called vaccination syringe or ad syringe where only 0.5 ml uh, amount of drugs can be done because all of the vaccines the dose is 0.5 ml intramuscularly it is always called tuberculin syringe where it is a tuber uh, bcg is given at the left uh, deltoid 0.1 ml that's why is called bd syringe or tuberculin syringe it's mainly used to, uh, useful to administer bcg vaccine as well as sometimes to administer to look for the manto test to diagnose the any primary complex or tuberculosis in children sometimes uh, you can use this syringe you can do the test dose because most of the drugs cause allergic reactions before giving iv drug we using this syringe you can do for the test dose and uh, sometimes it may be useful for in a small dose of drugs in small babies like a newborn uh, 1 kg 1.5 kg small dose of drugs should be given for the small babies in that situation also this syringe is useful this is insulin syringe you all know that there may be either 40 units in one ml or 100 units in one ml so it is mainly useful to give insulin subcutaneously and when there is a bcg syringe is not available it can be used for to, uh, to give bcg vaccine as well as to do mantle test it is also another uh, common uh, material placed in born is called feeding tube or infant feeding tube so you have to how to put it you have to measure from the nose to uh, ear lobe from ear lobe to the you have to measure the epigastric region this is the length of the uh, distance from the oral cavity to the stomach after measuring this length you have to insert this tube up to this mark and you have to fix it so it is mainly useful whenever the child was delivered there is mechanic aspiration to whatever the contents in the stomach may be was uh, using this tube can go for stomach wash and uh, many time newborn babies may not take the feeding directly so in this situation you have to start from the tube feed then you have to give the express breast feed then only the baby will directly suck the milk so giving natural gas feed is also this much helpful so whenever there is hematemesis for management of hematemesis and uh, when the child present with intestinal obstruction with abdominal distension to relieve the pressure also this feeding is very useful and uh, patients uh, not taking orally are uh, unconscious you can give the oral drugs through using this feeding tube and uh, and either during resuscitation procedure or surgery if this there is uh, stomach is distended may cause aspiration so decompress the stomach this feeding tube is quite useful during resuscitation time as well as the prior surgical procedures so some diagnostic uh, uh, uses are also there the baby brought with the tracheostomy fistula 
if you are not able to put the tube the tube not enters the stomach there is a recoiling you can diagnose a case of tf and sometimes you can diagnose any bleeding in the stomach and upper gat or uh, you can uh, you can do the gastric lavage for sputum uh, collection in the babies at the early morning specimen because the children may not uh, give sputum as an adults so in that situation you put the tube at the stomach you can collect whatever the early morning uh, because of the regurgitated sputum will collect in the stomach by using this tube you can collect the regurgitated uh, sputum samples to send for uh, a b or cb not to diagnose tuberculosis so these are the some diagnostic uses Uh, when sometimes there are oxy as elder mentioned nasal can nasal can is not uh, available you can use this uh, tube for uh, delivery of oxygen and uh, many times it is useful in newborns and children for putting suction and in the, sometimes the babies getting vein is difficult in their scenario it is used as a tourniquet in ward also as already mentioned in the case brought with excent transfusion you have to go for the umbilical vein catheterization and go for excent transfusion if it is umbilical vein catheter is so not available using the speeding tube you can go for the excent transfusion also can be done for a baby there are a lot of uses can be done using this infant feeding tube this is the rail tube it is a just but a bigger size of the feeding tube that the uses are same they are useful in the elder child so the give feeding in critically ill children and any poisoning case come you can do the stomach wash and you can take the stomach material and send for the diagnostic work up and i have already mentioned decompressed stomach prior surgery and during resuscitation these are useful for the research stage this is mucus extractor commonly used in neonatal resuscitation if you are uh, using this uh, you can aspirate using this uh, site and you put in the baby's mouth and oral cavity and nose so the material which will be how much material collected can be measured using this measurement and if it is a meconium that may be greenish color you can see that is there any meconium present in the stomach fluid or not or section in the oral cavity so it will tell the uh, what color and how much fluid also you can look for this uh, container and according to that you can clear the secretions from the nose and mouth it is a suction catheter where uh, this catheter is attached with the suction apparatus to clear the secretion from the nose and oral cavity mainly it is useful to prevent the aspiration in the elder children you all know that it is a foley catheter it is mainly useful to put in the <coughs> uh, <coughs> urethral meatus to the urinary bladder to drain the urine water present the bladder so it is mainly uh, it should inflate with the uh, saline to not to pull out by the child so it is mainly useful uh, for there are two indications urinary non urinary indications in urinary indications are to monitor the urine output in shock and renal failure to differentiate the anuria from retention urinary retention for any incontinence of urine situation in the child present this status you can do the bladder wash and rarely can use for suprapubic cystectomy so some non urinary indications are to arrest the post nasal bleeding in case of intractable epistasis and in a case of portal hypertension in the in usable various as children can arrest the bleeding this polis catheter is useful after putting this polis uh, catheter this catheter end will be connected to this urinary drainage bag to collect the urine and to measure the exact urine output there will be measurement is given here so you can ever ever you can measure how much urine is uh, drained from the patient coming to some uh, diagnostic uh, instruments useful in day to day practice it is a bone marrow aspiration needle it is the needle it is a stillet it is a needle so the usual sites are either iliac crest or uh, upper end of tibia just be uh, just below the tibial tuberosity so it is mainly uh, useful in both there are two indications one is a diagnostic and therapeutic and the main diagnostic indications are mainly leukemia when of the child present with features of leukemia like uh, all three cells cell lines are low like anemia thrombocytopenia and leukopenia there may be lymphedema with the hepatic spleen and gali so you have to look in any bone pains uh, or persistent fever in that scenario you have to look for leukemia you have to, apart from after looking for pulp smear you have to go for bone marrow aspiration to confirm your diagnosis of leukemia and itp idiopathic thrombocytic purpura idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura aplastic anemia megaloblastic anemia and sometimes very rarely pyrex of unknown origin and mild fibrosis these are some indications where you have to do bone marrow aspiration to confirm your diagnosis coming to therapeutic uses it is useful in uh, bone marrow transplantation once you diagnose leukemia after diagnosis of leukemia sometimes intrathecal administration of drugs are uh, needed in that situation bone marrow needle is useful another common uh, day to day use are intraosseous technique 
whenever the peripheral vein child brought with the severe dehydration or shock getting the peripheral veins are difficult in that situation using this intraosseous needle at the upper end of tibia we can go for the intraosseous technique where the marrow uh, veins will be not collapsed you are putting this intraosseous needle over the marrow and can give the fluids and blood or whatever for emergency purpose this is the liver biopsy needle otherwise called wim silumans needle mainly used for for liver biopsy and kidney biopsy so some indications for liver biopsy are any cirrhosis of liver cryptogenic cirrhosis indian childhood cirrhosis biliary cirrhosis the primary or secondary uh, and in pediatric age group many storage disorders like hemochromatosis glycogen storage disorders and wilson disease and malignancies where liver biopsy is needed it is almost looks like a bone marrow needle but here if you look for the end is yes, uh, there is a two <coughs> two parts are here so you can uh, divide you can uh, obviously you can split the this end part so after putting this needle then liver tissue will be collected here which will be taken for the uh, analysis and further uh, pathological examination how this is way how can differentiate liver biopsy needle from the bone marrow needle this is another common needle lumbar puncture needle or lp needle you all know that it is mainly used for for lumbar puncture for a diagnostic purpose any child present with fever seizures neck stiffness you can think of cns infection you have to establish a diagnosis by doing uh, lp and uh, in uh, all, all in for therapeutic purpose any any spinal anesthesia it is used to spinal needle to give the drugs for the spinal anesthesia these are the main uses here and some rare uh, indications were pleural tap acetic tap and subdural tapping in case of subdural effusion and subdural empyema So, if the child brought with either pneumothorax or the pus in the pleural cavity, MP ma or large pleural effusion, or because of injury there may be pneumothorax or chylothorax, this should be drained using the thoracic drainage catheter. Uh, after usually putting the mid-axillary line uh, by giving a uh, local anesthesia, this tube is inserted in the pleural cavity, and this will be collected with the ICD tube, where the all uh, the pus in the thoracic cavity will be let out. so do i finish so for the common things uh, just i finish because uh, in our days even common public public are speaking about cpap and hfnc etc this is a very quite uh, very well known bubble cpap is mainly useful in the newborns and premature newborns where the baby brought with uh, meconium uh, severe res- respiratory distress because of dilated membrane disease in premature babies because of lack of surfactant the lungs will be collapse in that situation our uh, continuous positive airway pressure is very much helpful so in this situation the cpaps are very much useful and sometimes even useful in the meconium aspiration syndrome and when the child was wean from ventilator before shifting to o2 you can use the cpap as an intermediate move it is the common called i flow device is called h i flow nasal cannula therapy so it is where the you see that the cannula is quite easily fit in the patient's nose it is quite comfortable for the patient and the compliance is very good so it is mainly in our day it is mainly useful in many situations where the patients brought with respiratory distress a pediatric age group mainly from bronchiolitis bronchopneumonia or post operative situations again can be used as a weaning from ventilator when the child was initially ventilated then shifted to hfnc then patient may be weaned to the nasal o2 and then go back so it acts intermediate where you can avoid the inus ventilation so nowadays it's in many situations useful this is in a call hfnc mission or iflo therapy which was uh, commonly spoken during this covid scenario this is the final one so ventilator where the patient brought with uh, respect rs in, in previous situation where the patient may have some spontaneous breathing with respect to distress where hfnc or cpap devices are useful when the patient brought with severe respiratory distress or respiratory failure the whole breathing should be given through this mission this call for ventilator so it is mainly useful in the for artificial ventilation here both the positive pressures peak inspiratory pressure as well as the positive end expiratory pressure both the pressures and along with the respiratory uh, frequency how much breathing should give all this will be given through this mission and the patient brought with severe respiratory distress and uh, any patient have head injury with altered mental status or cardiogenic or non cardiogenic pulmonary edema or where the where is severe septic shock with hemodynamic instability this ventilators are quite useful nowadays these machines are available in even all hospitals so everybody have an opportunity to look for it and use it so to com- before completion just to put a slide of oral airway so whenever the child has put in ventilator uh, the the patient may usually uh, bite the tongue or it will close the airway so we putting the oral sections difficult to uh, avoid this 
this instrument is useful it's called oral airway it is mainly putting the oral cavity in a ventilator case we are in unconscious pressure to prevent the tongue bite and to free the airway and putting the oral suction clearly and maintain the airway will be useful using this devices finally the last slide when a patient brought with arrest you are doing cpr cardiopulmonary resuscitation in spite of that the patient is not improving you have to give the shock to save the patients this is a this instrument is called defibrillator it is mainly useful in in scenario where the patient brought with cardiac arrest and pulseless ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation this instrument is very much useful so so far uh, the common instruments from thermometer and cbg machine bp apparatus to the our uh, routine oral uses like uh, nasal cannula nasal mask or uh, hfn mesh or uh, non rebreathing mask vaccine due circuit these are things are useful for the oxygen delivery devices when a patient brought with uh, respiratory failure you should use the ambu bag uh, for laryngoscope and ett tube are useful for intubation and uh, coming to investigations bone marrow aspiration needle for leukemia and treating leukemia and liver biopsy needle and bone marrow needle too. so looks same bone marrow needle can be split into two where the liver specimen can be kept and uh, and finally the uh, the latest machines are hfnc cpap or uh, jackson tubes were quite useful for in severe respiratory distress situations and finally just discuss about the defibrillator which will be useful for cardiac arrest maybe i almost cover the from basic to latest investigations which are available in the day to day practice i hope uh, you find useful for this uh, in this situation i have to thank our iap organizers uh, and uh, professor emma madam and our coordinator dr our dr chaini madam for giving this nice opportunity and all the students who attend this program i thank one and all for this nice opportunity and kind listening thank you thank you very much thank you sir you were uh, very crisp and clear as usual and you have extensively covered all the instruments and equipments to uh, i mean this will be useful definitely for the pg point of view also thank you so much sir Over yeah thank to, uh, mama and rabi thank you madam dr balaji i am so thankful to you you had to put so many things together and uh, starting with a the humble thermometer you went up to the ventilator and uh, you covered everything in this time that we have given you and uh, as the dark sir pgs also can keep a record of this and use it for their exam thank you very much and uh, thank you madam thank you madam thank you very much madam for being part of this dr selvakumar also did a fantastic job i couldn't at that point offer my comments uh, 45 minutes of uh, fever management which was like a workshop everything was covered so i'm grateful to all of you for uh, joining this uh, when i just had to request you all of you came as part of the team and you contributed immensely to the knowledge of the undergraduates who are going for their exams and also post graduates who are you know trying to gain knowledge thank you so much all of you and daksh thank you also dr balaji dr balaji can you switch off that slide yes sir yes sir right sir please sir yes sir thank you thank you thank you sir thank you sir on behalf of iap tnc i thank uh, Uh, our program convener uh, dr rama chandra mohan and i think because of her we have made a very successful one and the first time in our uh, tamil nadu uh, uh, ug under undergraduate program we have done very well and yesterday it was uh, almost 1000 um, uh, youtube 1200 and something and um, Uh, zoom almost uh, 230 like uh, almost uh, um, 1450 students benefited i think uh, i heard that lot of students they want to see that after their examination and it, since it's available in youtube and they can avail our um, youtube service also they can before going for examination they can utilize our uh, uh, iip tnc youtube uh, uh, that uh, and uh, that cited uh, uh, clinical training program for undergraduate and i am really on behalf of iap tnc i really thankful dr rama madam and i really uh, appreciate your uh, uh, hard thank effort. you yeah 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 this is not only my effort effort of all of you together yeah i am really thank uh, dr dashaini who, who is helping and uh, motivating and getting speakers and as well as uh, uh, guiding and uh, helping to make uh, an ams as well as uh, email address for sending uh, 
preparing slides also i thank dr atirumurugan who is always begin me for my success and uh, he is helping uh, all the uh, making players and um, um, throughout sending email everything and i thank uh, today's uh, speakers uh, dr salukma dr tridev sridevi dr balaji dr anand sri and uh, um i thank our vice president uh, dr annamalai vijayaragam sir and uh, on behalf of iap tnsc i thank all the uh, faculties as well as students i thank uh, our uh, dynamic president dr ramesh babu who is uh, helping us and uh, to make this uh, program successful and on behalf of iap tnsc i thank onandal for this uh, uh, wonderful uh, achievement by our uh, uh under guidance of dr ramachandra mohan through iap tnsc i hope that next year we will do uh, bigger way and, uh, definitely this uh, pioneer and i will uh, have a bigger way definitely next year we will do it thank you thank you very much and it thank is you. yeah it is available on iap tnsc website and you can visit also thank you thank madam you. thank you thank and, you so um, much thank you anand thank you, yeah. good luck to all the ugs thank you sir thank faculty you. thank you thank you dax Thank, thank you, you one and all, sir. Thank you, thank you one and all, madam.